killing never bothered Sam Wild Man Dean. It was business, plain and simple. Eight years and change, with the body count nearing the mid-century mark, he considered himself among the elite of professional guns for hire, right up there with even the coldest and most lethal assassins the CIA ever produced. Even if he spent most of his life on the back of a Harley Davidson and looked like a grizzled water buffalo, success in his eyes pretty much boiled down to never getting bagged. Blood on his hands was the inevitable result of a contract murder, but he could live with that, so far. They paid him simply because they didn't have the guts to pull the trigger themselves, and their cowardice only fed his own sense of superiority. Most of the doomed along the way had been average citizens, the mindless walking dead in their straight world, before he did them a personal favor and put them out of their misery. But at last count, a dozen kills had been bikers in rival gangs, usually pagans or hell's angels who crossed a brother Trojan in a meth or gun deal. Citizen, biker, or pig, it didn't matter to Dean. He was the best at what he did, balls to the wall all the way. And he never left home without his forty-four Magnum Smith & Wesson pistol, or the backup M3A1 subgun, which was stuffed in the satchel now fastened to the sissy bar of his customized sportster. The big piece was the main weapon of choice, now snugged in shoulder leather under the loose-fitting sleeveless denim jacket sporting Trojan colors and filled with six hollow points. From his first kill on, Dean had liked his hits full of noise and mess aplenty. Lots of running blood for the coroners and forensic geeks to wade. As far as he was concerned, sound suppressors and a single kill shot were for candy-ass spook types. The flashing neon sign of the howling coyote lit up the desert night like a beacon on an airstrip. Through the smear of bug juice on his goggles, he spotted the sign boasting the best steak and prime rib in Nevada, east off the throttle, and swung into the lot. Blowing up some tumbleweed in his wake, he parked on the far blind side of the plate glass window, dropped the kickstand, and killed 1,200 cc's of rumbling iron beast. It had been a fairly short but hard run from the Trojan clubhouse outside Reno, flying along I-80 at close to 90, jacked up on two fat lines of crank just to help shave the time and distance. Swinging his large beefy bulk off the hog and draping the goggles over his satchel, he took a few moments to get his bearings. He counted three battered pickup trucks that looked thoroughly abused by the ravages of desert travel. Then a vintage Ford Galaxy, next to what looked to him like a Japanese shitbox, completely out of character for this neck of the woods, and finally spotted her older model Trans Am at the far end of the lot. The Jeep Cherokee looked fresh off the assembly line, a picture conjured up of some urban cowboy out to indulge a nine-to-five fantasy about the Wild West. Just after midnight, and it looked as though quite the crowd was gathered at this lonesome eatery. Local desert rats and those just passing through, chowing down right before last call. All things considered, it sure wasn't the best place by his reckoning to conduct their business, with diners shoveling food into their mouths in stoic silence. He hoped she at least had the good sense to claim a cubbyhole far enough away from potential ears. The hit, he hoped, should be easy enough, but with something like this he could never tell. But this particular client was smarter than to get reeled in by careless talk or bad nerves if the heat came her way, or so Dean wanted to believe. She was a former biker chick, after all, and she knew the ropes when it came to living on the edge. He remembered her as stand-up, tough as the day was long, and one sweet mama, too, in the looks department, if memory served him right. But she had gone straight just the same, having caught taste of the riches on the legit side of the tracks. Things happened, people changed, for damn sure, and what man could ever really get a fix on what made a woman's heart beat anyway? In his experience, they were like the wind, shifting allegiance in the direction of wherever the breeze of opportunity blew. Back when, she had belonged to Willie Terrible Tuggle, before she up and split the Trojans, gone to trade her ample goods with the high rollers in a Vegas strip joint. Seemed she'd met and married some suit who supposedly did classified work out here on a spook project that had locals all over the state up in arms about strange lights in the sky. Apparently, she now wanted out, tired of clean living and the missionary position, maybe. But she wanted to bail with the whole marital cash prize before moving on to whatever she considered greener pastures. So she had reached out to Willie by phone, roughly a week ago, the former biker babe claiming she needed help in making a clean break. 
needed her problem solved in permanent fashion. The good Trojan brother that he was, Dean told Tuggle he'd take care of it. He gave the darkness beyond the howling coyote one last search. He was feeling his nerves suddenly, starting to wonder if something hinky was about to go down. Maybe it was only the meth talking to him. Or was someone out there, watching him? Was that a vehicle in the distance, south, headed that way? Between the meth, the ride, and the pitch blackness, it was near impossible to tell. A chain of hills appeared to swallow up whatever it was. A check of the sky, and he saw a few clouds skirting along, passing beneath the moon. He marched ahead, swung open the front door. A quick look around took in the sparse crowd. Beyond the chest-high partition that separated the smoking section from diners, he counted four customers right away. A brunette in a denim blouse that molded a pair of sweet mounds, not shabby at all from where he stood, but with two boys, most likely her brood, the kids forking up steak while she kept a glum eye fixed on her beer. Dean scanned the main dining room around mom and kids. On the far side, he found a balding patron in long-sleeved white shirt and glasses, too busy carving up a slab of prime rib to look his way, and pegged the guy for a traveling salesman. The bar, he noted, ran down the north side, from the main room to the edge of the beaded doorway leading to the smoking section. A lean man with a crew cut was behind the bar, and Dean caught him throwing the evil eye his way. Closing in 30 minutes. Attitude. Implication that biker business was about as welcome as a nest of diamondbacks. So that's 30 minutes you're on my time and money, partner. You're not too busy. How about two shots of Jack and a Budweiser? Make sure it's the coldest bottle you got. And I need some privacy. Betty, customer. A chubby blonde who'd seen better days popped through a doorway downrange. What? Oh, great. Just what I need. She strode with purpose across the room, rumbling something to herself he was glad he couldn't hear. She was clearly eager to serve and get him on his way, but he held the surveillance pose, further checking out the restaurant. It was western decor, as expected. Walls hung with saddles and lassos, oil paintings of cattle drives, ghost towns, and rugged landscapes. Just another dismal saloon. He smelled the cigarette and heard a voice from the past come from his right. Hey. Over here. Wild Mandine turned and found her sitting by herself in a booth butted up against the window. He was stepping into the smoking section, still taking in his surroundings, his brain talking to him that something didn't feel right, when he spotted the man glancing in his direction. The brief look shot his way through Dean off his stride, made his heart lurch. He was a dark man, not black, but he could have been some foreign import, Italian or Arab perhaps, Dean thought. There was something about the guy he couldn't pin down, though. The way he sat, cool and sure of himself. The dark man noting his entrance, but without directly looking at him. No, he decided the citizen had looked through him. Dean scowled, ready perhaps to start something, when he caught the lady in question looking at her watch. Time to get down to business. Good enough? As hoped for, she had staked out a spot, far enough away from eavesdroppers where they could talk with some privacy. Settling into the booth, he let his stare wander past his buxom client, wondering what it was about the dark man that troubled him. Dean figured it was just the lightning midnight ride, gassed on meth, that fueled his paranoid fantasies. Screw him. How much of a threat could any guy eating salad, might as well be eating quiche as far as he was concerned, and nursing one small draft, possibly pose to wild man Dean? Tina Whalen thought it would have made a good Jerry Springer episode. Sipping her beer, she chuckled with quiet bitterness at the image of herself and her AWOL husband shrieking obscenities at each other as the crowd hooted and chanted. But this was her life. The unthinkable had happened to her and her children. And she would walk in front of a Greyhound bus before it became a freak show for public amusement. But she had two sons, ages eight and nine, to consider beyond her own dismal plight. She was a mother, first and last. And without her boys, she realized she would be lost for good. And without her, she erased the mental picture of Bobby and Tommy on their own as soon as it tried to take shape. She was a fighter, damn it. Always had been. And as long as she was breathing, she could at least hope for a better tomorrow. But only if she stayed strong, didn't succumb to the ingrained self-loathing that had colored all the big decisions of her life. 
Glancing up from her beer, she found both boys peering fearfully at her. They couldn't possibly understand what had happened. Not even she could believe it. But they sensed something was terribly wrong, the walls of their world closing in. They went back to working quietly on their T-bones, mashed potatoes, and green beans. God only knew when they would eat this well again. Which made her hate him that much more. He hadn't even shown the guts or decency to do it in person, delivering the punishing blow over the phone. It was small comfort that they owned the mobile home near Battle Mountain, had a roof over their heads for the time being. The immediate survival task involved money, since the bastard had wiped out the family savings of twenty grand, leaving all of three hundred dollars and change in the dust of his custom eighteen-wheeler. As if he were doing the three of them some grandiose favor by seeing they wouldn't starve in the next few days. Why was she surprised, anyway? He was gone for two, three weeks at a time since nearly the beginning of their marriage, making runs to the big cities east, phoning home when the mood struck him. The concern about her loneliness was easy enough to read through, something in his voice warning her that he was out there having a big old party, just checking in to make sure the little lady was holding on, sticking to the role of good mother and faithful wife. Ten years of marriage, and some wistful corner of her heart still wanted to cling to the good memories, as if remembering alone would make everything all right, bring him back, as if it were all just some bad dream. Recalling, such as the first time she'd seen him swagger into the Vegas casino where she'd been a cocktail waitress when she was younger and could get by on looks alone. What a fool she'd been. And now two innocent lives were made to suffer because she'd been blinded by love. Uh, Tina? A minute, if you don't mind? She read the apologetic look over her shoulder. The owner, she was sure, ready to tell her how sorry he was to let her go. In a way, she understood his position didn't take her firing personally. Jim Lake had a business to run, after all, and he couldn't afford having her boys running all over the restaurant, her attention torn between keeping them under control while she waited tables, messing up orders all too often lately. His claim for her dismissal was that business was too slow to keep her on, but she knew better. She was something of an embarrassment, she was sure of it, which only threatened to inflame her anger and resentment even more. Keep it together, she told herself. Don't let them see you crack under the strain. Eureka Springs was a small community, population 231, now 230, and rumors about her husband's bailout had floated around her for two weeks until she'd broken down, confirming the truth to those she worked with. Hard to deny it, anyway, since she'd been forced to bring her sons in with her every shift since Tony had ridden off into the sunrise. Eat up, guys. We're leaving in a few minutes. She drained her beer, stood, and managed to keep from trembling as she took the few steps to the bar. I'm really sorry I had to do this, Tina. Business is slow, like you said. Nothing personal, no hard feelings. He had grace enough not to pursue it, or mention the other problem. The meals are on me. He poured a draft and put it on the bar in front of her. Drinks on the house, too. A pathetic little parting gesture. She was surprised at how strong her voice sounded even as hot tears welled up behind her eyes. Appreciate that. Listen, uh, you need some money, I can float you a few hundred. <laughs> we'll manage. If things pick up, I'll call you. You're a good waitress, Tina. Everyone likes you. But I can't have personal problems following you in here. No need to explain, Jim. Anything you need? I'll let you know. He reached over and gave her shoulder a gentle squeeze. As soon as he was gone to do whatever he did to close down the restaurant, she found Betty by her side. Lousy break, huh? I'm real sorry, Tina. Him and Angelo. <sighs> Big restaurant owners, all the heart and soul of a rattlesnake. You know, if you ask me, I'm thinking Angelo's the one probably twisted the screws and got you canned. She wondered about that, too. Why Jim's partner, Angelo, had paid her more attention than ever in the past week. The polite inquiries about Tony, the kids, Mr. Compassion. And she had caught, more than a few times, the predatory way he looked at her recently. Did the same thing to Marta when she wouldn't sleep with the porky creep. 
Heard they paid her off to keep her old man from raising enough hell to take this place and send them packing like whipped dogs like they deserve. I'm not looking for revenge. Didn't suggest you were. Angelo's married. I'm sure he's not interested in used goods. She knew how lame that sounded, given her own instincts had warned her Angelo was just another shade of Tony. But she felt compelled to say something. <laughs> Think that matters to him? <laughs> Man. Betty stabbed out her cigarette, a thick cloud of smoke shooting over the bar and a gust of a bitter breath. Listen, if I can help you or the boys anyway, hon, give me a shout. Anyways, I, I gotta go get dinner for Handsome over there. And I ain't talking about that biker trash, neither. God almighty, if I was ten years younger and twenty pounds lighter. Guess a girl can dream, even at my age. Curious, when she was alone again, Tina looked toward the smoking section, but already knew who'd gotten Betty stoked up in romantic fantasy. He came in maybe thirty minutes ago, every bit as tall, dark, and handsome as Tony, but more athletic, graceful, as lithe as a cat. And there was something in his eyes. She'd seen it, and it took her breath away. Something confident and controlled in the way he had moved. Before some foolish and desperate flight of fantasy could take root, she looked away. Her sons were her whole life, the only men that could matter to her now. Somehow, as surely as the sun would rise, she would pick up the pieces and forge ahead. Her boys were counting on her. Robert Barkland was afraid. He had been, in fact, since he had bolted the accounting firm of Rice, Bentley and Barkland in Chicago. The dead of night departure had left his partners high and dry. The very thought that they would, no doubt, soil themselves when the clients came calling almost made Barkland laugh. They would find themselves forced to explain a missing six million dollars and change to guys in silk suits who had entrusted the firm with cleaning up enough money over the long haul to fill an armada of dump trucks. Crooks. The whole lot of them. Little wonder, though, he found his nerves screaming at him. Two days on the run in his Toyota rental, a briefcase with the 200 grand he'd emptied out of his legitimate account. It was understandable why he was jumping at shadows. Why every stranger posed a potential threat. Some lurking, faceless hitman could be hunting him at every turn. Well, he'd made his choice to abscond with their funds long ago. No turning back the hand of time. There was nothing left to do but keep on running. And spend their illicit dollars like there was no tomorrow. Looking back, the decision to do it leaped out of nowhere to consume his every thought and desire. Right after his second wife sashayed out the door, unleashing yet another round of ravening lawyers, it had sure seemed the right thing to do. His conscience told him it was simple justice to get back all that had been taken from him in this unjust world. And he had been surprised at his own grim resolve, a toughness he never knew he possessed. But he had pulled it off, undetected, stealing away like a thief in the night so far. It was easy enough to rationalize taking money from criminals, telling himself during all the months of pilfering there was no way the mob could possibly miss a measly few million, doctoring the books, skimming a chunk here and there, funneling it over the course of two anxious years into an offshore account. Of course he had long since decided the Bahamas was too close to the scene of plunder, any menacing pursuit a mere hop skip and jump away. So he settled on Honolulu, at least for the time being some distant point across the ocean where he could hunker down for a while, ease into his new identity, make sure his back was clear of gun-toting shadows. With his nervous stomach, it was nearly impossible to keep down the prime rib unless he ate mouse-sized bites. But he'd come too far, risked it all, earned the right to live the way he chose to break at this point. All he had to do was get to LAX. A week ago, he'd purchased a ticket for Hawaii through a Chicago travel agency, paid for in cash, an assumed name going into their computer. The way was ready, escape a mere handful of hours off in sunny Southern California. From there, once he was squared away in his island paradise, it wouldn't be much trouble to have the funds from the Bahamas wired to a numbered account he'd arranged through a banker who, likewise, he knew, had some shady tales to tell himself. Having friends in high places, especially of the white-collar criminal variety, was about to pay off. Relax. Take another deep, slow breath, he told himself. Let the fear go. Let it be. The future belonged to him. 
he'd sure as hell paid enough dues to grab up his own slice of heaven wherever he landed. He was a man, by God, no longer to be browbeaten and bullied by women who were never satisfied. And no more kissing butt on a daily basis, sucking up to all the slick ones, flaunting their ill-gotten riches in his face, treating him as barely fit to scrape the gum off their shoes. Well, it was his turn to live large, laugh at the world, and all the way to the bank. Robert Parkland was flying on to paradise, and no one was going to stop him. So why did he feel so weighted down with gnawing fear, a twisting ball of guilt in his chest that wouldn't unwind? It was one guy making him feel that way, and he couldn't quite pin down why. He didn't want to look back toward the smoking section, but he couldn't help himself, drawn to check out a face that struck him as carved out of granite. First time he saw him, he thought he'd spotted a look in the man's eyes that he found himself imagining could only belong to a killer. Or was paranoia getting the best of him? He looked away before the guy caught him staring. He was sure the dark man was a cop, an FBI agent, most likely, marched out by his partners. Or was the stranger something worse, far more diabolical than a mere law enforcement officer? The dark stranger had some cold, supremely confident manner Barkland didn't trust himself to study any longer. Barkland choked down another bite. He decided to stay, finish up this last supper, determined not to stop and eat again until he was safely in the air and well over the Pacific. Ernie Collins, known to many as Weed, was not happy. The whole scheme sounded shaky, not to mention dangerous to his health. Two of them poised to go through the front door, two more charging in through the kitchen. That was assuming they stuck to the few details he'd overheard. Say some would-be hero mucked up their play and they were forced to kill a cowboy who'd seen one too many Charles Bronson movies. If it all turned bloody and they were looking at death row, what would stop them, four total strangers to him, from executing everyone inside, then putting a bullet through his own brain to silence one last eyewitness? It was too late now. There was no choice actually but to follow through. Since he'd sold his services only yesterday, agreeing in a moment of greed and desperation to fulfill his part. He was supposed to scout the place, then troop back to report on the numbers, mood inside, where the owners were, stuff like that. The real trouble, he was afraid, would start once he returned to the van to sit tight and supposedly watch their backs while they took the place down. This was Nevada, and folks out here tended to arm themselves. He would never have allowed himself to get talked into this in the first place if he hadn't been sitting around the previous day, smoking grass and chewing mushrooms with a couple of those UFO kooks who had been kind enough to give him food and shelter. Nevada was getting spookier with each passing day, but he needed a little more time to hole up, maybe con the more gullible cult members into showing him where they kept the guns and whatever cash was stashed at the ranch. When the drugs wore off, he found himself wrestling with doubt. For instance, he wasn't sure exactly what the four men in black had in mind, how they planned to pull this off without firing a shot if a cowboy or two took exception to getting robbed. And anyway, a dump like this? How much cash could possibly be squirreled away to begin with? What if someone panicked, and there was a mad rush for the door when the hardware came out and folks were getting screamed at to shut up and get on the floor? What if one of the two owners locked himself away in the back office, dialed up the cops when the first scream broke out, and an obvious robbery was going down? Of course, he was even more scared to death of what the four men in the van would do to him if he didn't follow through with his role. He took a moment, just the same, to pause at the front door, trying to will away the trembling in his hands and knees, but gave it up. Only some booze could help. A look over his shoulder, and he imagined he could almost hear the four shadows inside the van cursing him to get on with it. Two basic facts sent him marching inside the restaurant to case the joint. One, they were armed to the teeth, and he wasn't. Two, he'd taken their money, three hundred dollars in cash, far more than the chump change he'd fled Bethlehem, Pennsylvania with about one year ago. It was a bad time back then, sure, running west from about six warrants, one of which was for Grand Theft Auto. Even so, Weed suddenly wished he could go back somehow and face the music. But he feared the four strangers far more than the bondsmen he'd skipped out on. He wondered who the four men really were, had never heard them call each other by name while in their presence. They didn't look like any wild-eyed, pissed-off-at-the-world armed robbers he'd ever come across. 
These guys were pushing 40 easy, maybe 50. Clean cut types all around. Looked fresh out of suburbia, USA. <laughs> Go figure. And why precisely had they sought him out? Ask a basic question and he was stared down with eyes that warned him it was best he kept his mouth shut. They didn't need to fill in the or else part. Best just to get it over with. So he went through the door. We'd flinched when the cowbell jangled and he felt all eyes look his way. Right away it all felt wrong. A biker and his old lady looked up from their table. The bearded man clearly had bad news written all over him. Three steps next into the smoking section, we'd homed in on the bar. Oh, God, let there be quick service and wild turkey. And Collins pulled up short as he met a pair of eyes that could have melted ice. Somehow, we'd walked on, turning away as soon as the stranger eating by himself looked up, inspecting him, measuring. All the way to the bar, we'd kept hearing the voice of doom in his head, warning him the guy was trouble. He knew a cop when he saw one. The man was no cop, but he could see where those with something to hide could make that mistake. He did possess, however, photo ID complete with proper credentials, declaring he was a special agent of the U.S. Department of Justice. It was tucked away in a thin wallet stamped with the justice seal, in the inside pocket of a white windbreaker about one size too large, situated just behind a Beretta 93R that hung snug from a shoulder holster. The Justice ID packet, when presented, looked very official. It was also bogus. He wasn't able to read minds, but the man sitting in the corner by himself, nursing a beer and working on his salad while waiting on the main course, instinctively knew he was being watched. First the biker. Bugged out eyes, most likely jacked on meth, he suspected. The biker was lugging a big piece of steel beneath the grease-stained denim vest and had the familiar predatory look of a stone-cold killer. Then the latest midnight arrival, a desert rat with a mop of curly hair like sprouting weeds, now moving double time for the bar. Two bad apples in his estimation, his radar for trouble locked in, watching them without watching. And the way he'd felt their eyes boring into him, he could almost hear them wondering if he was a local, state, or federal badge. But Mac Bolin was no law enforcement officer, at least not in anything approaching the traditional definition. Right then, he was supposed to be on R&R. Just off wrapping up a foray halfway around the world, Bolin had pretty much been ordered to stand down, take a few days for himself. That came straight from Hal Brognola, the big fed at the Justice Department who oversaw Stony Man Farm and doubled as liaison to the president. The man from Justice had told Bolin the cyber-sleuthing intelligence team at the farm was cooking up another mission, but it might be several days in the brewing. Get in a car, Bolin's old friend told him. Breathe the air. Go see America. And Bolin had to admit he was close to running on fumes. So why not? He'd landed at Lax, rented the Jeep Cherokee, and started driving east by northeast. Breathing in the fresh air and letting the steady hum of the road clear his mind, he did his best to think about nothing. It had been a military flight dropping him off at L.A., meaning the war bag with hardware and high-tech goods didn't require a customs search. The knowledge that his weapons and gear were securely stowed in the SUV had actually helped him to relax a bit. However, at that moment, Bolin found himself far removed from any peaceful, easy feeling. As he was rolling down I-80, the billboard had seemed to leap out at him in the headlights claiming the best beef in the West, so Bolin had just stopped in for a leisurely meal. But now that he was here, watched and watching, he sensed something sinister in the air. In addition to the seedy duo, there was the middle-aged, moon-faced guy who looked like a businessman away from home. But his nervous demeanor clearly spoke of some inner turmoil. He seemed frightened of something or someone. The soldier had caught the guy checking him out three times at last count, a darting furtive look, there then gone. Unintentionally, Bolin also overheard what he assumed was the proprietor telling the lady with two sons how sorry he was, reading between the lines that she'd been fired for some reason. Observing with his peripheral vision, Bolin had found himself admiring her quiet dignity as she handled the clearly devastating news. 
There was a strength in her he recognized. Not all warriors carried a gun, he thought to himself. The soldier then overheard the biker talking to his bleached blonde lady friend. Now what a nice surprise, Rhonda. Looks like Square Limits kept all the right parts together. A nine to five bread keeps them juices running hot as the good old days. I see you're still the same sweet talker. I'm a regular prince, here to rescue a damsel in distress. Bolin felt the mean eye once more as the biker glared his way, making certain Bolin was focused on his salad. Then there was a long, hard pause from that direction, the biker killing his shot of booze and helping himself to one of the lady's cigarettes. The desert rat, meanwhile, plopped down on a stool, scowling all around for service, one leg bouncing like a spring. The soldier detected manic anxiety in Rat Boy's eyes before the guy zeroed in on Bolin's waitress as she whipped around the corner of the alcove leading to the kitchen. Bolin's prime rib trailed a wisp of steam behind her as she rolled into the smoking section. As the waitress approached, Bolin observed Rat Boy running a long search around the restaurant. The waitress brought the soldier his meal with the same smiling eyes as when she'd taken his order. As she set down the plate, Bolin found himself grateful for a friendly face. Can I get you into the nails, honey? No, thanks. This looks great. I need another shot over here. Yeah, can I get a drink? Hold your horses! I only got two hands and two feet. No shit! Think you can get your lonely heart and lizard hide butted gear for another Jack and Bud? The biker threw Bolin a look meant to challenge any chivalrous stand on his part. Bolin felt an angry scowl tug at the corners of his lips, but decided to look away, content for the moment to maintain the peace. Don't mind the asshole, hon. Dealing with dipshits is all in a day's work for me. Shot a turkey here, lady. Nice fat one. Doubles are six bucks, big time. Whatever. I see my fingers on the other side of this glass, no tip. <clears throat> like I was expecting one. Bolin almost smiled, then went to work on his meal. He listened as Rat Boy turned conversational. Owner around? Something in the voice shot Bolin's antenna up. Why do you ask? Maybe I need a job. You need a cook? I already got one. Bolin watched her drop the shot glass on the bar, spilling a little down the side, bringing on the expected scowl from Rat Boy. But he held his tongue, more concerned with killing the drink. Maybe you need another cook. Maybe he gets sick sometimes. Or too hungover to come in. Angelo doubles his cook if we get shorthanded in the kitchen. This Angelo around? Maybe he's a little more pleasant to talk to. Forget it. Both of them are back in the office or kitchen, closing up. Both of them are too busy for me? Back there with this one hotshot chef, that what you're saying? <sighs> too busy tonight, too busy for the rest of your life. You don't exactly strike me like you just came from behind the line of some four-star establishment. In fact, I'd say you probably don't know a burger patty from a buffalo chip. What the fuck? He dug into a pocket of his faded blue jeans ripped out at the knees. One more long look around the restaurant, and he made a show of riffling through the bills before he peeled off six dirty ones. He slapped them down on the bar top. It's been delightful. Slice of heaven. Bolin watched the guy as he nearly bolted from the bar, through the main room and out the door. Another bite, then Bolin looked out the window, but saw only a fading shadow, broken up in an ominous jagged silhouette by the flashing light above, as Rat Boy vanished down the far side. The soldier carved off another chunk of rare beef. He was waiting for the rumble of an engine that would signal Rat Boy had driven off. A full minute or so passed. The expected noise never came, but Bolin hadn't seen him drive in either. Maybe he had walked. Something felt wrong. Something out there in the dark that put him on edge. The executioner sat in deliberate grim silence for a long moment. He couldn't quite say why, but suddenly he wasn't hungry. Here comes the puke. Kyle Braxton shot a look in the rear view and smiled at Weatherspoon. Puke, huh? He liked that. The name fit the loser they had selected from the resident lunatic fringe out in the desert. The UFO cult couldn't possibly know they had been under constant surveillance by Big Brother for two years. Both landline and cell phones tapped, state-of-the-art laser parabolic mics with a prototype NSA eyes in the sky satellite capable of seeing right through their very roof. The puke was dead meat when this wrapped and they had absconded with what they'd come for, bunch of nuts out there who would miss one more loser. 
Well, they could watch the skies at night for strange lights all they wanted, he thought. The four of them were there to deal out a little grim reality in the name of national security. Still, out of 29 crazies out there in the dilapidated rat hole they passed off as headquarters and commune, Braxton had to wonder why the former chief of security had singled out this particular sad sack. And why had the ex-chief hinted only yesterday, when the details for this bloody chore were nailed down, at some future plan to use the wackos? Well, orders were orders, and they were simple enough. Braxton cocked and locked the Uzi submachine gun, slipped on the black ski mask, then settled the comlink in place, adjusting the throat mic. Two spare clips, snug in his waistband, good to go. A quarter mile or so south of where it would all happen, the van was hidden in a cleft carved between two hills. Braxton spotted their boy coming out the front door, fading out of the dancing halo of white light, swallowed by the pitch blackness. Jumpy and afraid, that much was obvious, and damn well he should be, as Braxton checked the troops. Ski masks dropped over identical crew cuts. They were outfitted in black, head to rubber soled combat boots, with comlinks fastened. Four clones, all of them roughly the same six feet of lean wire and sinew, except for the hardware. One Glock 17 with threaded sound suppressor for Burton, who would lead the backdoor charge. Christensen watching his rear. The M1014 HK Benelli combat shotgun in 12 gauge, sure to choke back any scream at just one blink. Braxton caught the cold glint of Weatherspoon's eyes in the rear view as he cradled the AR-15. You got problems, gentlemen. There's a cop in there. Look, man, whatever you got in mind... Shut up a second and slow the hell down. Sucks of air, son. Pull yourself together and give it to me straight. Top to bottom, wall to wall. I want numbers and positions. Braxton listened to the puke's scouting report. He heard about the alleged cop first, of course. Big guy sitting alone, far north corner of the smoking section, you can't miss him. The dude's got eyes like death. And there's a nasty looking biker in there too. Looked to me like it was juiced out of his skull on meth or something. Two problems right off the top. The biker and this supposed cop with the death eyes had to be brought under control right off, within a heartbeat. It needed to be a precision operation between the two teams. Watches synchronized when they split up. Weed ran down the rest of the numbers and positioning, describing other patrons he noticed, and that their two main marks were in the kitchen or the office, getting ready to close up the place. Braxton got an idea. The mom and kids you mentioned, did they look to be finishing up their meal, ready to head out the door? I don't know. It didn't matter either way, Braxton figured, if he hauled in a human shield or two to make sure some hero didn't get jumpy. The standing order was not leave behind a single witness anyway. Braxton saw the puke peering around, apparently just noticing that their faces were concealed. That's right, son. They can't ID us. Everyone simply goes home. Man, just do it and get it over with. I've been thinking, how much of a scar could you take from here anyway? It's not about money, son. What? Then if it ain't a robbery... Braxton took a small handheld radio from his pocket and dumped it in Weed's lap. When we go inside, push the button on that and let me know if any late-night diners pull up. One more thing. The smile disappeared, Braxton letting the stare bore into the guy. We come back and you're not here? It would be better for you if you just found the highest, nearest cliff and took a running jump. You don't want to be alive when I find you. We clear. Look like Crystal, man. Braxton turned the ignition key halfway, then twisted the knob on the radio. Just relax, son. It will all be over soon enough, and you'll be on your way. Like the song says, take it easy. Martin Harrison found his partner, Angelo Baldone, once again searching for boogeymen. Three nights in a row now, taking out the trash, and it was becoming a bit of a flaky routine. It was spooky how the man went off by himself, sometimes thirty minutes or more, before Harrison came out and caught him watching the desert. If it wasn't for the glowing eye of the Turkish cigar, Harrison would have missed him altogether, cloaked in a blackness every bit as dark as their collective pasts. Harrison took a moment to study the dark shadow with gaze fixed on some distant point in the desert. Then, before he knew it, he was searching the night himself, wondering if the hills did indeed have eyes. All things considered, a case of nerves was understandable, given what they knew and had seen. 
It was why he kept the leverage no farther than a short trip back to the bar. These days, his partner, however, believed all the edge they required came by way of a forty-five Colt and a twelve-gauge Winchester pump shotgun. It took some convincing, but Harrison had finally talked him out of skulking around the restaurant, handgun shoved in his waistband for all to see, driving away what little business there was of late. So Angelo relented, eventually, after some heated debate, but only if both weapons stayed on the premises, in the back office in a liquor cabinet. Unlocked just in case those boogeymen really did turn up. Which wasn't beyond the realm of possibility, Harrison knew. If he was honest with himself, it was the true reason he'd let Tina Whalen go. He knew he'd be unable to live with himself if he had anything to do with one more drop of innocent bloodshed. Their new lives were a charade, a most dangerous game they were playing. He could only hope that hiding in the open under their very noses would be a successful tactic. No one but Harrison and Angelo knew the lethal result if the shadows decided they would no longer be held hostage by the leverage that he and his partner possessed. A little more than fourteen months ago, they both walked out on the Orion Project. Not something anyone did, be they civilian labor, nuclear physicist, aerospace engineer, or intelligence operative, without being reminded of the dotted line they signed on their contract the day they landed at Nellis. Subsequent checkups followed any termination or retirement. Hard men in black suits, sometimes even paying a former employee a personal visit in the dead of night. Then there was the usual phone tapping, bugs planted, the whole nine yards of surveillance that might leave a man wondering if he could even trust his own wife and children. If nothing else, on that score, he was grateful to be an unattached bachelor. And if an ex-employee might be foolish enough to write a book or woo Geraldo with fantastic tales of what went on at a base so classified it wasn't even listed as a black project at the Pentagon, there would be the ultimate reprisal. It was something most would have sworn could only happen in another country. But Harrison knew the truth, an eyewitness to what measures could be taken in the name of national security. Harrison had to wonder sometimes if he had been foolish to let them know on the way out the door exactly what he was holding on to, as a precaution against he or Angelo having a mysterious fatal accident in the days to come, or even finding hard men sitting at the bar, nursing a soda for hours on end. The kind of guys Harrison had seen march two college kids, not much older than twenty, out into the desert for seeing something they shouldn't have. Quitting as special operatives for a classified arm of the National Security Agency wasn't something either one of them had done on a whim. They pooled some of their money, purchased the restaurant, and tried to start over. They were fully and grimly aware of who and what they turned their backs on, and they had agreed the best place to hide was right out in the open. Something public, with lots of witnesses hanging around. Occasionally, Harrison thought about someplace far away. Tahiti or Nepal, for instance. But it wouldn't have mattered anyway, he knew, if they'd vanished to some remote corner of the world. They could hole up on top of the Himalayas. But special security would track them down sooner rather than later if they felt it necessary. The way his partner had been acting lately, Harrison started wondering if the man knew something he didn't. Harrison dumped the plastic bag in the back of the pickup truck. His partner flinched at the noise as if it were a rifle shot. I liked it better when you were hitting on the hired help. I liked it better than too. Easier to deal with threats of lawyers and harassment suits and come here every night and wonder. Harrison knew what he was referring to. Uh, if they were going to, it would have happened by now. <laughs> I wish I shared your confidence. Angelo's cigar tip winked in the dark. I didn't mention this, Marty, but uh, they've been following me around the last week. Out in the open, not caring if I knew I was watched. The usual black van, tinted windows so you can't see them, no plates... Sometimes I find them outside the house first thing in the morning, like they've been sitting there all night. My wife tells me her cell phone's making all these strange clicking noises as soon as she gets on it. Strikes me as a little more than a standard drill when one of us drops out. You know, I've been thinking, one call and we can end it. Just give it to them. And end up like a couple of our former colleagues? You're talking about Lawler. And Walters. How many brand new cars you ever heard of have their brakes go out at 70 miles an hour? My whole point? They murdered two kids that we know of. I know of at least six other suspicious deaths. Which you have documented. Not really much in the way of evidence, though. And who outside of us or them would believe it anyway? 
It's enough to keep me thinking I can go to sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow. Don't forget, I also have a lot more on them than executions of government employees. Mm-hmm. The foreign subcontractor angle. <laughs> It'd make the problems they've had at Los Alamos look like a minor inconvenience. You at least reconsider my carrying a gun? This late at night out here in the middle of nowhere? I'll think about it. But if I agree, only when everyone else has gone home. He couldn't be sure, wrapped as the man was by the dark, but he thought his partner was nodding in agreement. Oh, shit. The cigar tumbled to the ground. Harrison whipped around and spotted the two black shapes at the edge of the building. Armed, nothing but the whites of their eyes shining at them from the gloom, as if they had materialized out of thin air. Appreciate that little piece of information. Inside, gentlemen, Angelo first. Moonlight revealed the outline of a pistol in the man's hand. For a moment, Harrison was sure his partner was going to flee into the night, taking a step in the other direction. Run, fatso, and I'll have no problem shooting you down like a dog. You know what we want, ladies, so let's make this nice and easy for everybody concerned. Heart racing, Harrison waited as his beefy partner waddled past, what felt like an agonizing minute later. Even with the threatening edge in his voice, the gunner made it sound as if there was some hope. Hand it over, life would go on. He desperately wanted to believe that, but Harrison knew better, and his worst fear was confirmed moments later when he trailed Angelo through the screen door. They weren't two steps into the kitchen, and Davy the cook, married with children and recent transplant from Denver, froze over a rack near the dishwasher, eyes going wide at the sight of two armed men in ski masks. Angelo jumped at the sound, but the bullet had whispered past him and drilled a ragged hole between Davy's eyes. The fire water did nothing to smooth out the jagged edges. Sorry truth was, it seemed to only jack up Dean's paranoia. There was something about the dark guy, sitting there in heavy silence, locked in grim thought about something. The guy was working on his prime rib, but acted as if he didn't care one way or the other about eating. And three times, the dark guy glanced out the window, searching for what, or who. Rhonda's waffling on the supposed subject of their meeting, ducking any questions put to her about their business, was really starting to piss him off. She was having real trouble looking him in the eye. And the fucking dark man was conjuring up pictures of cops and guns and badges in Dean's pounding skull. The pounding was turning into the sound of a judge's gavel hammering in rhythm with his beating heart. And just what the hell was going on back there now in the kitchen? Sounded like the goddamn roof was coming down in chunks. It made his butt jump a couple inches off the seat. It was all Dean could do to keep his face lowered as he pinned Rhonda with an angry eye and edged close to her face. I don't think I like what I'm hearing, Rhonda. I ride straight here from Reno, a fucking bat out of hell, Willie telling me the whole week how you've been whining about the old man. And now you're just sitting there talking at me how maybe you should just divorce the guy. She gnawed on her cigarette, nervous eyes darting away from his face. Okay. So maybe I'm having second thoughts. Doesn't sound like the Ronda I used to know, not knowing what you want. He hasn't been bad to me, or cheated or anything like that. Do I look like Dr. fucking Phil to you? You don't understand. Actually, it's more like I don't fucking care. How much did you say you brought? Half. Three grand, way short of his normal asking price of ten. But they'd agreed already to the price over the phone, coding it, of course, in lingo that any listening ears couldn't make sense of or use in a courtroom. And it was something of a favor to Willie. Never a bad idea to stay in that bastard's good graces. But this bitch jerking his chain was really starting to wear thin. He fought down the anger. <sighs> well, see, it's like this, baby. I'm here now. You got it, you give it up, and let me take care of the business. A lot cleaner and easier than giving some shyster a fat cut. You feel some guilt after, go to fucking church. Now, I know what you are, where you come from. So don't waste my goddamn time telling me how you got too much to lose. You've changed all that happy horse shit. You tell me right now, yes or no. We're in. The soup du jour is down. Tonight's special is in the oven. Braxton was hugging the south wall, just beside the door, when the quiet confirmation from Burton sounded over the comm link. From his position, Braxton couldn't see who was what or where, angled as he was, downrange from the window. 
If the puke had gotten it wrong, he would enjoy kneecapping or castrating the guy with an Uzi burst. Maybe both. What the hell? Business first. Pleasure later. He keyed the button on his comlink, Uzi coming up in the free hand. That's cute. Three count, then go. Starting now. One. Braxton grasped the doorknob and twisted. Two. Well, this could come in handy, he thought. Three. He was through and bringing the subgun's muzzle up to the face of the woman who had been standing on the other side of the door. Dean looked away in disgust from Rhonda's deer-in-the-headlights expression and caught the mom with the nice rack and her brood heading for the door. Then he saw the terror on the woman's face, saw her freeze in her tracks, reining in the kids. Next he saw the two guys in black ski masks and guns marching out the hostages. What the hell was this? A robbery? A sting? Whatever was going down, something exploded in Dean's brain. Freeze! Screw that. He was walking out of here if he had to blast his way out. If he had half a second, he would have splintered pretty Rhonda's teeth. Something was telling him he'd been duped. Somehow the fucking whore had set him up. Dean bolted to his feet, hauled out the 44 Magnum pistol, and let loose the thing in his skull that had been kicking to get free. It went to hell in the time it took to blink. And for the first time in a long, dark age, the executioner found he was unable to do a damn thing to stop it. They came charging in, four gunmen in black, eyes alert and searching through the slits of their ski masks, their moves clearly mapped out and well-planned. Bolin spared a brief, bitter thought about the Rat Boy. The guy had to have been a scout, sent in to do a last-minute casing of the joint. The two raced through the front door, while two more gunners rolled out the kitchen doorway. It was done with such military precision and timing as they converged to take down the dining room that Bolin knew they were pros. Not just hoods looking to stick the place up for a handful of cash. Two factors kept the soldier at bay, his hand poised inside his jacket. First, his waitress had raised her hands as soon as she saw the armed ski masks, her legs wobbling in her terror. The woman teetered sideways in some weird slow-mo dance step that put her right in the line of Boland's line of fire. He might have tried to dive around her until he saw the Uzi stuck in the mother's face. Boland knew when to acknowledge bad luck and ride it out. If I see a gun, mom and kids are the first to go. In a heartbeat, one of the two-man backdoor team peeled off Quick steps putting him right behind the woman and children. A combat shotgun at their backs, securing a perfect human shield. But the juiced-up biker had other ideas. And as he started to swing the 44 Magnum pistol into play, Bolin saw the businessman stand with his arms out in supplication. No! Listen, I have the money in the car. I'll give it all back if you want. I'll work it out! Eat shit, you fuckers! You fuckers! The first line of lead tore into the biker's vest, spilling over to perforate his companion's pretty face and upper torso. The man in black with the Uzi fastened a cold stare Boland's way when his hand twitched an inch or so deeper inside the windbreaker, so the executioner didn't even move his head. But his peripheral vision took in the biker lady's friend, slamming around in the booth as if she were wired to 20,000 volts. But the biker kept coming, roaring at the attackers as he pounded out wild magnum thunder. The AR-15 kept chopping him up, driving him, spinning out into the room. The Uzi-toting gunman never took his eyes off Bolin, and something in those eyes behind the ski mask warned Bolin the curtain was only just going up on this psycho show. Robert Barkland couldn't believe it was happening. He was just about to turn the corner, move on, find the missing pieces he needed to pull it together. And Barkland gaped in wonder at the reality of the cliché, as his life truly did flash before his eyes. From cradle to grave, it was all gall and regret. He saw a chubby little cherub with thick eyeglasses being bullied by schoolmates. He had learned early on that might made right, but as he grew older he had cultivated a gift for quiet verbal diplomacy that steered around any unpleasant encounters. He had always treated everyone, from wives to co-workers to clients, with a mild-mannered civility and respect. Even back in Chicago, he would rather cross the street to the other side, head bowed and eyes averted, if young toughs came bouncing his way, always avoiding unfamiliar or intimidating human contact. Good citizen he had been, up to now. 
He obeyed every law to the letter, proud he'd never seen the inside of a courtroom, not even a traffic ticket on the books. He didn't gamble, smoke, use drugs, or frequent bars, indulge any of those vices he'd seen flush careers and marriages of several colleagues and acquaintances down the toilet. Moderation and minding his own business were the tenets of his philosophy. And what had it brought him? The quiet disdain of his peers, a life of discreet subjugation, two disastrous marriages, and the opportunity to bend over and grab his ankles to receive the special kind of justice meted out in divorce courts. Until the day of his epiphany, the moment he saw his opportunity, finally discovered his cojones and made use of them. And what do you know? He had pulled it off. It was going to work. He was moving on up. He'd finally found his piece of the pie. Pie? Barkland found he was staring at a half-eaten slice of cobbler on the table in front of him. And when he looked up, for just a second, he actually saw the bullet. <laughs> Collins nearly leaped through the roof at the first sound of gunfire. It was all thunder and the incessant staccato chatter of an assault rifle down there, with screaming and shouting. What he imagined was some sort of all-out battle raging in the dining room. It was all Weed could manage just to keep his bowels in check, certain he was now a co-conspirator to mass murder. Did they execute murderers in this state? he wondered. He didn't think he'd hang around long enough to find out. Just what the hell had gone wrong? It was only seconds after they went through the front door. Was that the plan all along? For the four strangers with no names to roll right in and just shoot everyone on sight? If they weren't there to rob the place of money, then what precisely were they after? Maybe the cop or the biker had put up a fight, drawn iron, and started blasting first. Who the fuck knew? He couldn't see inside the window from his angle, and he wasn't going to stick around. He didn't need answers that bad. All that racket from inside the restaurant, blowing off the walls and roof from the sounds of it, was sure to get heard. He didn't care if the interstate or the nearest living soul was miles away. Collins edged up between the seats, looked at the keys dangling from the ignition. Their stupidity, he decided, for leaving him with the option. Only if he fled, left them stranded, what then? Ditch the van? Go back to the ranch? Crawl into a hole and pull the rug over his head? Hope they didn't come gunning for him? All's forgiven? His nerves understandable, given the circumstances? Would he run for the next town? The next state? He started thinking of Mexico. But in the end, he didn't have the stones to run. He decided to hang tight, ride out the dread another minute or so, and see who walked out the door. If his ride came out, he figured it would look good that he'd kept the faith. The soldier saw it coming, and reacted in the only way he could. Positioned to save at least one innocent life right then, Get down! He bowled into his waitress and sent them both tumbling in a heap to the floor, away from any potential reckless line of fire. On your feet! Let me see your hands! It was over, for the moment. Bolin felt the waitress shudder beneath the cover of his own weight as he looked over at the bloody remnants of the bikers sprawled in front of him. The mother and children were physically unscathed, the obvious shock and terror etched on their faces. The woman's whole body was trembling as she mashed her son's faces to her midsection. The shotgun guy was visible from behind his human shields. Considering what had just happened, it looked like Mom was holding up pretty well. The lady had guts, and she knew they were lucky, grateful they were still alive. But Bolin knew with cold certainty that the men in black couldn't afford to leave behind any witnesses at this point. He took in the gunman from his ground-level vantage point, going from each set of eyes to the next. It didn't look good, but they hadn't gunned him down yet. The executioner intended to prove that a fatal error in their judgment. The biker's unfortunate lady friend wasn't the only casualty he next discovered. Bolin was standing, aware that both the Uzi and the assault rifle were trained on him, when he spotted the body across the room. Whoever the man in the white shirt had been, he'd gotten tagged by a stray bullet. A running smear of blood, with larger gobs glued to the wall above the table, told Bolin the magnum round had cored him through the brain. Bolin helped the waitress stand. No time to comfort her, quell her fears. He had all the living innocent to worry about from there on. The unfortunate lady on the floor, who had had some unknown business with the biker, was gasping for air, still clinging to a last breath. 
He took a step in her direction. Forget her! I might be able to help her. She's beyond help. And in that next moment, the soldier saw how right that was, as he watched the light fade from her eyes. I'll give you what you want, but let the rest of these people walk out of here first. It was worth a try, Harrison figured, to get a read on where things stood. If there was any hope at all, one or all of them could walk away from this. One search of the eyes of the gunner holding the Uzi, and he knew it was a futile demand. He didn't recognize the voice. He didn't know the man behind the mask, but he knew the look. The same cold, lifeless eyes he recalled seeing on that day when two American citizens were dragged out into the desert. It was happening again. Because of him, or the lack of guts he'd shown that afternoon, more innocent people were going to die, in the name of national security. Harrison looked at Tina and her sons, and his heart ached. He wanted to tell her how sorry he was, to hang in there, it was going to be all right, when the guy with the Uzi pointed it at Bolin. Unzip your jacket, use only your left hand, and shake it off. Everyone but the big guy, move out into the center of the main room. Keep all of your hands in the air. Stop when I tell you to. Everyone take it easy. It's going to be just fine. The biker was stupid, and accidents happen. Harrison looked over at his partner. Angelo was set to crack. Once Betty, Tina, and the boys were ushered into the center of the main dining room, flanked by shotgun and Glock, Harrison was sure he was going to vomit, guilt churning in his gut, as he braced for the massacre. Give it to them, Marty. Shut up, Angelo. The big man dropped his jacket on the floor, displaying a holstered sidearm, the center of everyone's attention. Left hand, cowboy. Use your thumb and trigger finger. Remove the piece, drop it nice and gentle, and kick it toward me. Harrison saw something in the man's eyes that gave him a dash of hope. Whoever, whatever he was, the big man hadn't panicked or tried to hero his way through it, resorting to gunplay that might endanger innocent lives. Small hope but it was all Harrison could find. The dark stranger was biding his time, searching for any opening. With their human chess pieces set up to their liking, the big man's gun kicked to Weatherspoon and scooped up, the Uzi guy stepped around the narrow partition. He took a few steps closer to Harrison, then stopped. So, here we are. Your new lives look to be treating you two pretty good since you quit the agency. Big shot restaurant owners, local celebrities way they hear it at special security. Looking down on all us little people working hard for Uncle Sam, trying to keep America free and safe. Hey, Angelo, you look like you're ready to take a dump in your pants. <laughs> you don't know me, but I know who you are. Read the whole file on you. Maybe I need another example. Show all these good people and your partner here how serious my business is. Marty, give it to them, for God's sake! They're gonna kill us either way. Maybe. Maybe not. You care to take a chance? You willing to give up your buddy, Marty? Angelo, why don't you tell us where it is? Save yourself. One chance. Two seconds. I'm the only one who knows where it is. What I told you before. Let everyone here walk first. The guy with the Uzi seemed to think about something, then nodded at the gunman with the Glock. I hate to waste precious ammo on a sack of shit like you, Angelo. What with government cutbacks on the military budget and all. The man with the Glock took a few casual steps forward and put the barrel of his weapon in Angelo's face. Bolin could do nothing but observe. He was a good fifteen feet away from any of the armed men. Shotgun had claimed his Beretta, which had vanished somewhere in the waistband in the back of the man's black combat fatigues. AR-15 had just cracked home a fresh clip, cocked and locked. A closer scrutiny now of the gunners, and Bolin noted the skinny wire of comlinks in place. Throat mics that had been nearly invisible at first glance, in the chaos and murder, were hung beside the slash of their mouths. Professionals, all around, they kept weapons poised to fire, low by the hip. Any sudden lunge or quick kick-out meant to slash a weapon from their hands would prove futile and suicidal. They hadn't bothered with a thorough frisk, either, but unfortunately it didn't make a difference. He was unarmed. Bolin hadn't seen the necessity to bring his big forty-four Magnum Desert Eagle backup piece along for a sit-down dinner. Not even a sheathed blade around the ankle. The screams snapped Bolin's grim attention to the portly mass writhing on the floor near the bar, a bloody hand clutching his mangled foot. 
At the last instant, before squeezing the Glock's trigger, the gunner had dropped his aim toward the floor. Whoever the men in black were, they wanted something from these two men Boland believed were the owners, and it wasn't money, which told him little but left him venturing a guess. The two men under the gun didn't strike him as criminals on the lam, two guys who had stuck it to four comrades, left them twisting in the wind on some heist or drug deal, absconding with the lion's share. Unless he missed his guess, judging the cold, methodical military approach they'd used to take the place down and get everyone under control, Boland figured he was in the middle of some intelligence scheme gone awry. Apparently, the men in black were also there to even the score, or leave behind a grim object lesson for others. Boland could have stood there and speculated all day. Survival needed to be the subject of his focus. He needed to act, soon, but the men with guns were far from careless, and no opening was apparent at the moment. Please, leave him alone. It's only a foot, girls. He's got another one. The waitress huddled close to the mother and children. What now? You go to kill him, then, then kill all of us? That's not my call, honey. Well, Marty, one more chance. Keep the three of us. Let the women and children walk. They can't possibly identify you. Harrison looked hopeful, someone taking charge in his corner. He's right. Give a little, I'll give you the whole package. They have nothing to do with any of this. Uzi grinned. Bolin could see the bastard was enjoying it all. Their fear, the power of life and death at his command. Did I miss something here, people? I thought the side holding the guns was in the position to make all the demands. The package, Marty. Now! Bolin knew another round of violence was coming. If they turned on the women and children, he would have no choice but to try. Doing something, even if it meant he went down in the attempt from a hail of lead and buckshot, was far preferable to standing by while the innocent were slaughtered. With daring, luck, and speed, he might reach the AR-15 in a flying leap. Go for broke. Harrison shook his head. No. Braxton nodded at Burton. Do it! Uh, 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 no, Angelo no. threw out his hands as if they would shield him from certain death. Uh. <laughs> Braxton was growing tired of the waiting game. He saw Angelo's head cracked open, blood and gore spattering the bar front. God damn you. Braxton looked at Harrison, was forced to readjust his aim, swinging the Uzi a few inches across his body as the guy took a step his way. Why are you making this so difficult, Marty? It's just a disc. Braxton looked at the big guy in the windbreaker. The puke had been right about those eyes. Tell you what, Marty. Maybe I can make one small concession. Bolin didn't like the feel of this development. Uzi turned to the guy with the shotgun. Our business is with Marty. The big guy, the women and kids don't need to stand around out here. Take them back in the kitchen, but the big guy trailing the pack. Let's move it, people. I don't have all night. Tina heard Bobby calling to her, but the terror and shock had such a vice-like grip on her heart and voice, she could only squeeze the boys tighter to her body. What words of comfort could she issue anyway? Even beyond this night, how could she ever hope to possibly erase the memories from her sons, the images of cold-blooded murder? That was assuming they were allowed to live. They were moving ahead, her sons in her arms, Betty first, arms shaking like leaves in the rain. She looked over her shoulder when something wanted to strike hope in her heart, catching the dark stranger's eye as he was urged to walk by the one with the shotgun. She wanted to stand there, decide what it was she'd caught in his look, but shotgun was growling at her. Keep moving. Mommy! Shh. It's gonna be all right, Bobby. Just do what they want. Her own voice sounded hollow in her ears, but she felt compelled to tell them something, to keep them strong that it was all going to work itself out somehow. She then discovered, beyond the furious pounding of her heart in her ears, how proud she was of both her sons. No screaming or crying on their part. She suddenly thought of them as little men, forced to grow up overnight. And seeing their faith in her somehow gave her hope. They would walk away together. Their lives would go on somehow beyond this horror. Brave little guys, she thought, fighting back the hot tears. 
She was moving through the doorway in a daze, the light striking off the aluminum counters and stainless steel of hanging utensils in a bright glare that hurt her eyes. She had to do something, she decided. It would prove suicide, but she could turn on the one holding the shotgun, charge him. In the same breath, she could yell at her sons to run while she provided a shield, while hoping only to God that they would bolt out the back door, run deep into the desert, aware that they could do nothing but try to save themselves. They could grieve later, try to fathom the senselessness of it all, but they would still be alive. Tina Whalen couldn't be certain of anything right then, how she would manage to force herself to act, even if that meant sacrificing her own life. Was there any alternative? She considered then what she'd caught in the look that the dark man seemed to level her way, and for her benefit alone. Oh, God! Betty had been the first to see Davy's corpse. Nausea bubbled up in Tina as she saw the dark hole between his eyes, still leaking blood. And she knew beyond any doubt at that moment, a bitter chill in her blood, that all of them would be dead within the next few minutes. Silently, Tina Whalen started to pray. They were ushered into the kitchen, hidden from watching eyes in the dining room, when it happened. All at once, it seemed, several factors conspired to give Bolin the opportunity for which he had been waiting. First, the sight of the dead man paralyzed the waitress, bringing her to an abrupt stop. Blood had pooled away from the hole punched in the man's forehead, spreading from the sprawled form, and the waitress slipped in the gore, nearly going down. Bolin's eyes flickered to the butcher knife on the counter, inches away. Damn it! Bolin twisted his head enough to see the gunner had kept moving forward and was aiming the muzzle away from him, bringing it around to bear on the waitress. That was a mistake. The executioner pivoted and shot out a hand. Bolin shoved the muzzle up and away with his left hand while snatching up the butcher knife with the other, all in the span of a second. Instead, the ceiling light took the full charge of the explosion. The soldier held onto the gun, glass and sparks raining on his head. It was an awkward angle of attack, thrusting the shotgun down with one hand as Bolin followed through the half turn. He went for the throat, knife flying around, and plunged the blade deep past the man's windpipe. Bolin felt the blade's point spear through bone, nearly decapitating the guy on its way out his neck. Bolin yanked the shotgun from lifeless fingers. One hard man down, dead on his feet, and falling. Hit the deck! Over his shoulder, Bolin saw the group comply, then sighted the AR-15 swinging around the corner. He was unfamiliar with some of the basics of the new HK Benelli in his hands, but he knew it was an autoloader, probably eight of its nine possible rounds in the tubular magazine. Simple enough, just aim and squeeze the trigger. The assault rifle came blazing through the door, bullets snapping past Boland's head, bouncing off some hung cookware. It was a hasty shot on Boland's part, running on adrenaline and instinct, but it did the job. A spreading blanket of 12-gauge maulers chopped the hard man off at one knee, all but amputating the leg, and he went down in a shrieking heap. Jolted by the first roar of the shotgun, Braxton looked toward the kitchen doorway, off to his left. Momentary shock punched him in the gut. He had a hard time acknowledging the ominous thought warning him one of his men was down, taken out by the big guy. No way. They were all seasoned pros to a man. This should have been a cakewalk. He almost called out for Christensen, but his gut told him it was pointless. Hit the deck! He recognized that voice, the big guy. What the hell had he been thinking? He should have put a bullet in the asshole's brain as soon as he dropped his gun. Braxton was one step away from losing control of the situation altogether. Then he heard and saw Witherspoon's leg almost sheared off just above the knee. Braxton left him to his misery. All his comrades' misfortune meant to Braxton right then was that his discarded AR-15 was another weapon in the hands of his enemy. It was time to get in high gear. Two were down, Weatherspoon still alive, but not for long the way his limb was gushing. That left him and Burton. It was a simple impulse that caused him to squeeze the Uzi's trigger then, aiming low. He refrained from delivering a lethal wound. As Harrison went down in a flopping heap, Braxton waved the Uzi at Burton, signaling to move it out and up on the doorway. Harrison wasn't going anywhere. First, the hero. The executioner broke stride as he closed for the doorway, 
combat shotgun in one hand, leading the way. He had already retrieved the Beretta from Witherspoon, had a heartbeat at most to check on the women and children before he moved forward. He threw a nod to indicate they should secure cover on the far side of the counter, and he moved ahead. There was no choice but to leave them behind and hope for the best. Beyond the two clear and present dangers on the other side of the wall, Boland wondered if there could be other hard men left outside to secure the perimeter, watching for new arrivals, covering all bases. Common sense, though, told him they would have rushed through the door by now, and the rat boy he saw earlier didn't strike Boland as the strike team sort. As he moved to the edge of the doorway, the hard man with the mangled leg lolled his head around as if it were fixed to a rubber band instead of bone and muscle, the whites of his eyes rolling at Boland's approach. He pumped one 9mm hollow point round through the temple of the ski mask, as much to put the guy out of his misery as to leave nothing to chance on his blind side. Boland stowed the Beretta back into its holster and listened to the silence. He heard the Uzi stammer, but no bullets came flying his way, gouging divots in the wall or chomping up the door's edge. He wasn't sure what that meant. A quick glance around the edge, and he found the man named Marty stretched out, a pool of blood spreading beneath him. There wasn't a second to indulge wondering over the dead or the dying. Four lives were counting on him to end this nightmare. He was hauling the AR-15 assault rifle from the floor when the shooting resumed. Dropping back, lead chewed up the frame above his head. Bolin knew he had to end it within seconds. Instinct and experience warned him they were already on the move, set to come at him from converging points. He judged the direction from which he'd identified the sound-suppressed Glock. Roughly nine o'clock out in the dining room, the Uzi spray at twelve. Now, if either hard man stayed put long enough... Both weapons were silent the next moment as he went for broke. Bolin stayed low, hugging the cover of the wall as he reached the shotgun out and triggered the autoloader one-handed. He wasn't hoping for an easy tag out of the gate. The idea was to make his adversaries think twice about closing in, to get them to rabbit for cover while he broke out with the AR-15. He was cutting loose in a thunderous sweep, left to right, and the third blast was rewarded. Tracking on blindly, he pumped out another two rounds of 12-gauge death. Staying put was seldom an option for Bolin when under enemy fire. He had to ride the flow of momentum, try to present as brief a target as he could. He caught a glimpse of a ski mask and an Uzi darting for cover somewhere in the smoking section. But Bolin was driving onward, hauling in the AR-15, ready with the final round of the shotgun in the other hand. He came around the corner, rolling on and off to the right, staying low. He was momentarily shielded from Uzi fire by the low partition dividing the smoking section from the main dining room, when he spotted the hard man rising off the table to 10 o'clock. The soldier saw the spray and prey had taken the guy with the Glock down low, judging by the shredded wounds around his groin. The executioner glimpsed a set of white orbs blazing with hate and agony, the hand shaking as the gunner tried to line up a shot. Bolin hit his target with a bullseye charge in the chest. The body was flying back as the soldier veered on for the partition, firing a burst from the AR-15 on his run for cover. Downrange, wood exploded beside the bobbing masked face. Bolin chucked the spent riot gun away, directed a short burst of auto-fire toward the far end of the smoking section, the rounds chopping up the top edge of a cushioned booth. He waited until the last critical instant, making sure Uzi spotted him moving on the run down the short barrier leading for the opening to the room. The Uzi was chewing up the wall behind the soldier as he stayed hidden behind the barrier and reversed direction, a few swift steps taking him back the other way. The hard man had to be feeling his nerves at that point. Alone now, eyewitness to at least three of his shooters going down. The executioner popped up, the muzzle of the AR-15 fixed on the flash from the Uzi. The shooter's eyes darted toward Bolin's position. The executioner held back on the AR-15's trigger, blasting away a portion of the ski mask in dark, meaty hunks, dropping the gunner out of Bolin's sight. The executioner straightened and took in the carnage. It was a slaughterhouse, front and back. He searched through the gun smoke, and the fluttering bits of stuffing and wall paint. Ah, thank God you... I, I, I can't feel my legs. It was the man they had called Marty. He was gut shot, bleeding out fast. 
paralysis from the waist down would be his least worry, the soldier knew. Hold on. I'll get help. The others... the kids... All four uh. are alive. Bolin had a lot of questions for the man. Bolin heard the engine gunning to life to the south, he judged. Rat boy, no doubt. Running. Collins couldn't say what had happened or why. Basic instinct for survival told him in no uncertain terms he didn't need to know anything more than to start hauling ass. Run and don't look back. Oh, shit! Crazy bastards! I knew it! It's just fucking Nevada! Goddamn Desolation Road, home to Area 51 after all. Whole town's gone crazy here. Wild eyed nut jobs, sure look great there. Deep breeze and underground bunkers. Flying saucers guarded by government assassins. All manner of weirdness out here. Messed up folks, brains fried by too much sun and whiskey. Strange outside forces. Fucking talk to myself. Get a grip, girl. you're gonna be fine. His nerves felt like razors, slicing him to the bone as he stamped on the gas, flooring it, sending the van lurching ahead, his head thrown back with a sudden G-force. He was rolling, gathering momentum at light speed, a rocket ride skimming the earth, streaking him on and away into the night. It didn't seem fast enough. Weed realized he really had no place to go except the commune with the UFO nuts. Food and shelter, at worst, a place to regroup, think out the immediate future. With any luck and a clever move or two, he could find the stash of guns and money he knew was there. One of the cult members had taken Weed into his confidence. Sure, he was one of them, seekers of the truth. The idiots, fucking pigeons to be plucked. But escape first. His only concern was to get as far away from the scene of the crime as possible. He was flying past the restaurant when he looked at the shadow barging through the door. Oh, shit! It couldn't. But the face was framed in enough light. The cop. Just catching blurred sight of the rifle in the shadow's hand, as the cop stepped farther into the light, Collins thought the big guy might take a pot shot. Evasive maneuvers were called for. It was risky, jerking the wheel an inch to the left and the right, the narrow road leading to the interstate, which was still miles away. The least error in judgment could send him careening off the road, tumbling out into the desert. He almost lost it. The wheel threatening to wrench itself from his sweaty clutch as rubber squealed and grabbed at some edge in the roadside like jagged teeth. It was luck that saw him bound back onto a level stretch, straightening out the lightning ride. A look to the side to be sure he was in the clear showed him the mirrored image was fading quick. Colin saw the muzzle flash winking in the glass, the shadow winging bullets his way. His heart jumped, pounding with jackhammer fury as he braced for a round to come blasting through the back window, drilling him in the head. Another hundred yards, and he realized the choked sob in his ears for what had signaled. Relief. He was still in one piece. Far from clear and free, but Collins clung to the hope that he could vanish, lay low, and sort out his next move. He hit the lights, those twin beams like rays of salvation ahead of him. It would have been a lucky score at any rate. He'd been hoping to blow out a tire. Bolin had caught a glimpse of the guy behind the wheel just as he drove by and recognized Rat Boy. He saw the wheelman bring the rig out of its second whiplash. Barreling on, the van was soon well out of range of the assault rifle. Well, Rat Boy would keep, even if he was lost to the night for the time being. Beyond the fleeing co-conspirator, Bolin knew he was looking at plenty of dark, unfinished business. He let the AR-15 fall by his side as he canvassed the night, listening to the silence after the roar of Weed's getaway was finally eaten up by the dark. Holen walked, intent on giving the blackness around the perimeter of the slaughterhouse a thorough investigation. He didn't think he'd find a lurking threat left in the wake of Weed's dust, but he would check to cover his back. Some grim chain of events had unfolded, a net cast his way by fate, perhaps meant to draw him here all along, to this very time and place. It happened to Bolin so often, he didn't even bother to ponder it anymore. A while back, Bolin came to figure that every piece of nastiness in which he found himself was just confirmation from the cosmos that he was living the life he was supposed to. He couldn't say what was what or who was who in this particular shitstorm, at least not yet. 
but he strongly suspected that Black Ops, either acting on its own or with orders handed off from some rogue faction of some intelligence branch, was behind the massacre inside. The executioner searched the shadows. It took a while to make sure there was no threat. Then he went through the screen door at the back of the howling coyote. <gasps> it's me. Stay here. I'll be back. And the executioner walked on into the dining room in search of answers. We've hit a snag, I believe. So it would seem. In our business, no news is not good news. We should know something in the next two minutes. You should have known something by now. What can I say? We're on it. <gasps> ah. Grimacing, it was all he could do to choke off the gasp of pain. The heat boiling from deep in his brain, bringing on the hot flush in his face, the nausea welling up so quickly and furiously the cramps nearly doubled him over. Are you there? A moment. He took the bottle of pills, despising the very sight of the hairless skin on his hand, flesh so white it seemed to glow against the shadows of the monitor. What had they told him about his affliction? A leak in the seal of the damn thing, he thought, radiation seeping out. Sorry about that, just his bad luck. And how could something with no visible component parts be called sealed up anyway? Someone had lied to him, that much was certain. Well, their day was coming. It was his only reason to live anymore, he knew. If they thought they could simply put him out to pasture to rot away in a slow, agonizing death. He caught his own stark image reflected in the monitor's screen. The accident had turned him into a freak show. Not even a whisker or stubble of hair anywhere on his body. Albino eyes, almost blinded by sunlight, unless he wore the wraparound visor glasses. That was if he ventured on rare occasion outside the mobile home. And the sickness was getting worse. Not even the bitter taste of the sulfuric so-called wonder pill worked its magic anymore. No cure, no answers. He suffered from what they called symptoms of advanced radiation sickness. He had solicited a second opinion from a civilian doctor who didn't have a clue as to what his illness really was but had wanted to run a battery of tests just the same, which he had declined. He was dying, and no amount of poking and prodding would find a cure, and it certainly would never return to him the man he had once seen in the mirror. Although he had been removed from the actual work of the project, he was still chief of security. That would be enough. He just needed some extra leverage, a little more time. A long overdue judgment day was just around the corner. <clears throat> Status. A cleanup crew is en route. Our people? Our infrared and heat-seeking monitors on board both van and helicopter are showing one occupant in the vehicle. I'm having it tailed. I'm assuming it was your stooge going rabbit when it got too hot in the kitchen. Was that meant as a cheap shot? Questioning his judgment to bring in a civilian sheep? An insolent tongue was the last thing he needed. He was ready to tell the man just such when he quickly filled in his report. Gunfire was called into the sheriff. We are about to get a read on the inside. Two minutes until my people are in place. Something went wrong. That much I can be certain of. I really don't want some delicate juggling act with the sheriff when we go in and find a bunch of dead civilians. Which is my guess what we'll be looking at. The sheriff is your man. The sheriff, therefore, works for us. Handle it. Report back within the hour. Yes, sir. There was nothing to do now, he knew, except wait. And, of course, hope the pill eased his suffering. Huh. The guy was gone. There was just a bloody splotch where Bolin had left him, as if Marty had vanished into thin air. Bolin was certain the slaughter here had only left more armed shadows in the wings, waiting for their turn to boil up out of the night and pounce on the place. He was advancing toward the puddle of blood when the soldier saw the streak of crimson, leading in broken smears to a point at the edge of the bar. The blood trail led to the man behind the bar. The vacant stare told Bolin there was no need to check for a pulse. Before succumbing to his mortal wounds, the man had crawled off in search of the disc Bolin now found clutched in his hand. A safe had been built into the floor, carefully constructed to blend in with the wood. Feeling inside the narrow confines of the safe, 
Bolin discovered it empty. One disc. Some extortion angle, maybe? Or classified intel on a black project, perhaps? All Bolin knew right then was that four men had come here to take whatever truth Marty had jealously guarded. Even if that meant sacrificing his own life and the lives of others. Which was exactly what had happened. He was closing the lid, settling it back in place in the floorboard, when the light descended over the restaurant. A penetrating white sheen flooding the place. The floor trembled around Poland as a thunderous blanket of rotor wash hit the roof. Braced for bad company, the executioner plucked the disc from Marty's death grasp and slipped it in his pants pocket. It would be a start, assuming he could crack any access code. If not, he would transfer its contents to Stony Man Farm on the briefcase sat link in his rental vehicle. The executioner intended to stick around this stretch of Nevada, at least until he learned why four men had gone on a murderous rampage. It was clear enough they had come here to take the disc, but why? What was on it? Even if they were black operatives guarding a classified military project, it hardly gave them any right to threaten, much less execute, unarmed civilians. So much for vacation. The light vanished, but Boland saw the silhouettes of two vans lurching to a halt beyond the window, could almost sense bodies hitting the ground around the perimeter, dropping from the chopper to surround the place. The soldier was up and moving, the AR-15 aimed at the front door, ready to call out to the kitchen for the four survivors to get to him right away, when two HK MP5s were thrust in his direction and drawing a bead. The two hard men in black had taken up positions on either side of the front door, their faces grim as death. Full body armor, balaclava helmets with comlinks, Bolin noted on the fly as he secured cover at the edge of the retaining wall. He swung the AR-15 around the corner. Drop the weapon! I'm a cop! Justice Department! Mommy, look! Oh, dear God, there's more of them! What Bolin heard coming from the kitchen told him more SWAT-type goons were charging the rear, closing the net. I told you to drop the weapon! Get those guns off me first and we'll talk about it. Another voice came at Bolin from the flickering shadows beyond the men in black. This is Sheriff Walsh! Do what they say, no one's gonna get hurt! He might as well have said he was the Tooth Fairy. Let me see a badge. The soldier swung his aim as another helmet and subgun materialized in the kitchen doorway off to his side. Reason told Bolin they would have already started shooting if they meant to kill him or the women and children, wrap up whatever mess had been created. Still, given the horror show he had just waded through, he wasn't about to accept a simple demand to disarm himself, official G-men or not. We're with the United States government. This is official government business. Drop the weapon! I'm thinking the four guys who just came here and killed five people were likewise official. Sweet Jesus. I'm Walsh! Here's my badge! Bolin kept the assault rifle pointed at the front door, turned his head and saw the stocky figure in brown with matching Stetson hat stepping through the doorway. There was a star pinned to his chest, and the guy held out an ID wallet, hands away from his gun. Okay. Showing you mine. How about let me see yours? In my coat. On the floor and smoking. The women and kids? We have them. They're fine. Just drop the weapon. The executioner knew it was pointless to drag out the standoff. Hemmed in, front to back, there was nothing to do but wait and see what happened. Bolin was standing as the sheriff rifled through his windbreaker, felt the angry looks drilling into him, the gunner's edgy as he held on to the assault rifle. It was a mess worse than he could have imagined. Thomas Thornton was staring down a potential fiasco that could not only expose the project, but quite possibly would land him and a few others a long vacation in Leavenworth. Unless, of course, some quick moves were made. The slaughterhouse he found told Thornton it would be a neat trick to clean up this one without Washington getting into the act. He'd have to be shrewd and lucky to keep the rumor mill from spinning out of control, pointing fingers toward the classified base just south of this massacre. Four civilians and one badge from the Justice Department were still walking around to sing his potential swan song. The sheriff and his deputies weren't even elected officials. That alone might raise the red flags. The badges had been brought on board by the NSA specifically to keep tabs on local civilians, keep the curious and talkative under control. 
Men in black were sometimes dispatched to convince certain locals that a flapping tongue spreading wild rumors might not be in their best interest. But Thornton feared no amount of dire warning could hold the lid down on this one. Nine corpses. Fortunately, four of them at least could be discreetly erased, since Braxton and his crew didn't even officially exist. Not on paper, nor even as a number in cyberspace. No immediate family, not even a driver's license or a social security number among them, which was SOP for anyone trained or recruited for the Special Security Division by the Department of Defense. So there would be no official report filed in triplicate on the sheriff's end. That went without saying. But the man would have to tap dance around some minefields and go through the motions of an investigation for public consumption. Deal with next of kin, spin out a good story to pacify any who might sniff something suspicious. Thornton started having visions of a congressional hearing, elected officials going berserk, demanding to know the truth. He told himself it was best to rein in the paranoia, deal with the moment. There was a wild card waiting outside. And if the big guy ID'd as Michael Belasco of the Justice Department was just a regular G-man in the right place at the wrong time, Thornton thought, then he was the fucking tooth fairy. The sheriff walked up, looking worried. <sighs> place is a goddamn slaughterhouse. You questioned them, I assume. Same story you got. And that bugged Thornton even more. The Justice Badge had cleaned up Braxton and crew by himself. Incredible. Gunning them down, if he could believe the first reports, as if these guys were nothing more than a few street punks with a Saturday night special. Professional assassins who had been selected particularly for their skills by the DOD and the NSA. This Belasco had a look Thornton really didn't care for. Still holding onto the assault rifle outside, he seemed to be sizing them up with suspicion. I read this Belasco as a problem. Thornton surveyed the four corpses of his men. Let me go talk to this guy. See if I can reason with the man. <laughs> Good luck. He looked away from the body off to the side as one of his men stripped off the ski mask. Burton laid out like a gutted fish across the table. I'm not sure I care for your tone, Sheriff. I hope you're not forgetting who butters your bread. <laughs> not for one second. See, what I don't like is you can saunter off into the night. Go back and hole up in Spook City with all your security, clearances, and high-tech gizmos to hide behind. Keeping from us little folks, whatever goes on down there in the name of national security. Even if that means killing off a few locals, former colleagues of yours, or a tourist like that poor schmuck over there with a Chicago rental. Me? I'm hung out here on the front line. I got families of victims to deal with. Questions that'll need answering. Local media. I trust you'll see that's as far as it goes. Yeah, me and my magic wand. I understand your concerns. We'll talk some more later. First, I need to make sure tonight's hero and I reach an understanding. Yeah, you do that. You got something to say. Out with it. All I'm saying is that if those women and kids were getting zipped up in rubber, we'd all be in a world of hurt. <sighs> Didn't he know it, Thornton thought and marched off to have a word with the hero. The executioner waited by his Jeep Cherokee while the crew of gunners in black went marching about, conducting their business in grim silence. Which, if past experience with these type of operatives for a black project was any indication, was slapping together a cover story. He was interested in hearing the snow job they would dump in his lap. Olin intended to stick around, make himself a major pain in someone's tail as soon as the opportunity presented itself. And if armed shadows started popping up, demanding he leave town by sundown or else, then the gloves would come off. Bolin watched as three Black Ops hardmen tore through the Toyota rental. The sheriff had already liberated some paperwork from the glove box. One of the men produced a briefcase from the trunk, then took a thin metallic instrument from a pocket in his armor and jimmied open the latches. Bolin couldn't see what was inside, but the men gave the contents little more than passing curiosity. Both briefcase and the man in black disappeared into the restaurant. Another man was rifling through the biker's saddlebags. Bolin could make out the form of a stubby submachine gun, which looked like an outdated army subgun from where he stood. Bolin was poised to refuse examination of the Cherokee, but found it wasn't necessary, as they stayed well clear from his rental. 
and the helicopter he'd heard was now nowhere to be seen. Again, from experience, he knew it often happened that way. Chopper swoops down, the shock troops disembark, then it's gone in one thrust of turbos. Olin looked through the restaurant window, watching the sheriff and the man in black who had just grilled him, the women and the children, huddled together. He had seen the sheriff take a wallet from the pants pockets of the businessman. The first round of identifying victims, notifying next of kin, or the beginning of an elaborate charade. Boland's first impression of the head gunner was basic. Bad news, he obviously thought himself above the law. If he had had the time to pull off a ski mask or two from the dead shooters, Bolin would bet the man in black now running the show, or at least the gruesome cleanup detail, would have been a carbon copy from lean frame to chiseled features to crew cut. The executioner couldn't say yet about the county sheriff, but he had a suspicion he was on the payroll. Whoever the nine dead people really were, well, Bolin figured it best it would be need to know. He could play that game too, and he had the disc. Bolin found the two women standing at the rear of the Chevy pickup, the boys sitting in the cab. No point in lugging around a reminder of the violence they'd lived through, had barely escaped. Moving to the driver's window, Bolin looked in on the boys. You guys hanging in there? Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Uh they nodded, keeping it pretty together. But Bolin knew from experience their trauma would have to be dealt with at some point. A few more minutes, you'll be going home with your mom. The look the younger one gave Bolin tugged at something of his own the soldier had thought he'd long since buried. I don't think we have a home, sir. Uh, Bobby, the man doesn't need to hear our problems. You men did real good in there. Your mom must be very proud. I'm going to go see how she's doing, okay? Bolin went to the women. I regret what happened in there. I'm sorry they had to see it, but there was really no choice. We, uh... I mean, speaking for myself, uh, we're just grateful you were here. Betty was working on a cigarette, her hands visibly shaking. Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't for you... God, I feel sick. What happened? But... You're alive. That's all that counts right now. You've got each other. You want to make sure your boys talk about what happened with you. And try to get them to a trained mental health professional. Yes, of course, of course. So what next? We have to hang around, get asked a bunch more questions? We already told them what happened. Self-defense, you did what you had to do. I'll never be sure what... Oh, thank God for that. And you. But I can't help think they would have... They would have. You would be sure of that. But it's over. So, we can go? Let them go through the drill. I'm not trying to alarm you, but do either of you have some place out of this county you can go and stay for a few days? Do you have a man? No. My husband passed away a little over two years ago. And Tina here, her husband left. Oh, Lord. Sorry, Tina. My big mouth. I always talk too much when I'm nervous. It's all right. Everyone has a situation. But you need to think about yourselves. I have a sister in Reno. Why? You don't think I'm not sure what to think. I just feel it might be better for the four of you if you left the area for a little while. He paused, studied their pensive faces, wishing he could do more. I guess you're both out of work now. They glanced at each other, not sure where Bolin was headed. He gathered the mother had a situation involving a missing husband. Two kids to raise. No job, no father. Hanging in there, hoping another door opened up. Wait here. Bolin went to fetch the war bag inside the SUV. He zipped it open and dug out the wad of cash. Five thousand and change in walking around war funds. He peeled off two grand. Uh, no, no, I couldn't. Please, please, you've done enough, mister. Call it a loan until you get back on your feet. A thousand for each of you. All I'm asking for is a number at which I can reach you both to make sure you're okay. Take it. For the boys. Fair enough? They had pride, but they knew Bolin spoke from the heart. And sometimes all that could be done, he knew, was to survive. Go on with it. Reluctantly, they took his money. Velasco, when you're done socializing over there... Chewing on his nerves, Thornton waited for the justice agent to tear himself away from what he read as consoling the women. Edging away from the front door, he stepped out into the dancing shadows of the neon sign, again ready to bark for Belasco to get it in gear, 
but restrained the urge. They were over there, the justice man telling them to write down two phone numbers, made sure he had them before they left. Now what the hell did that mean, he wondered, but his knotted gut told him this guy wasn't going back east any time soon. Not good. Didn't mean to interrupt. No problem. I can see you're too busy to concern yourself with traumatized innocents. Yeah, right. Anyway, I've talked it over with the sheriff. We're going to buy your version of events. That's that? Pretty much. This is official government business from here on. Classified. I see. All right, out with it, Belasco. I don't have time for games. What exactly is it you think you see? Those eyes, weighing something, glancing toward the restaurant. Had the guy seen, he wondered, what was in the civilian's briefcase? And that was yet another worry, compounding the migraine, Thornton knew. Let's just say I'm catching a bad whiff. Of what? When I find out, I'll let you know. What does that mean? When I find out, I'll let you know. Just what made you stop in here anyway? I was hungry. I'm on vacation. Well, now you can go on and enjoy the rest of it, Belasco. But do it somewhere else. The Justice Department has no jurisdiction here. Classified, eyes-only stuff. Exactly. So are we clear on that much? Oh, yeah. So how come I'm not convinced? I'm not very persuasive. Are the five of us dismissed? Bolin started to turn away. Hold on a second. The way you and the others described what happened, yeah, it fits my first walk through the scene. The thing I was curious about was the owner, the one I found behind the bar. If he was gut shot in the middle of the room, like you said, well, why would he bother to crawl all that way to die? He was in a lot of pain, I gather. Meaning? Maybe he needed a drink. You think that's funny? You see me laughing? All right. You and the others are free to go. That's that. You keep saying that like there's supposed to be something else. A lot of people died here tonight. I'm thinking you know who marched in there and what they were after. I'm thinking they went for something and were ordered to not leave behind a single witness. I've had some experience with your kind. Oh, and what kind might that be? The kind who thinks he doesn't have to answer for things like what happened here. Who can justify it all in the name of national security. Even if that means killing innocent people who happen to get in the way. Is that some kind of a threat, Belasco? Just an observation. Good enough, Thornton decided. Now he knew where things stood. Tough guy wanted to play hardball. Enjoy your vacation. Though he did his best to appear unperturbed, Thornton felt the hammering then of his heart in his ears, watching as Belasco went back to the women. Another little conference ensued by the pickup. Some final words he couldn't make out, but meant to comfort the ladies, he guessed. Thornton found himself grateful when the guy was finally in the SUV, cranking over the engine. The guy obviously waited until the Chevy with the kids and the Ford Galaxy with the lone female occupant backed out. Then he fell in behind, trailing them up 305 for the interstate. It looked as if the justice man meant to ride their rear, maybe making sure they got home safe. Thornton suspected his troubles had only just started. The next chore, he knew, might prove very unpleasant. The map had told Bolin Interstate 80 ran parallel with US 50 to the south, roughly 400 miles east to west from the California to Utah borders. Both might be considered the loneliest roads in America, but Boland's mental radar was telling him he wasn't going to be alone for long. The soldier watched the two vehicles swing to his left as he eased out onto the interstate, the women leaning out an arm to wave goodbye in the fleeting wash of his headlights. They proceeded west, quickly lost to the night and the distance. They were going home to pack up for Reno. Boland figured the four of them would be safer if he wasn't along for the ride watching over them, even though he had briefly considered doing just that. They should be fine if they all left for Reno by morning. He couldn't be absolutely certain they were in danger, but he wasn't going to put the enemy's paranoia to the test where they were concerned. If there was hostile interest in any of the survivors from the Howling Coyote, Bolin knew he would be the one singled out for a visit. When asking about lodging, the women had told him there was a motel a few miles down the road in the opposite direction to where they were going. 
A polite reference was made to him to consider staying the night at one of their homes, but he declined. He told them he'd touch base as soon as he was settled at the motel. The soldier checked the pitch blackness behind and on either side of the desert as he motored along. He recalled seeing by day low croppings of black granite hills with vast sweeping mud or salt flats stretching in between barren rock stubble. All of it had shimmered in a white glare so burning as the desolation baked under the sun, it felt as if more than a passing stare could singe your eyeballs. It was hard, unforgiving country out here. It could kill a stranded motorist without water within hours. Deadly terrain. An adversary could boil up out of the night without a sound, or appear by day as nothing more than a mirage until the fatal blow was delivered. No one would be the wiser except the killer, since Mother Nature and a host of scavengers would quickly consume the remains. If the soldier was thinking along those lines, he would bet that the men in black had the same thought. A mile or so after he left the women and children, Boland's suspicions were confirmed in the side view mirror. He couldn't see it clearly, but there was enough star and moonlight to outline the dark bulk of the van. Having thought ahead before venturing away from the restaurant abattoir, the executioner had settled the war bag on the shotgun seat. One hand on the wheel, he reached over, delved into the open bag, and produced the HK MP5 SD3 subgun. He eased off the gas, saw the dark shape fall back some, then rested the SMG on top of the bag within easy reach. The soldier grew weary of the obvious tale and decided to force the issue. He pulled onto the shoulder of the road and waited as they rolled on. He took the SMG in hand as the black shape grew in the side view mirror. The lights flared on, a twin beacon hitting him in the eyes. Squinting, he braced for gunfire and thrust open the door. He held the subgun by his leg, hidden from their view. The windows were tinted black, hiding the faces of the occupants. His combat senses flared as he held his ground. The van blew by, and the soldier felt watching eyes as the slipstream kicked a gust of hot wind and exhaust in his face. Black suits, checking up on him. He watched the van quickly disappear into the night. So, let the games begin. The IDs collected by the sheriff from the civilian casualties were simply more reminders of the coming landmines he'd have to navigate around. At first, Thornton judged them to be another nuisance. The second perusal, however, sitting at the mini-control console, alone inside the van that doubled as a rolling command post, sparked the beginnings of an idea, a way out of this mess. He was forced to give it up the next moment. His surveillance detail wanted to know their standing orders. The justice man, he'd been informed, had claimed a room, called, of all damn things, he thought, Alien. The extraterrestrial highway, Groom Lake, home to Area 51, and the bizarre tourist trap that was the town of Rachel, all of that might be far south, but the locals in all the surrounding counties seemed to have jumped on the paranormal bandwagon, hoping to cash in. The UFO craze wasn't his immediate problem. Since the shack that passed for an office didn't have a computer, there was no way Thornton could tap in, ascertain how long the G-Man planned on hanging around the county. Monitor the situation and keep me posted by the hour. Thornton hit the end button on the secured cell relay. Again, he scanned the driver's licenses. What was that voice telling him the answers were staring him in the face? First, he had to wonder why the victim ID'd as Robert Barklin was toting around 200 grand in brand new hundreds, but with credit cards under various names. There was a plane ticket found in one of three sets of luggage, the man apparently en route to catch a flight scheduled the day after tomorrow from LAX to Honolulu. Of course, that was before a wild bullet from the biker's 44 Magnum forever punched out his lights. If Barklin was running from the law or ditching a bad marriage, or both, he wasn't real slick at covering his tracks. Thornton had already run a check on the man, pulling out the name of the accounting firm he worked for, or had. It was safe to say the late accountant had moonlighted as an embezzler, cash siphoned off behind the backs of unwitting clients over a period of time, tucked away in a waiting offshore account. For some reason, the question nagging Thornton was from whom had he stolen? It would take some more digging through cyberspace. A few phone calls back east. 
Well, Thornton decided he hadn't spent ten years honing all his hacking and tracking skills as a special NSA op for comment, communications intelligence, to have them fail him at a critical juncture. A social security number, he knew, was all it took for him to unveil everything about the lives of the victims. Simple as that. The average American citizen didn't understand the ramifications, he thought, of being branded with a simple string of numbers. If they ran afoul of the law, creditors, or anybody with a computer and even marginal hacking skills, their life story, at least the Reader's Digest version, was an open book. But how did he proceed from there? Knowledge was only power when it was put to use. Some type of a preemptive strike was called for. Something to throw at the justice man keep him sidetracked if he was bent on making himself a major pain in the ass. All Thornton really suspected right then was that if he didn't get busy putting out the few fires already burning around him, he would have a real inferno to deal with. Next he pondered the biker, Nevada motorcycle license, an address in Reno declared as residence. Hard to say if the address was a smokescreen or not, since the biker lifestyle was transient to say the least. Still. No matter how far a man strayed beyond the edges of civilized society, Thornton knew someone would eventually wonder about the biker, just as much as anyone would notice a nine-to-five pillar of the community had up and vanished. Did that mean a pack of biker trash was already tearing up the highway, wondering what had happened to their missing bro, creating yet another fire that needed dousing? And what had been his business with the woman? The initial cyberspace jaunt through NCIC had turned up a long criminal record on one Samuel Dean, including a five-year stint at San Quentin for aggravated assault on a police officer. His gut told Thornton to keep digging, piece it together. The answers were out there. Then there was a dead cook from Denver, a quick run through his IRS files turning up a wife and kids as dependents. No criminal record, nothing untoward whatsoever. It was Rhonda Jones who triggered his internal alarm. Thornton discovered she was married to an aerospace physicist, and from Area 51, no less. That meant the guy was familiar with some of the drill when strange things started happening to loved ones. Maybe Mr. Jones's suspicions about his wife's violent demise could prove troublesome, or perhaps a simple word of warning. He almost jumped, laughing as it hit him like a bolt of lightning. It would take more research, but he saw the first glimpse of an answer. No way was he waiting around to see if G-Man launched some investigation or a personal crusade. Thornton could iron out any suspicious details later, after he pulled it off. Fingers flying over the keyboard, he scrolled up the first of two phone numbers he intended to call. They weren't the next of kin, but they were the next best thing. They were pawns. The second lights-out drive-by sent Boland to the window, his subgun in hand. He heard the soft crunch of tread over stones outside. He could almost feel the black van rolling slowly by before he confirmed it. Again, no lights framed the curtain as the soldier cracked it open an inch or so, his body hugging the wall on the blind side next to the door. He had a full view of the dark vehicle the first time around. But now he glimpsed nothing more than the tail end of the oversized van, skirting by, moving on in what appeared to be the direction of the interstate. Bolin let the curtain fall back, listening as the invisible wheelman put some gas to the engine, revving it up, heading out. Or perhaps, he thought, merely giving the appearance of a quick recon before vacating the premises. Reporting back, no doubt, that Agent Velasco didn't seem in any hurry to be on his way back east. Bolin wanted it to be a simple task for the gunners in black to keep tabs on his whereabouts and movements. There were plenty of hills surrounding the dive Bolin had chosen as his one-man command post, having paid for the room in cash for three days. He didn't care if they staked him out. Bolin was counting on their paranoia. If the shadow men guarding the dark secrets of their black project thought they'd already seen the worst tonight, they were in for a surprise. Bolin was just getting warmed up. He held his position by the door, ears tuned to the night outside. The flea bag had all of ten rooms, Bolin noting only one Winnebago with Georgia tags, edged up to room number one beside the office. He wondered if there might be an enemy plant or two now holding the adjoining rooms. 
maybe a gunner dropped off in the hills behind the building, sniper rifle in hand. If they wanted to crash the door, there was nothing more than a simple chain and deadbolt to stop them. The room itself was spartan, with a single bed, chair, a wooden dresser with a TV that looked as old as the invention of television. A bathroom the size of a closet, with a window Bolin had made sure was latched, for whatever good that would do if they came storming into the room. He could have snapped on the air conditioning unit hung from the front window, but he needed to hear any sound outside. Discomfort he could live with. Getting caught off guard, he quite literally could not. Bolin knew his constant state of tension was working hard on his nerves. He slowed his breathing and willed himself into a state of focused calm. The single lamp barely illuminating the room, Bolin went to his war bag, already open on the bed. If nothing else, he needed to touch base with Brugnola. An airdrop, he figured, should do the trick. A military flight from Nellis Air Force Base, the big fed pulling the strings on the logistics from his end. All personnel, military or civilian, Bolin knew, were cleared through Nellis before being choppered or bussed to any number of classified projects scattered around Nevada. He was counting on a few raised eyebrows at Nellis when Brognola had Stony Man farm black suits drop in, armed with their own official clearance to proceed over protected airspace. Filing away a mental of what he needed, he put his call to Brognola on the back burner. Even with Stony Man's sophisticated intelligence gathering expertise, it would take time to crack through all manner of firewalls denying access to data on black projects. The soldier decided to see what he could do first. He strapped on the 44 Magnum Desert Eagle, checked the load, one round up the snout. After stowing the big piece in leather, he hauled the aluminum briefcase from the war bag. Leaning the SMG against the end of the bed, an easy grab, Bolin punched in the codes that released the latches. He settled in a chair by the dresser, facing the door. He fired up the small monitor on the sat link and slipped in the disc. As expected, access code flashed on the screen. He wasn't sure why, but it was just a hunch. Something tugging from deep inside, telling him to attempt the obvious. The soldier typed in Howling Coyote. The screen went blank. Bolin was sure some firewall had been built in to erase whatever was on the file if the first attempt failed. He sat there, staring at nothing, frustrated, when the screen flashed back on. It read, hit return. Bingo. Bolin couldn't believe it, thinking it was almost too good to be true. In fact, it felt so easy it seemed spooky. The soldier scrolled up the file and began reading. Not even two lines in, and the executioner felt chilled to the bone. Thornton knew he was procrastinating, but he needed more time to think his plan through before he called back. The man-thing was waiting for a report, hoping for good news Thornton knew wasn't about to come anytime soon. Not without more bloodshed. How could he tell the hairless, pale creature, which he barely thought of as human, they weren't about to see the light at the end of this dark tunnel anytime soon? How could he simply state that they might be looking at the mother of all shitstorms? Thornton shuddered in the soft glow of the monitor. It could have been the darkness, the silence inside the van that brought up the mental picture of the freakish thing who was unofficially in charge. It was small comfort that he could report the cleanup crew was loading the four bodies of their own onto the chopper. They were the easiest victims to dispose of, explain away to next of kin through official Pentagon channels. He could almost feel the presence of the former chief of security beside him, staring him down from behind the black wraparound visor. Despite the fact this failed gig was in large part the man-thing's responsibility, he would demand solutions to the problem nonetheless, dropping full and immediate resolution in Thornton's lap. And the power that man still commanded, he thought, even after being ousted from the project, was almost as unnerving as the sight of what the accident had created. The first number had been tracked to its source. It was a judgment call on his part whether or not to follow through. Once he initiated the scheme, he knew there was little he could do but sit back and hope for the best. The van door opening interrupted Thornton's line of thought. Thornton didn't like the expression he saw on the black-suited gunner's face. It looked like defeat. We've searched the inside and the perimeter, sir, thoroughly. We haven't been able to find it yet. 
The whole reason Crowman had marched his men in there, guns blazing, and now the damned diskette was nowhere in sight. That left a thorough search and tear of Lake's home to attend to, which he intended to proceed with pronto. Then there was Baldoni's widow. The Baldoni house would likely have to be rifled through, top to bottom, a thought which inspired anticipatory visions of an irate grieving wife and mother demanding to know what the hell they were looking for. If she couldn't be mollified, she would have to be warned. Let it go, ma'am, or else. Well, don't stand there, mister. Keep looking for it. I don't care if it takes all night and half the day. Find it. Yes, sir. And, sir, the sheriff would like a word with you. Tell him I'm busy. I'll get to him when I get to him. Yes, sir. Alone again, Thornton stared back at the phone number on his monitor. He made the decision. The Reno number had already been run down through Ma Bell, then with red flags cropping up in cyberspace, leading him to the mainframes at the FBI Second String Field Office in Vegas. Once he set the plan in motion, it could well blow up in his face. But he had no choice, he decided, once he weighed the risks against the reward of stomping out at least one potential fire. Belasco. Bolin had scrolled through the text in five minutes. It took a two-minute stretch after that, though, for the soldier to come to grips with what he'd read. Righteous anger alone wouldn't get the job done here. With his guts finally unknotted, the executioner was left feeling the ghost of the dead author of the disc, as if the shot-up corpse left behind at the howling coyote was right there in the murky light, nodding over his shoulder, muttering, yes, what he'd read was the whole horrible truth and nothing but. Uncle Sam's ugliest were out here playing God. The soldier already suspected that much. It was this new information that had Bolin as disturbed as he could ever remember being. It took another minute of sitting utterly still and listening to the silent night beyond his window before the soldier could focus on a plan of action. There was way too much power here in the wrong hands. Men with the secret clout of special access programs and the frontline legal muscle backing up anything they did no matter what. Men who placed themselves above the law simply because they had a security clearance to guard the vaults of future super technology. Some of which might even border the paranormal, if the files were accurate. Boland saw no need to dispute the facts as presented to him in the text. The knowledge contained in these files was the reason, after all, why nine people were dead. It had also been the leverage, Boland surmised, that had kept Marty and Angelo breathing for a while. Apparently, someone determined they could no longer tolerate the existence of two former colleagues who were capable of exposing the project and its wet work to public scrutiny. But there were still more questions than answers for Boland. The executioner would need to apply extreme heat in selected places. When he did turn on the burners, the jackals surely would come hunting for him. Only they couldn't possibly know how dangerous a beast they were stalking. Briefly, he ran back over what he'd read. The first eight pages were a running diary. Names, places, dates, and events were laid out in 16 separate assassinations of both military and civilian employees contracted for something called the Orion Project. Several incidents were listed as accidental. An electrocution, three heart attacks, two cars wrapped around telephone poles, and one incident where an aerospace engineer stumbled down a flight of steps and broke his neck in two places. It was the first chronicled killing that set Boland's blood to simmer. Apparently, a former NSA black operative named Kraman, who headed up something called Special Security, had given the nod for two civilians to be marched out into the desert, shot in the head and buried in shallow graves. It seemed the two college boys, their names not disclosed by the late scribe, had videotaped a laser-pulsating floating device one night, the thing described only as a hovering metallic disc. The man Bolin had heard called as Marty had been an eyewitness to the executions. It seemed Marty had absconded with the victim's IDs when the cleanup crew had gone to work sanitizing both bodies and vehicle. The young men had pleaded for their lives to be spared, that they'd hand over the tape, keep their mouths shut. But Crumman felt only permanent closure could make his perceived problem go away. In case the reader had any doubts these government-paid assassins could make American citizens vanish off the face of the earth, Marty mapped out the route leading to the bodies. More incidents of threats and intimidation of locals who trooped out there in the desert 
Sightseeing the Light Show, were listed. More names and addresses spelled out for future verification by anyone who read the contents of the disc and cared to make the effort to check the facts. There was a three-page reference to a massive underground accident involving the anti-gravity device. Fifteen employees had been exposed to leaking toxic matter of an unknown origin. Four died from a mysterious illness within days of exposure. No amount of decontamination scrubbed them clean, and ten out of the remaining survivors were executed, with a cover story concocted for the next of kin. This man named Croman had somehow been exposed himself, but apparently to a lesser degree. Reasons weren't disclosed why he was allowed to live, with an underscored reference that he was permitted voluntary retirement. Following the accident and executions, an underground five-kiloton detonation buried the site, which was reconstructed in another location, mapped out for eyes viewing the text, within a month. Back to business as usual. Two pages then of numbers and passwords, stated as priority access codes for various files relating to not only the Orion Project, but other classified work in this neck of the woods. There was more, but the soldier knew enough and Bolin knew he was looking at the mother load, a who's who and what's what on everything from the Nellis nuclear test range to Area 51. He stared at the seven-digit number with EN typed before it. Emergency number? Assuming it was a local number, he believed it was a contact, a way for whoever got their hands on this poison fruit to reach out and ask for assistance. Or was it a trap? Dial up the number and an army of men in black came rushing out of the dark, guns poised. Only one way to find out, Bolin figured. He could have switched his secured cell phone to landline, but he opted for the old rotary phone on the dresser. It was highly doubtful even the shadow men could break in and trace his secured line, but if they were hooked into all local lines, he wanted to make it easy for them to eavesdrop when he put in the call. Yes? Bolin decided to play it straight. There's been a problem. From the fact that you're calling, I would gather as much. You a friend of Marty or Angelo? Who's asking? The guy who saw them get killed by men I believe were their former colleagues, looking to get their hands on what I just read. What do you want? How about we meet? How do I know you're not one of them? I could ask you the same thing. Okay, I'll risk it. If you're an outsider, you have no idea what you're up against. I'll need a friend, is that what you're saying? <laughs> okay. Here's how you get here. No. No? Do you know where I am? How would I know that? Caller ID. <sighs> I know where you are. Bolin checked his watch. He needed to reach Prognola before he went any further. How soon can you be here? Sixty minutes, give or take. Make it ninety, not one second sooner or later. Come to the door. Come alone. And likewise, unarmed, I suppose. Your call, if you're the nervous kind. Ninety minutes sharp. I'll set my watch. He thought the click had some anger, or maybe fear behind it, as Bolin listened to the dial tone buzzing through the heavy silence surrounding him. <laughs> Willie Tuggle, leader of the Trojan's biker gang, thought he was seeing red-eyed demons with hair like Medusa everywhere he looked. Then realized it was only his reflection in the mirror, staring him back from behind the bar. He recoiled at the skeletal image he saw there, eyes bugged out, red orbs flaming at him like two points of fire. What little strands of blonde hair left on a balding pate were greasy spikes, sticking out and up as if he were juiced on a thousand volts. Friggin' Electro-Man, he looked like. And his heart felt like a runaway train, shooting past one lung, then back across the other, ricocheting in his chest. After three days of flying around the stratosphere on meth, with no sleep and no food, his paranoia was understandable and really nothing new. The problem he was having at the moment, he decided, had little to do with his brain cooked on Crank and Jack. No, it was the voice on the other end of the cell phone, sounding way too damn official for his tenuous peace of mind. The cell phone trembled in a hand that felt as if it were attached to an exposed electrical line. He knew that type of voice, had heard it many times before, in fact, even in bad dreams sometimes. 
He'd heard it in squad cars, cuffed and gagging on pepper spray. In police precincts, courtrooms from San Francisco to Seattle. Now there was this guy, whoever he was, some nightmare from the past. Was he lurking that very moment, calling from just outside, nearby in the desert, scoping the Trojan's nest? Oh, man. Tuggle started seeing whole armies of armored pigs with submachine guns next, creeping up on the doors, battering rams poised to launch the raid minus Miranda. Fuck! He practically flew to the curtain with a slight stumble before he pulled the drape back no more than an inch. Shadows seemed to be dancing all over the desert, but he knew scudding clouds could play tricks on the eyes. What the hell is that out there? Fucking coyote. This wasn't good. Roving shadows, a disembodied voice in his ear, heart like an endless barrage of grenades going off against his ribs. Trouble on the way. For one thing, the clubhouse number was unlisted. Not even his old lady or lower-level dealers had the number. If the cops were on the prowl, well, the Trojan's Nest was both a small armory and a drug factory, with enough meth and coke to pump every addict west of the Rockies until New Year's Eve of the next century. More than enough under the roof to send him back to the penitentiary for a stretch that gave him nightmares just to consider. Hey, Willie boy, you still there? Who the hell is this? Let's just say I'm a concerned neighbor. Your boy Sam, he's dead. What did you just... what? He wasn't sure he'd heard right, as his heart hit another speed bump. And how the hell could he hear? Why couldn't they get their faces out of the blow long enough, see he was on the horn and turn the racket down? Yo, Barbell, Sasquatch, God damn it! But the human vacuums were too involved. Motherfuck! <laughs> Holy fuck! Oh, God! Oh, oh, Jesus Christ, Willie, what, what the fuck? All of you, shut your holes! I'm on the fucking phone! Wild man's dead! You don't have to take it out on the speakers, man. You ready to listen, Willie? How'd you know my name? How'd you get this number? Who the fuck? Listen real careful, asshole. I'm only going to say this once. This is a one-time offer for you to make Dean's killing right. I'm listening. Between the jackhammer pulsing of the runaway train in his ears, Tuggle managed to make out the words with some degree of clarity. Okay, here are the facts, Willie. A big dark justice man in a Jeep Cherokee shot down Dean in a greasy spoon while he was conducting business with some hottie. The bastard took her out, too. And this fed is currently holed up at the A. Lee Inn. How do I know you're straight? How do I know this ain't a setup? You don't, but it isn't. Just like that, I'm supposed to trust you? If you want Dean's body, meet me at the abandoned Esso station west of 305. You have a pen and paper? I fucking know where it is! If you leave right away, you should make it before sunup. I smell bullshit, friend! Your personal hygiene isn't my concern. I'll wait with the body no longer than seven. If you're not there, I'll leave Sam for the birds and the dogs. Now what you decide to do about the big justice cop is up to you. Whatever you do, I strongly suggest you don't decide to try and shoot the messenger. Hey, wait a second! The dial tone seemed to shriek like a swarm of angry locusts in his ears. So... what the fuck's up, Willie? Shut up! I need to think! When he focused, Tuggle knew there was only one course of action. Cop or not, no one killed a brother Trojan. It was the ultimate insult, especially since Wild Man had gone to do Willie something of a personal favor. It was simple, really. A fellow brother was dead, and his blood cried out for retribution. Some cop gunned down Wild Man. Saddle up and get ready to ride! It was progress, but Thornton was grimly aware that very little was guaranteed. Now that wild cards had been dumped into the picture, the Trojans were on the way, probably juiced to the gills and riding on the wings of vengeance, as he sat there contemplating how clever he was. It was time to plunge another iron into the fire, just in case the Trojans didn't come through. He was racing through cyberspace at light speed, hacking into every bank the late Barkland's accounting firm did business with. Thornton had already narrowed the list of clients all the way down to one name. One he'd bet his ass had seen missing chunks of laundered money walk off in Barkland's pink pudgy hands. Deposits and withdrawals from both Barkland and the client in question scrolled down the monitor. Huge chunks. There one day, then gone the next. It took some work, dancing through bank records, 
but he traced the source of six million to three separate banks in the Caribbean, all of which were notorious for cleaning up money for the Medellin cartel. Six million change rolling through Barkland's personal account in Chicago, socked away in offshore lairs. The numbers were right there for the client in question to see for himself, if he had any doubts. The second number to call stared back at him on the screen. Thornton wasn't ready to smile yet, but he believed he was on the verge of seeing light at the end of the tunnel. 24 hours tops, and the headache that was Belasco should be gone. Call number two would take some finesse, but he already had the web woven in his mind. If he kept it short and to the point, didn't let himself get bogged down by questions from the other side, he could pull it off. If the Trojans couldn't take care of business, there was little doubt in his mind Belasco wouldn't walk away from the second team. Vince Leonetti, Don of Chicago, had a lifelong reputation of making people on both sides of the law vanish without a trace. Bolin had given his old friend a condensed but thorough version of the horror show, from restaurant to disc. The follow-up silence on the other end was long and heavy. Beyond the team at Stony Man Farm, especially Aaron Kurtzman and Barbara Price, Bolin considered Hal Brognola the closest thing to family. Out of sight, almost 3,000 miles to D.C., and Bolin could almost see the man's face clouded in grim thought. The soldier allowed Brognola a few moments to collect his thoughts. The Big Fed had all the facts, so far as Bolin knew them. No sooner had Bolin roused Brognola from sleep, the man situated in his study at his suburban home, than the soldier had transcribed the disc's text to the Big Fed's own sat-link modem. You know, Stryker, I hear about this sort of thing once in a while through the grapevine. Black ops gone renegade, power mad, given the keys to the classified kingdom. Civilians disappearing off the face of the desert out there, seeing something the spooks think they shouldn't have seen. Strange lights at night. Civilians seeing, even catching on video, cigar-shaped discs the size of three football fields, hovering one second and streaking off thousands of miles an hour in the blink of an eye, if one is inclined to believe such stories. You know, for all our state-of-the-art burglar high-tech, we couldn't even tell you what really goes on out there. <laughs> anyway, I've already read some of what you sent along. It makes me sick to think a couple of kids were murdered by people supposedly on our side. Families left wondering what happened to them. I tell you what, you start eating your own like this, and for my money, that term national security you always hear them use to cover their asses doesn't mean squat. I'm with you. <laughs> no, because of me, you're there. Part of me could just kick myself for insisting you hop off in L.A. and take a cruise of the great American West. The larger part's telling me if it weren't for you, more innocent people would be dead, and they, whoever they really are, would have vanished into the night to carry on. It happened, Hal. For whatever reason, I was there. I'm here, and I'm staying. Huh, no kidding. There's a news flash. You really are some kind of magnet for this shit. Yeah, I'm the Velcro kid. Don't worry, I'm already in my trust-no-one mode. Don't worry, you tell me. At any rate, there's a bottom line to what I and our people can do as far as cracking these access codes, nailing down identities on any key players. If you try putting a name to any face anywhere along the food chain of a black project, you might as well try painting with smoke. We both know the kind of guys you wax don't even have social security numbers. I know the drill. Hell, you can't even get a sat recon anymore, since any passovers of areas where black projects are ongoing are monitored and guarded by both NORAD and the NSA. It's like they're holding the Holy Grail all to themselves. It's okay, Al. I didn't expect the usual intelligence miracle on your end. You need to beef up for the hunt. Tell me what you need. Bolin laid it out, coordinating a drop site and a time out in the desert where he intended to confirm the existence of two buried bodies. All right. Figure two hours to pave the way and get our guys in the air. Nellis, huh? You want to talk about Spook Central. And a waiting chopper for our black suits once their jet touches down? I'm going to have to put a fire to somebody's tail out that way. Thanks, Hal. <sighs> Every time I know the plan on your end is to make yourself a walking bullseye... Ragnola fell silent. 
Bolin understood his friend's concern and anxiety. The soldier didn't quite intend to put himself in front of the shooting gallery, but Brognola wasn't far wrong. The soldier checked his watch. He still had time before the mystery guest arrived, but Bolin wanted to recon the layout around the building, find a dark roost where he could watch the front door to his room. I'll be in touch, Hal. Do that. And Stryker, watch your six. I've already grown eyes in the back of my head. Thornton saw the red light flashing on the black box beside his monitor. The man-thing was calling, anxious for an update, no doubt pacing around his mobile home, probably swallowing more of those horse pills, nervously picking at his own peeling flesh. Thornton shoved the picture of the albino creature out of his mind. Back to business. You tell me now exactly why you're so interested in my personal business. Tell me why I shouldn't think you're just looking to remove this Belasco so maybe you can skip off with the lion's share. It was nearly a wrap with pawn number two, but Thornton needed another minute to nail it down. The voice from Chicago, though, was far more cautious than the biker. For one thing, Leonetti was sober. Most important, though, he had more to lose if he came to Nevada, guns blazing, and it blew up in his face. It was definitely a harder sell this time around, but Thornton felt he was almost there. The man's suspicions made perfect sense, Thornton had explained, and went on to field the inquiries with facts, figures, and history, such as bank statements, with loads of missing cash, winding up in offshore accounts in the Caribbean. Like why did Barkland have a plane ticket for Hawaii, 200 grand on his person? Then the revelation that the Don's personal AWOL accountant was gunned down in the shadows of the restaurant lot by Belasco. How Belasco, as Thornton said he had heard the man called by Barklin, appeared to be the man's partner. The way they'd hunched close in the dark, talking in conspiratorial tones. Well, Thornton really wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but it was tough to miss when Barklin's partner in crime went ballistic. Thornton now had Leonetti's undivided attention. It wasn't difficult for Thornton to visualize the grim distress on the other end. Leonetti was, after all, a favorite whipping boy for the FBI and the Justice Department. He had beaten three indictments since the early 90s alone, for extortion, murder, and arson. But the Don had risen through the ranks in the 60s, kicking ass all the way to the top. The aging gangster was something of a dinosaur in the new mob, where college boys with degrees from MIT and Harvard had replaced the soldiers and the button men where they sipped French vanilla espresso and tooted a little coke, where a hummer from the mistress took priority over business, where they sold out their own for a book and movie deal and a cakewalk in the witness protection program the first time a Fed knocked on the door to their condominium. The Don was old school. And it was just this mentality Thornton counted on to see the man to Belasco's doorstep. Again, it wasn't that he expected the Trojans to fail— it simply made good sense to make sure the dice were fully loaded. If the bikers took care of business first, Thornton could simply vanish from the scene and leave the Don and his soldiers sweating out the mystery. Let's just say, Mr. Leonetti, that I simply don't like the man. Not good enough. Then I'll spell it out. I work for the government. Huh. What? CIA? Not quite. Classified work, however... Let's just say I'm an underpaid, underappreciated civil servant. I'm looking at the future, and I don't see my own beachfront property in Honolulu. <laughs> I'm listening. I have access to information, but hey, I live in the spook world. That's how you know so much about me and my business. Precisely. I just happened to stumble into Barkland and Belasco when it hit the fan. Belasco put a stack of hundreds in my pocket to clean up his mess, look the other way. But it's hardly the kind of money to see me fat and happy through my golden years. So I did some cyberspace fishing for info on Barklin and Belasco. Barklin is a thief. Belasco turns out to be some con man with a few wants and warrants out your way. I trace their sticky fingers back to you. So I figure there might be a pot of gold for me at the end of this rainbow if I came to you. Simple as that? <laughs> two and two still makes four the last time I looked. And it isn't love that makes the world go round. Are you there? Well, it's like this, Mr. Shadowman. 
I haven't seen your face, and you don't even have the courtesy to give me a name. But I do know how to use a computer. I'm seeing the numbers you laid on me match up with what's missing from the firm. <sighs> it tells me I'm getting old and a little sloppy that some little prick whose toughest day was sitting in a traffic jam could stick it to me like this. On his computer, Thornton was already flying through the day's airline schedule from Chicago to Reno. Sounds like we can make a deal. I'll come out there and have a look. Now this is where I need to pass on a few choice words of wisdom to you if I get there and find I'm pulling a knife out of my back. Your caution and concern are duly noted. This isn't some fucking game, pal. I'm a little more than just concerned. And if you're yanking me, you'll be more than fucking duly noted. Understood. Thornton told the Don a flight was leaving O'Hare for Reno in four hours. He gave the man a phone number at a diner in what passed as the closest town for any stretch from where Thornton sat. They agreed on a time when Thornton would feel the call and give him directions for a rendezvous. How do you know this Belasco will even stay put long enough for me and my men to get there? He told me. I guess you could say it was something of a threat. Said he was hanging around for a couple of days, make sure I lived up to my end. Maybe he's waiting to see his back is clear of shadows before he heads out. I can't really say. You'll be there when I call. Now to deal with the albino creature. A deep breath, wishing he had a cigarette, and Thornton hit the button on the black box. You want to tell me why you've kept me waiting this long? Fires. I don't have time for your riddles. I've been busy putting out some fires. There's been a little change in our plans. I don't like the sound of that, Thornton. You'll probably like it even less when I tell you what has to be done. It's unavoidable at this point, since you ordered my men to go in the place and shoot everything that moved. You're laying the ass screw up on my head? Listen. No, I'm done listening for the moment. I've taken a surgical step in what I feel is the right and only direction. Here's the deal. Boland's mystery guest arrived after almost 90 minutes on the dot. Giving the man points for promptness, the soldier braced for the worst as the dark Ford Bronco parked next to his SUV. Thirty-some minutes earlier, the executioner had reconnoitered the motel, chosen an outcrop in the foothills of a granite chain fifty yards or so south. If hard men in black or the familiar van were anywhere in the vicinity, Boland's infrared binox and miniature heat-seeking monitor hadn't picked them up. He knew it didn't mean they weren't out there. He clipped the binox to his belt, the mini-monitor disappearing in his pants pocket. Time to move out. A silent shadow melting into the night, Bolin cut an angle, out of sight of the lone arrival. With SMG in hand, the soldier advanced up the rear of the building. Even with eyes already adjusted to the dark, ears tuned to any sound, it was still impossible to see much farther than a few feet beyond the motel. Around the office, a lone light shone over the empty desk. Bolin whipped around the front corner, stepping away from the rear end of the Winnebago. The shadow was knocking on the door, looking over his shoulder, when Bolin aimed the subgun at the guy. Hands up. Except for the curly white hair reaching for his shoulders and the black bomber jacket, he looked like just another spook. This isn't exactly inspiring my trust. Doors open. You first. The lines on the shadow's face etched deeper as the scowl framed his chiseled features. One last look around, but hearing and seeing nothing but the silent night and Bolin followed the man inside. Step away. Bolin nodded at the lump under the man's jacket. The piece. Dump it on the bed, then lay out on the floor. Hey, come on. I've got this thing about having to repeat myself. Makes me nervous. Bolin lifted the subgun, drew a bead on the man's chest. Makes me think I'm being misunderstood. Yeah, I can already see how you open up lines of communication. The gun? A 9 millimeter Browning came out from shoulder rigging beneath the jacket. Two steps, and Bolin had the subgun's muzzle pressed in the man's spine. The guy was all scowls and grunts as Bolin gave him a rough pat down. No weapons or wires, but the executioner liberated a silver flask, a black Zippo lighter with an engraved white death's head, and a box of Marlboro cigarettes. He put the lighter and the man's medicine on the dresser. You know you used a landline, right? If they were listening, they know you haven't. I'm counting on that. You're crazy. 
Do you have any idea what and who these people are? I'm thinking they're not the Red Cross. Take a seat. Boland stepped back as the man settled into the chair by the dresser. You got a name? Taggart. You? Belasco. What are you? Retired NSA. Okay, Taggart. Here's how it works. I ask the questions, you answer. I hear anything I think smacks of even a half-truth. Taggart shot a grim smile at the subgun. <laughs> and you can make life real miserable for me? All the booze in the world couldn't possibly ease the pain. Well, in that case, do you mind if I have a nip and a smoke before we get started? Knock yourself out. Jason Nixon believed in a personal and preordained destiny. Fully aware it was contrary to the Christian concept of man's free will. Nixon had long since, however, shed the burden of some archaic belief system. The mindless rabble, he thought, had been brainwashed. Conned, in fact. From cable TV holy rollers on through the political power structure to the New Age philosophers, the great unwashed had been duped into thinking they could do, be, and achieve anything they wanted in life. They just had to believe in themselves and God. <laughs> The only thing Jason Nixon believed in was the others. And, of course, Jason Nixon. Nixon savored the harsh bite of the smoke as it flooded his lungs. Ah, but human beings would always believe they were in charge of both their today and tomorrow. Like rats on speed, he thought, humans could forever propel themselves along life's journey. They made a left turn here, a right turn there along the road, driven on primarily by their own desires ultimately believing they could somehow determine the course and the destination. Well, the trip out into the California desert that fateful night had seen the blinders removed for him, set him straight as far as free choice was concerned. As a former psychiatrist, he had long before seen what all that free will had done for every patient who dragged his or her neurotic baggage into his office. Still, he had to admit he was grateful for all the rich and famous who came whining to him. They had, after all, lined his pockets deeply, allowing him to eventually cut loose from two alimony payments and go in search of his own destiny. At $175 an hour, he had been all too willing to tell them what they wanted to hear, pat them on the head like the spoiled little children they were, ship them off into a brave new world, all fixed up with Prozac or the latest psych pharmaceutical, until next week's session. Back then, he had hated himself for the patronizing mask he wore for all the beautiful people, and just for money, or whatever prestige he had believed he might acquire for simply rubbing the right elbows. It had all been so pathetic. Every time he had heard how miserable was the life of some coked-out executive from a movie studio who hadn't had an erection in years, or how a magazine's yearly pick for sexiest man alive brooded how unappreciated he felt. They all suffered from what he had privately tagged as the TM syndrome. Too much. All the money and celebrity, all the drugs and sex in Tinseltown and beyond they could devour, and they couldn't even begin to fathom the emptiness of their lives. Not his problem anymore. That was another life. He had seen the blinding light on the way to Las Vegas. Transcended by the experience, he was now worlds apart from all the living dead who used to be his patients. In more ways than just the physical, he had been transformed. And the one thing he was sure of now was that some great calling was just around the corner, right over the next horizon. Fate. He stared over the ridge, way off into the darkness where the stars hung and where his followers had marched off in hopes of seeing the hovering lights. He then looked toward the only light shining for any direction he could see, burning in the ranch house window a quarter mile or so east. The place was his inheritance, clearly a gift from above, bestowed on him the day after the old widower had keeled over from a stroke. Apparently, the old guy had seen the light, too. Many times, in fact. What little he'd known about the old man, Nixon figured it was more paranoia and fear of the unknown that had seen him collect enough weapons to arm the next three counties over, before the old guy had grabbed his chest that day. Nixon now found he was grateful the Desert Rat had had foresight enough at least to store up food and water to keep a small community self-sufficient for two years, by his own reckoning. Nixon still figured the late and unlamented recluse for a deluded paranoid, or simply an alcoholic pushed over the edge by loneliness and Alzheimer's. 
Either diagnosis fit the behavior, the way the old man had always raved how some phantom army was just over the next hill, preparing to bring death and destruction. Well, doomsday for him had come in the form of a massive heart attack, and Nixon had simply buried the body out back, no frills, grateful to be finally free of his eccentric companion. Not long after, the vision of the light inspired him to chart the next course. With the computer he'd brought from L.A., he had gone online, setting up his own website on the Internet. Not long after putting Otherworld.com out there, a handful of the faithful began responding. With his psychiatric expertise, he weeded out the psychos, con artists, and hardcore felons. No, he was looking for true believers who shared the same experience. Those who would abandon their former lives and ways to commit themselves to something greater. And since he was going to fulfill his destiny, prepare the way for the others, he figured it couldn't hurt to have a few helping hands when they finally revealed themselves to the masses. Not to mention a few extra dollars to keep Otherworld online and spreading the word. So far, everything had fallen into place. It seemed to be working out just the way the disembodied voice in the light had told him that night in the desert. Success, greatness, and salvation were as close as tomorrow. The light had prophesied that where one was gathered in the faith, more would follow. Now that was destiny, not something as infantile in theory as following a certain alignment of the stars. The heavenly guideposts that the astrologists peddled off as the way to earthly happiness didn't fly with an educated man such as himself, nor in his brief experience dabbling in the occult would the future be exposed and mapped out by Ouija boards, crackpot fortune tellers, or a seance. Nothing born of man, he thought, could point the way to the truth and the light, much less reveal nirvana. The others understood this, and they were coming to save humankind from itself. They were the truth and the way. The noise jolted Nixon. Then he spotted the shadow traipsing down the trail. Before he realized it, the M-16 was up and aimed down the slope at the black shape. Nixon never cared much for guns of any kind, but there were enemies, assassins, working for the government, no less, skulking all over the valley and desert beyond. The men in black were like vipers, he thought. They hid in the holes of top-secret facilities, waiting to strike any prey that wandered too close or saw too much. Two of the black-suited serpents had come to the house yesterday, or so he had been informed, and only hours ago when he inquired on the whereabouts of Ernie Collins. Something about a job he had heard. The men took the vagabond with them. He couldn't see the man's face, but he sensed the presence of panic. The drifter. He could smell the unwashed body, an odor of decaying flesh he knew belonged to only one individual under his roof. Oh, Nixon stood, oh. the joint dangling on his lip. He recognized the voice. Ernie! Up here! The skinny, dirt-grind wretch had come to him a while back, obviously an outcast of some type. Nixon had allowed the drifter to stay on. It had been a show of compassion, meant more to display a benevolent streak to his followers than some act of true charity. To this minute, he still wasn't sure if the drifter could be converted. Even so, he always found tolerance of the ignorant and the disenfranchised something of a challenge to his own character. He waited as Collins blundered up the rise. The man was sucking wind in asthmatic spurts, throwing nervous swipes at the slick sheen on his face looking over his shoulder the way he'd come. Another few moments advancing, and Collins stopped short, sniffing the air. Then Nixon saw the whites of his eyes as they fixed on the assault rifle. Brother, I've seen enough guns for one night. Do tell. Nixon held out the joint. Take it. Looks like you need it a lot more than I do. No twisting an arm there. Collins practically snatched the joint away. <sighs> Anybody at the house? What do you ask? We might have problems. I need a gun. Explain yourself. And Collins related how the four men in black had either shot up the howling coyote or been gunned down themselves. How he'd taken off with their van when his nerves cracked, but quickly related he was smart enough to ditch the van a few miles away in a gully. The fool, Nixon thought. Do you realize that you might have just brought serious, even potentially lethal trouble to my doorstep? Hey, listen, Enough. I... Enough. What's done is done. He was combing his thoughts, searching for some quick fix that might head off the problem of black-suited wrath descending on the house. 
when the idea came. It was so strong and alive in his head, it was nearly as powerful as that burst of light striking him in the eyes that night. Listen, we need to be ready. They'll be coming. They know who I am. These guys... Silence. I have the answer if they do come here. You do? And Jason Nixon did, but decided to keep it to himself for the present. You feel like cluing me in, brother? How about that weapon? Not at this time. Nixon walked away, heading for the house. Hey, where are you going? Enjoy your smoke. He left the fool to his confusion. If the men in black came, Nixon thought, and they didn't go for his proposal, then it simply wasn't meant to be. At least not for now. And if it turned out the fool had to be handed over to them, so be it. Nixon was one who saw Pontius Pilate as a pragmatist. Dr. Nixon had no problem offering a sacrificial lamb, if it meant saving other world. Or the fool's head might prove an olive branch to the men in black, all in the name of mutual cooperation, he hoped, in a joint search for the truth, an alliance to help pave the way for the others. It couldn't hurt to ask. Thornton was confused when the brittle sound of distant laughter came through the box. After telling Crumman what he'd done, what he expected would happen when the Trojans and the Chicago mob hit the county, he was steeled for a tirade. Instead, it sounded as if the man-thing was chuckling his whole scheme off. Of course, the punchline came next, but Thornton had already worked out six different replies and defensive stances in his head. You arrogant fool! Do you realize what you have done, Thornton? Are you aware you now have placed the plan in jeopardy? That my entire timetable for seizure and delivery could be thrown off with this little scheme? Before you sit in judgment, just hear me out. The way I see it, from the few bits of information you've fed me, it will fit your own diversionary ploy. How? Belasco's not going anywhere. He could prove to be a major fire raging out of control. One man. You're wetting your pants over one G-Man? You haven't seen this G-Man's work. You haven't looked into his eyes. He's no standard government issue. So you say. So my experience in my gut is telling me. Listen, you want to move ahead right away. I want to make sure our backs are covered. When it goes down, we'll need total chaos across the county. It will put the sister site on high alert. Any cold feet will come running right into my line of fire. Or well, they'll go into lockdown. Or worse, send an SOS to Nellis. Those are my men there also, I told you. Most will do as they're ordered, but to a man, I can't be 100% positive. We need the uncertain ones weeded out right off the bat. You're in charge of security. It's your ball game to win or lose on the inside. However, what worries me is some five-star windbag rolling in from Nellis to take over the project at both sides. Won't happen. But if it does, it will be too late. We'll be just a bad memory, a couple of ghosts haunting the Pentagon brass. I have the power and the authority to shut down all communications anyway. Don't tell me you're getting nervous at this late date. Of course not. We proceed as scheduled. I see you've left me no choice but to allow this diversionary plan B of yours to play out. I don't know. Perhaps, now that I think about it, I can see the benefits of anarchy and panic working to our further advantage, as you seem unable to produce the disk that leads to another problem. Without securing certain information, and with the sheriff's loyalty depending on how high the lid blows and what happened tonight, you'll see where I'm heading. Time to get out of Dodge. And follow through with an arrangement that's been in the works. Mind if I ask when, where, and who? <laughs> In good time. You don't trust me? I don't trust anyone. Let me ask you something, since you claim to have all the answers. Since you have this one-man army under surveillance and supposed imminent containment, did you stop and think that maybe he found the disc? How could that be? Well, I'm showing a phone call from his room. It leads straight to the home of one of our former colleagues. A man named Taggart. What are you saying? I'm saying yet another one of your fires has ignited. I'm asking if, with all your professional expertise, you thought to have this Belasco's phone tapped. Shit. Uh, <laughs> I'll take that as a negative. 
Make sure your services are available to me in the morning. There's a lot to be done before we make our move. The voice vanished. But the parting words echoed in Thornton's ears. He checked his watch, the anger like steam swelling in his head. A few more hours now, and he counted on seeing at least one fire trampled out. When that happened, he figured the old confidence would come roaring back. It had to, if their plan to steal the mother of all wonders of the world was going to succeed. While Taggart composed himself with a nip and a smoke, Bolin went first. When the soldier was finished relating his lethal role at the restaurant and the hornet's nest he thought he had shot his way into, Taggart sat, stunned. Taggart took another belt and puff to ease his anxiety. <sighs> it's happening. I know what Marty put on that disc. Yeah, it was meant to keep him and Baldoni, Angelo, alive. I was there that day in the desert right alongside both of them when Croman gave the order to kill those kids. Boland took a seat on the bed, one eye on the front door. The subgun canted across a knee. Who pulled the trigger? A guy named Braxton. Who knows, maybe he was one of the four you nailed tonight. If he was, it sounds like justice to me. <sighs> There's no justice in this, Belasco. There's only shadows in a chase to see who ends up with the most power. And these guys have the power to do whatever they want to keep the doors sealed on classified work out here. Any extreme measure necessary. As far as Orion goes, not even the military wants to touch it. Special security's in charge the whole way. It's their show. No questions. <sighs> Spooks. Recruited specifically for the project from a classified arm of the NSA. It's buried so deep only a few men know they even exist. Don't belabor the obvious. I'm thinking Marty, or whoever he was, left something out. He did. One of those access codes he'd listed was a website he set up, but with ten layers of firewalls. In it, he lays out certain evidence he collected on Croman. The Croman, as you read, was afflicted by the accident. The workforce that fell ill was given a lethal injection on his orders, thinking it was some cure for what they were told was radiation sickness. <laughs> Again, extreme measures. Cover up the debacle. Keep it from going public if the stricken technicians who worked on the device went back to the suburbs looking like something straight out of the X-Files. Where is this Croman now? He's here, in the county. Moves around in a mobile home he uses as a command center. I hear when he ventures out into the sun, he cruises around in a chauffeured limo with specially tinted glass. You want to go hunting for him, you won't need me to describe the guy. One look at him, you'll think he just walked off the mothership. The missing pieces you think Jim left out are this. Foreign agents were contacted before the accident about the anti-gravity device. And Croman was looking to put the thing on the auction block. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Something like that. Only now, from the scuttlebutt I've caught, this coming to me after Jim had his last encounter with the guy, is that Croman wants a degree of revenge. You know, expose certain faces behind the project all the way to the Pentagon. Carve out his pound of flesh. They forced him to quietly retire, keep his mouth shut. The shadow powers were unable or unwilling to restore the man Croman once saw in the mirror. He managed to keep himself breathing. Sure, he's alive. But I have to guess any man walking around looking like he does has to be a little ticked off about what happened to a face and body that might have once been plastered on the cover of GQ. Who are the buyers for this device? Subcontractors, they call them. Enemies of this country? Mm-hmm. The usual suspects. I've heard Chinese, Iranians, North Koreans. Rumor is he has them all lined up, but he's narrowed down the shopping list. My guess is whoever comes up with the most cash. Gratified vengeance and maybe a gift to himself to vanish somewhere, set up for what's left of his life. The golden twilight years. <laughs> maybe carry on, safely hidden overseas, continuing to bring public disgrace to the shadow powers. Maybe blackmail. If he was bumped off of the project, why am I thinking he's still in charge? Friends in high places. Maybe the elite shadows in the Pentagon just want to keep him quiet and hidden. Why not just give him a taste of what he did to those kids? Mm-mm, it's not that easy. Just like Jim had some leverage to keep the wolves at bay, Crowman can have the same deal going. A guy named Thornton is officially in charge. He's probably the one who put the evil eye on you at the cleanup. 
He pulled the smoke down to the filter, looking around the room for an ashtray that wasn't there. Taggart let the butt fall, ground it out in the carpet. Uh, am I scoring any points here, Velasco? Boland stared into his eyes. On the surface, the man seemed to play it straight, but the soldier had been down this road before. Boland picked up the browning and tossed it into Taggart's lap. If you're asking to tag along, the answer is no. I'm here if you need me. There are only two reasons you're still breathing. One, they got too much of a mess already to clean up. Two, that family that came here in the Winnebago out there in the parking lot sleeping like babies right now. Believe me, they're watching you. My guess is they've already put in motion a plan to drop a noose over your head. You've seen too much, and they may know you have the disc. Plus, they're looking at a guy who wasted four of their own. If nothing else, they need to save face. They'll pick the time and place. They'll wait until there are no more civilian witnesses to dispose of. If you think you're smart enough or tough enough to take them on, mister, I wish you luck. Jim was a friend of mine. We went back to the old NSA days. Did some things put me in the position I'd have to kill you if I told you about. But both me and Jim drew our own battle line when it came to murdering unarmed civilians. Hey, you look like a man needs a drink. I'll pass. So it's a wrap? I'm dismissed? If I think of anything else, I'll call. Bolin watched the man as he stowed the flask and the browning. He stood as Taggart went to let himself out. The man stopped, looked back over his shoulder at Bolin. Whatever he was about to say went unspoken as he left the room. Locked up again, the soldier waited until he heard the engine fire up, and the rumble trailed Taggart into the night. Beyond checking on the women, hoping they were on their way to Reno, Bolin knew he could do little until the morning. Not that daylight would make it much safer for him to move about. His watch told him he could try to catch about two hours of rest, but actual sleep, he knew, with black-suited gunners potentially lurking around, was a luxury he couldn't afford. And there was no reason Bolin knew to question the veracity of Taggart's warning about the black-suited threat. The executioner could easily picture them out there, sharpening their knives. Laying out a solid plan of action, especially with all kinds of unknown factors, was definitely uncharted territory for Willie Tuggle. Sure, Willie the Terrible had blown away his bragging share of rival bikers or dealers in the past, and he had no problem at all when he had executed a couple of deadbeats who had more craving for dope than they did cash or good sense. But until now, gunning down the opposition was all on impulse. It was one thing to do it on the spot, driven by spontaneous rage mixed with meth, to simply go berserk. It was something else altogether to plan a strategy, coldly and calmly, then follow through. And he had never taken out a fed. But the leader had to make decisions. He watched as Barbell unzipped the black bag and took a few steps back so all the brothers could view the remains. Cursing, Tuggle crouched beside the body. Unbelievable. Tuggle tried to will away the shaking in his hands at the sight, aware the others were watching. He squeezed his shaking mitts together, popping knuckles. He scowled over his shoulder at the man in black. For damn sure, something felt real wrong about the setup. The black oversized van, for one. No plates, no company insignia displaying make and model, but it bristled with antennae parked near the rusted pump. The man in black, just standing there like a piece of rock, all the expression of an undertaker on his face, but watching him through dark shades and it wasn't even quite sun-up. And what was that other vehicle, like a scaled-down stretch limo parked in the shadows next to the Esso sign all about? Backup? It was impossible to tell how many occupants there were in either vehicle, since all the windows were as black as coal. Lifting the goggles off his eyes, Tuggle scoped the skeletal remains of the service station's abandoned cracker box. It was possible that someone might be hunkered down inside the black shell, gun pointed at Willie's head, itching for him to get froggy with the man in black. But surrounded by sixteen heavily armed and righteously angered Trojans, Tuggle decided any edge belonged to them. He let his raw eyes flicker back to Wild Man's corpse. Tuggle felt the wrath boiling inside, but kept the lid on the rumbling volcano. 
It struck him next as something of an insult, the way in which no one had bothered to pull Wild Man's eyelids down. Was there a message in that? He wondered. Tuggle stood. A cop did that? The brothers ground up like chuck roast. Before you boys get all bent out of shape, last I heard, your man's still up the road, probably sleeping right now, dreaming sweet dreams how he put a righteous notch on his belt. Yeah, he's a big fucking hero! Now, that motel is about- I know where it is! Then we're finished here. Hold on a second! Tuggle took a step toward the man in black, annoyed the guy didn't show the first hint of nerves, not to mention any respect. Just why are you handing this pig over? Peace of mind. Maybe with those fucking shades, you can't see that none of us are in the mood for smart-ass bullshit. Oh. What kind are you in the mood for? Listen, fuckwad, how do I know this Belasco was even the one pumped our guy full of holes? Tuggle couldn't believe it when the asshole turned his back to angle for the passenger side of the van. Simple. Just ask him. And believe me, when you see him, well, you can judge for yourselves. If you're any kind of judge of men at all. Hey, dickweed! Tuggle stood there steaming. The guy turned. Willie wanted to splatter that condescending smirk on his face. You want me to hold your hand? Fuck you. If it looks like we're getting it broken off in our ass... I'll be around. What? You want my name, too? Yeah. The guy opened the door, grinning to himself. Well, considering the gift I've just left you, ask for Santa Claus. Tuggle didn't wait for the black vehicles to leave. Pumped on crank and anger, he charged for his hog and tore into the saddlebag. He produced an Ingram Mac 10, back up for the browning in his waistband, then checked the load on the stubby subgun. Bolt cocked, he laid the piece back, but angled up. As the van and limo kicked some dust in his face, Tuggle snapped out the strategy. One guy, he figured. No match for 17 guns. But he didn't need all that iron and muscle when he rode up to the door. No, this had to be something of a solo act. A personal trophy to take back to the clubhouse would go a long way to establishing his stature as leader. Barbell, Sasquatch, you ride with me to the pig's door. Sabertooth and Thunderball, ride along, but fall behind and wait on the highway as backup. The rest of you, go have a beer at the diner. We'll bring you this fucker's head as a souvenir. Tuggle turned to Croc. The Trojan, who had half his face burned to purple splotches when a meth lab had blown up on him. Croc and the rest of you, stand by. Cell phone's ready. Wait at the diner, the one we used to hit on the run to Utah. You don't have to fucking like it, just do it! One last dive into the plastic bag, shoveling two fingers of powder up his nose, and Tuggle straddled his bike. The buzz fueled new confidence. The day started looking brighter. Tuggle was going to go skewer himself the pig who killed Wild Man. The executioner was under no illusions. It was going to be a bad day. The simple fact the night had passed without event already had Bolin on edge. At some point, between the three hours of a semi-conscious combat nap, he had placed a quick call to Tina Whalen, just checking up. He was told the sister of the lady's friend couldn't be reached. It seemed they were forced to stick around Eureka Springs. Not good, the soldier had thought. Still, she had sounded strong enough on the surface, and Bolin decided there was nothing more he could do for any of them. Before hanging up, he had told her again to try and find a place out of the county to stay for a few days without specifically voicing his concerns about their safety. She said she'd think about it, but her and the boys really had nowhere to go. No immediate family, both sets of the boys' grandparents long since passed away. She thanked him again for the loan, wanted an address where she could send along a money order at some point to square the tab. Bolin simply told her he'd be in touch. Silently, he wished them well, but he couldn't babysit. Unless he sorely missed his guess, he was a hunted man. The last thing he needed was an innocent life caught in the crossfire. The list of mental chores was already logged. First, a visit to the sheriff, light a fire under his seat. The weapons drop was still hours away, but it would give Bolin time to make the site, exhume the bodies to confirm the first set of facts. The sound sent him to the window. He figured it was the Winnebago, but he needed visual confirmation. 
The big R&R rig backed out, and Bolin saw the faces of a middle-aged man and woman framed behind the windshield. Harmless enough, by all outward appearance. There was one final preparation needed before he vacated the room. The cracker box would serve Bolin's twofold purpose until whatever lay ahead was finished, one way or another. It would double as both command post and central location if the black-suited gunners came calling. If they popped in while he was gone, the miniature motion sensor he fixed to the rail under the bed would alert him to bad company. He checked the readout box, the small digital screen recording his own presence, filing it away in the number column as one. He was all set to go and put the branding iron to the sheriff when he heard them. War bag in hand, he was out the door in a flash and spotted them in the distance. Two dropped back, halting on the shoulder of the interstate, while three more swung onto the dirt path leading to the motel. There was no mistaking what they were, but what brought them to his doorstep? Smart Money said they'd just come from a briefing about one Agent Belasco. First problem of the day, and the sun had barely risen. He took up position on the passenger side of the SUV, settled the war bag on the hood. He could easily imagine the con job either Thornton or Crommon had worked to get the bikers jacked up for the kill and pointed in Boland's direction. From his experience, biker gangs weren't remarkable for their reasoning skills. Here we go, Boland thought, steeled inside, as he sidled away from the SUV, hoping to keep the vehicle and war bag out of any line of fire. The rolling thunder washed over Bolin as the Trojans braked their bikes, three tails of dust spreading in their wake. Bolin felt his left leg slide out a few inches, hands slowly falling down toward the 44 Magnum Desert Eagle. They shut down their bikes, leaned them over on kickstands, reading him behind their goggles. While the silence hung poised like a hammer over his head, the soldier weighed the moment and the men. One muscled behemoth, and one bald biker the size of a battleship. A Trojan with his little remaining hair spiking out like his skull was a spark plug, his eyes alight. This wirehead looked unable to focus on anything longer than a split second, thanks to the speed frying the brain circuitry. Two stainless steel pistols, Bolin noted, were wedged in the front pants lines of muscles and battleship. And from where Bolin stood, it looked like the stock of a subgun was sticking up in the saddlebag behind wirehead. Showdown. Wirehead got it started. I understand you're the guy who wasted wild men last night. Man tells me you went apeshit, blew away the brother and 86 an old squeeze of mine. Bolin didn't say a word. He'd see how long it took for their nerves to get the better of them. Not long. Wirehead slapped up his goggles. Hey, motherfucker, you hear me? How about it? Bolin let it drag for a long moment as they fidgeted in the saddle, glancing at one another. How about what? Is it true what we heard? The soldier saw Wirehead twitching all over the seat, his hand starting back toward the saddlebag, but he held the move. Bolin draped the tail of his windbreaker behind the butt of the Desert Eagle. Wirehead seemed to give something second consideration, his grin looking frozen and not quite as confident as he intended. The pinballs of his eyes shot from Boland's big piece to the buddies flanking him. Look at this. We got Josie fucking Wales here. I asked you a fucking question, Clint. Sounds like you boys are gonna believe what you want. Fuck this bullshit, will they? Wide-eyed with surprise, Wirehead turned to the big biker as the man pulled out his weapon. Boland already had his hand cannon up and out. Wirehead fumbled to get the subgun free from the bag. <laughs> Bolin blew Battleship out of the saddle. The monster biker was all arms flapping in the air when the warrior swung his aim. He punched another pile-driving 44 hollow point round through Muscle's sternum, likewise launching him onto the gravel. Wirehead nearly made it in the heartbeat it took Bolin to line him up. Panic at seeing he was suddenly all alone had to have spoiled Wirehead's aim. Wirehead spun, soaring back out of the saddle. The stainless steel cannon leading the way, Bolin glanced toward the highway. He saw the two dark lumps in that direction, frozen. He figured a new level of rage was probably working its way through the shock at seeing how quick and easy their fellow Trojans just got dumped. Bolin moved on to give them the encore. 
Bolin saw them cranking it up, bikes fishtailing around on smoking tread. He couldn't be sure, due to the distance and bad light, but it looked as if one of them had a cell phone pressed to his face. Marshalling the reserves, no doubt. Good enough. He stowed the Desert Eagle and marched back to the SUV. Where they were going and how many Trojans waited at the end of their ride, Bolin didn't know, of course, and pretty much didn't care. He would give chase and run them down. As he moved behind the wheel, Bolin hoped a black-suited gunner or two had caught the showdown. It would give them something to think about, maybe force them out of the shadows. The executioner was eager to take it to the real enemy. Yes, I'm quite human. As Thornton followed Kraman into the room, he read the faces of the gathered cultists. They were studying Kraman, a bunch of zoo-goers gaping at some endangered species, but these gawkers were armed with assault rifles. Fearful wonder followed Kraman to the corner of the room, where he took up a somber post. To Thornton, he looked more like a Sunday preacher set to rain fire and brimstone on the sinning crowd than one of the most feared power brokers the NSA's black ops had ever spawned. And the Watchers kept gaping, looking to Thornton as if their fantasies about ETs had just floated through the door, in the flesh. Nearly to a man they were armed, and suspicious. M-16s, a few fixed with M-203 grenade launchers, were the main weapon of choice. Four of the more raggedy members of the cult they called Otherworld looked to be relegated to coffee detail. The wretch who had been chosen as Braxton's lackey, Thornton noted, was hugging the wall that led to the kitchen. Ernie Collins looked set to break and run. Or maybe wishing that beam of light would come down and take him away to a warm yellow unknown. Any place but here. Crommon, Thornton had to admit, would make anyone's nerves jump. Crommon's special one-piece white jumpsuit was made of some revolutionary fabric designed by NASA. The clothing was a state-of-the-art combination of foil, silk, and rubbery material. Then there was the wide-brimmed matching hat, thick black visors wrapped around a face as round and white as the moon itself. But what was really freaky in Thornton's view was how the subterranean accident seemed to have almost erased the man's features. As if the facial bones had been melted, smoothed out, the flesh like irradiated silver. Crommon folded white-gloved hands at a point where the skin-tight suit should have revealed a genital bulge. There appeared to be nothing there at all. If that was another byproduct of the accident, Thornton could begin to appreciate some of the man-thing's rage. Crommon looked to Ernie Collins, the man they called Weed. You, Ernie Collins, car thief from Pennsylvania. Relax. I'm not concerned about your role in what happened last night. Weed didn't seem reassured by this. Crommon then addressed the assembled motley lot. Nor am I interested in your snooping around our installations. Your former lives of broken families, your substance abuse, your personal failures and sob stories, your suspicions, your sightings, your theories, are not why I am here. Mr. Nixon, if you would disengage yourself from your star children, please. Thornton followed the stare behind the visor. He was surprised none of them, except for Weed, betrayed confusion or anxiety that Crommon seemed to know them by name. Collins had been identified by a simple fingerprint when he'd first touched Braxton's van last night. The key to securing other identities were vehicles that had carried the various cult members here in the beginning. They were scattered around the valley, tucked away in gorges. A few of the vehicles were draped in brown camo netting that the late owner of this building a former Korean War vet and State Department official who retired here for reasons unknown, had squirreled away in this squalid rat hole. He couldn't be sure of the reason they hid their cars and trucks, but Thornton attributed it once again to rampant paranoia. So it was easy enough to run down their former lives once Thornton was armed with a license plate number. Thornton watched as the leader of Otherworld stepped from the corner of the room where a bank of computers was housed. Nixon, a former shrink from L.A., didn't look like much more than a middle-aged suburbanite to Thornton. Sports shirt and slacks, 
clean-shaven, neatly trimmed salt and pepper hair swept back from a face that was borderline movie star material. Certainly not a man who would pitch it all away to hole up in the middle of nowhere and surround himself with a gaggle of star watchers eagerly awaiting the mothership. Nixon kept the M16 in hand, angled across his chest. We know you've been watching us for some time. We know you are covert agents in a government conspiracy to conceal the truth about stolen alien technology and the existence of extraterrestrials. We know there was a nuclear explosion, in fact, in your old facility, which you have since moved. Only now has the electromagnetic pulse faded enough where we can use- Enough. I have no time to get sidetracked confirming or denying anything you think you know. I am here on a most urgent mission. I have a proposal, one whereby our side and yours can work together in a mutual effort. Let's call it a joining of hands in preparation to taking up arms, even against this ongoing government conspiracy you mention. Really? Funny you should say that. Nixon almost smiled as he lowered his weapon, its muzzle pointed toward the bare floor. Only last night I was thinking along the same lines. Do tell. Perhaps there is something in the phrase, great minds think alike? Or sick ones, Thornton thought, silently urging Crumman to get on with it. Belasco was out there, and the day was full of worry and trouble enough without getting stalled here, playing mind games. Here is what I propose. Thornton listened. The needle was hovering around 80 when Bolin saw one of the Trojans drop back. When he'd hit the interstate, they hadn't shot away but split off, one hog to a lane, the bikers appearing to discuss something as they thundered on in the wind. Roughly two football fields away now, he figured, and closing, and some spur-of-the-moment tactic was in motion down the highway behind him. There was no anticipating any manic strategy on their part. The executioner saw no point in speculating why the biker had fallen behind his comrade. All the soldier saw was the one biker pulling onto the shoulder, then pulling up hard and swinging the hog around. And a compact subgun was being hauled one-handed out of the saddlebag of the oncoming biker and aimed Boland's way. Apparently whacked out circuits of the biker's head told him this stretch, free of traffic and witnesses, was his opportunity. Of course, Bolin knew opportunity could be a two-way street. Flame shot out from the subgun. Bolin gave the wheel a little twist, fists holding hard as the wheel fought the sudden lurch. Momentum and gravity almost got the better of Bolin's effort to evade the tracking fire, but he yanked back to the right, online again and roaring ahead. Three rounds went skidding off the starboard side of the biker's second attempt, flying off to nowhere. Bolin continued evasive driving while gradually letting his pursuer close the distance. With range to impact locked to a simple toss of a stick, Bolin saw the whites of the biker's bugged eyes through his splattered goggles. He held his fire as he saw how he was gaining on Bolin, waiting for the easy shot. The guy was grinning like a madman, bloodlust drawing him right up the SUV's tailpipe. The executioner judged the moment and slammed on the brakes. Bolin let up on the brakes and resumed accelerating as soon as he felt the impact. This had the desired effect of lessening the damage to his own vehicle while projecting his flailing pursuer up and over the roof of the SUV. Bolin swerved sharply to avoid the tumbling, reddening lump and fishtailed to a halt about 60 yards down the road. The damage to the SUV's rear was superficial. The bike was a twisted skeleton, thrown a good 50 yards from the point of impact but it had a better chance of repair than its owner. Bolin's next act was a kindness. The whole ten minutes it took Crommon to lay it out, Thornton resisted the impulse to check his watch and the caller ID monitor on the screen of his handheld radio. He needed a report on the Belasco situation. He was hoping no news was good news. With all that was in motion, he couldn't be sure of anything now, from one moment to the next. The day had only just started, and he already felt ten years older. When this was done, after tonight, a long vacation was in order. Nixon and his other world stooges had listened in grim silence, but their eyes slowly lit with rapture when their part in Crommon's plan was filled in. Of course, Thornton knew that Crommon had left out one important detail. 
Well? Thornton nearly groaned next when Nixon took center stage and began his show and tell. The first exhibit was a burly backwoodsman type who was told to unbutton a red and black flannel shirt. He displayed two vertical rows of perfect red circles down his torso, which looked branded into his chest. Idaho. Nixon pointed at the man's chest. Those were the marks left when Harold encountered a grounded UFO. It glowed, gave off a tremendous heat, then took off straight up into the air, hovered, then vanished after shooting off on a vertical line at speeds, he says, which covered hundreds of miles in seconds flat. These burn marks have branded him for life. He says they match the circles on the vents of the disc. He was not only sick for weeks, hardly able to get out of bed, but he claims he could practically see his flesh glow in the dark at night for some time after the encounter. I do not have time for this nonsense. Indulge me. I am making a point. <sighs> Make it, then be quick about it. Exhibits 2, 3, and 4 showed off tiny reddish marks just behind the left ear. Abductees since birth, according to Nixon. Tagged like game animals, the cult leader suspected, by the others. Nixon paraded a few more people that he claimed to have put under extensive hypno-regression, dredging up bits and pieces of encounters with the others, little by little, filling in their missing time. Terrible memories were awakened. Lurid details of little gray men with grasshopper heads and black eyes floating above them, while they were immobilized by some form of telekinesis, alien probes and experimentation. The former psychiatrist mercifully wrapped it up with a quick tale of his own three sightings in the California desert, but conveniently, Thornton thought, glossing over the specifics. And your point? What is your answer to my proposal? Nixon stared at Crommon with a strange smile. That was my point. That was my answer. You see, we consider you the enemy, the keepers of a jealously guarded truth. I believe you know we aren't alone in the universe. I believe you keep this knowledge to yourselves simply because it is your power to wield over the rest of us. Perhaps you consider us ignorant fools or children who might be so terrified by the revelation that they might take up arms against the conspiracy that is the United States government and its military shadow army of jackbooted goons and killers. Uh, a simple yes or no will do. If I say no, do I hear an or else? What you'll hear is the sound of my vehicle leaving. Nixon gave it a thoughtful nod. Let me see if I understand what you want. We are to go into one of two installations and help you steal a device that you have conveniently neglected to clearly define either its function or its nature. I'm thinking you want this thing all for yourself, for reasons you also didn't enumerate. Why I want it is my concern. Is it? You're asking me to risk my life and the lives of my people, taking classified government scientists and the civilian labor force as hostage while you abscond with the mysterious device. What is to guarantee our safe return here? What assurance do I get that we will be left in peace? What is it you're asking for? Yes, if we agree to your plan, there is something I want in return. What? Let me take my people into another room. Allow us five minutes to discuss it. The clock's ticking. One second more, and I take the truth with me. We shall see. Oh, Jesus. Thornton watched them troop down the hall. He shook his head and looked at his watch. Is there a problem? Thornton looked over at the man-thing. Nothing that can't wait another five minutes. Or so he hoped. The wooden sign read, Shambhala, gas and food, 1.5 miles. Bolin had left the roadkill 6.6 .6 miles behind. From there on, he really didn't care if a roving state trooper was alerted to the carnage by a concerned citizen, or just happened across the bodies. If necessary, he could phone Brognola to get any legal weight off his back. Someone else had called the opening shot and the executioner was hell-bent on delivering additional return fire. Bolin checked the highway, then scoped the chain of hills north on the desert floor beyond the slightly bullet-scored starboard hood. Two hunches. One, the Trojan who had bailed from pursuit had hit the dirt road leading to whatever Shambhala was. 
A closer search to the right, and he confirmed it, spying the series of one-wheeled grooves in the track. Hunch number two told him watching eyes were somewhere in the hills. Black-suited gunners or bikers. Not that it mattered much. He decided he'd take on both if it came to that. His hardware and reserve ammo was already measured. He was running a bit low on rounds. Four clips for the HK MP5 subgun and one magazine in place. The SMG laid across the open war bag. Mini Uzi, two clips altogether. The problem was guessing enemy numbers, and that's where the handheld HK-69 grenade launcher factored in. Three missiles remained for the launcher, one frag, an incendiary, and a buckshot round, all in 40 millimeters. With two more fragmentation hand grenades, he could only hope it was enough. Nothing he could really do about it anyway, except work with what he had. And once the Trojan pack learned the fate of their three brother thugs, well, the soldier didn't need to be looking over his shoulder the whole time for wild cards. The men in black would prove formidable enough in the coming hours. He eased down on the gas and began the long roll down the dirt track. The sun was free and clear of the sawtooth ridge of hills to the east. Maintaining a sharp eye, he might be able to spot any light twinkling off a sniper's scope in the hills. The slow roll found Bolin going up a gradual incline, moving over the rise. The track leveled out, an arrow straight run before the ground rose up again, maybe a quarter mile ahead. He was scouring the nooks and gullies cut into the hills, which formed a horseshoe around the bowl he was easing into, when he heard it. A dust wall lifted a dirty screen ahead. The executioner angled the SUV across the trail, blocking off any exit past him, and watched as the horde rolled over the rise. There's the bowl, fucker! One of the bikers threw up an arm. The Trojans stopped, a couple of nervous hands cranking on the rumbling horsepower at the sight of the SUV blockade. There's just one asshole! Let's wait the son of a bitch! There was a brief exchange among them, the words lost to Boland, but the strategy became clear when the weapons came out. They were fanning out in jerky motions, forming a skirmish line, when the executioner took up his own arms. After five minutes and an intentionally antagonizing 15 extra seconds, Nixon returned with his raggedy following. Crumman had nearly reached the door. We want the pudding, but we'd rather not have to eat the meat. What? We don't want no thought control, but we do want an education. What are you? We refuse to be just another brick in your wall. <laughs> Never mind. I have certain conditions. No conditions. This is an unnegotiable offer. I don't need you that badly. If that were true, you wouldn't have come here. That pulled Crommon up short. <sighs> what are they? One. What is this thing you are looking to steal? Crommon appeared to think about it, then nodded. It was a small concession, no great mystery. It is an anti-gravity device. Really? And it... It allows a craft to hover. It contains an element that, when powered up by a nuclear reactor, can propel a craft at hypersonic speed, or even faster, so I am told. Where did you get the technology? Is it alien? Reverse engineering? At the moment, Mr. Nixon, that is for me to know. However, should you fulfill your obligation to me, I am more than willing to share the truth then. Nixon practically beamed. Our reward. The truth. Fair enough. The handheld radio beeped on Thornton's hip. He left Crommon and Nixon to haggle over the details, stepping outside to take the call. He was hopeful, anticipating progress on the Belasco front. If you got problems, I suggest you get over to the motel right away. Poland bailed out, a shoulder through the door, with subgun and grenade launcher ready. A few rounds tattooed the far passenger side, glass caving on the shotgun seat. For the moment, the charge over broken ground was spoiling most of their aim, but he knew if they made the SUV and started to circle in from both directions. Bolin knew he couldn't let it get that far. The soldier figured 12, 13 armed riders, tops. 
They were triggering off subgun bursts, one-handed, cutting the gap quickly, in the neighborhood now of 80 yards and counting. The Trojans were hardly the sort of disciplined fighters their gang name might suggest. Their hard charge was meant to end it quick and messy. The fact they were bunched in a loose skirmish line was almost too good to be true. The HK-69 popped off a 40mm frag bomb, Bolin dropping it in a tight group of three bikers at roughly 10 o'clock. The blast radiated shockwaves and scorching heat to bowl down the fourth Trojan in line. They were little more than a rolling shooting gallery, packed in it near arm's length to one another. Bolin lurched up, not about to give them time to rethink the situation. Bands of flame torched up three more Trojans, human fireballs flying out of the saddle, dumped to the ground, writhing and shrieking their agony. One Trojan, just the same, was bursting past the shooting tongue when his arm was lit up like a Roman candle. Boland sprayed the broken line, then dove back down behind the hood's port side. Shift! Trojans were taking to the air as the warrior hosed them down. Bodies spinning out of the saddle, crazed eyes finally registering the pain as they absorbed the wrath of a one-man hellstorm. An unmanned Harley streaked away from the toppling rider. He slammed into the shotgun door. Boland ripped another stream of 9mm Parabellum shockers. I'm getting too old for this shit. Taking in a mixed bag of noxious smells, the executioner gave the deathbed a thorough walkthrough. Nothing but vacant eyes, frozen in shock and horror, stared at the sky. Thirteen confirmed kills. Next, the soldier gave the broken ridge line around the impromptu arena a long survey. If someone was watching, he was either too well buried, or it maybe beat a quick exit when the curtain here was dropped. Either way, the men in black were still playing games. They had hoped the biker gang would take care of their little problem from the Justice Department. Not this day. The soldier knew the drop was still a few hours off. The desert heat could prove as lethal as any armed enemy, so he figured he needed to stock up on bottled water and some food. As he retraced his steps to the SUV, he couldn't shake the feeling he was being watched. One last view of the empty panorama, and the soldier gave his wheels a look. A few scars and dings, the passenger side mashed in where it took the Harley's ram, and one flat tire. <sighs> Just dandy. As he walked to the back of the Cherokee, Bullen was glad he paid extra for a real spare tire, not the usual flimsy donut. He had to believe the three sets of messes he was leaving would bring the sheriff running after him. Good enough. If that happened, he had a plan to crank up a little more heat. After he changed the tire, Boland brushed the glass crumbs off the seat and piled in behind the wheel. The last 40 millimeter hell bomb was deposited into the launcher, a buckshot round, and Boland settled the HK hardware on top of the war bag. The executioner put it in drive and set out to follow the road to Shambhala. God damn it. Not even off the starting line, and Thornton was already seeing it all poised to unravel. He towed the three bodies as he felt the full force of both the sheriff's angry stare and the baking sun. And this is supposed to be just some federal cop? Looks to me like your Belasco headache dropped these boys like they were nothing but paper targets in some carnival gallery. Thornton ignored Walsh, looked past the scowling face toward the black Lincoln town car replica. From the other world commune, Kraman had trailed him to the site of the first Trojan's failure. Number two disaster was just down the road. Apparently, Mr. fucking Belasco had used his SUV to mow down another bike before putting a bullet in his head. Report about the third debacle was just coming in. It was so incredible, so much that Thornton started to reevaluate his immediate plans and their ever-dimming prospects. He would let the gangsters arrive, that much would stand. The Chicago mob was on schedule for their own face-off with Belasco. 
It was the end game, once they actually had the device in hand, that posed new and troubling questions for Thornton. What would keep Crumman, for instance, from removing him once he had the anti-gravity device in his possession? Despite his claims, Crumman might be unable or unwilling to meet Thornton's demanded fee of two million. The hundred thousand that had secured Thornton's services could indeed be all that was coming. The man's promise was that there would be a fat payday once he sold it to the subcontractor. Thorne decided at some point he needed to come up with a safety valve, just in case Crommon was reserving some fatal solution of his own if he decided the asking price was too steep. He had a hunch where to look for a net. But first, another bunch of bodies to dispose of, courtesy of Special Agent Belasco. Thornton briefly returned the sheriff's dark scowl, adjusting his dark aviator shades a little. The two so-called deputies were giving the corpses a grim appraisal of their own from the far side of Walsh's SUV. They were Thornton's men, actually, NSA men posing as county deputies. They were legal eyes and ears, inserted to monitor the sheriff from the beginning of the project. It was hard to read their faces, but Thornton had to believe they had some lingering questions of their own. Which led to another issue. When it went down, he could be sure a few of the operatives would balk at the heist of the device. In the hours to come, Thornton decided he would have to mentally weed out any remaining ops who might prove problematic. He would discuss it some with Crommon, but his gut already told him where that guy stood on the not-so-little problem of questionable loyalties. Look at the holes your Belasco pal put in this biker trash. I'm looking at something out of the Wild West here, Thornton. Showdown at the Alien. I'm wondering how many more messes of yours I'm gonna have to clean up. I'm thinking this whole county is set to blow. I'm thinking that maybe you and that freak down there in his limo are cooking something up that might leave me high and dry. Anybody but the old geezer in the office see this? <laughs> Velasco? You're getting on my nerves, Sheriff. The bodies would be removed, of course, burned in the desert by his own cleanup crew. Beyond that, a few dollars would land in the geezer's hands with a subtle warning. The implication that if he didn't blind himself to what had happened here, a mothership of a different sort would come calling to abduct him. As Thornton took his handheld radio and patched back to Callie, he took a few paces to get clear of the sheriff. Where is Belasco now, Callie? Just rolled into that tourist trap the Johnson brothers call Shambhala. I have to tell you, sir, the way we saw him mow down those bikers, well, it strikes me the man's done this kind of thing before. Thirteen more bodies to dispose of and God only knew who or how many pairs of eyes might have witnessed or stumbled across the slaughter by now. Thornton saw Crommon's personal driver bodyguard step outside the boat on wheels. Now what, he wondered. Keep watching, and keep me posted. A cleanup detail is on the way. Out. The expression on Crommon's bodyguard was impossible to read as he stepped up, checking the dead Trojans from behind the cover of his dark eyeglasses. Mr. Crommon says to send you and your deputies to try and talk some sense into Belasco. Yeah, right. What, you want me to buy the man dinner and a few beers? Simply convince the man it might be in his best interest to leave the area as quickly and quietly as possible. Oh, I'm sure he'll listen to reason now. Failing his departure, you are to inform him that he may have an unfortunate accident by day's end. Oh, in other words, you want me to do your dirty work. You want me... <laughs> To threaten to kill this fucking one-man army if he don't just saddle up and head out. I couldn't have said it any better. With that, the bodyguard marched past Walsh. You heard the man, Sheriff. What are you waiting for? All right, I'll go do this, Thornton. Not because I'm your goddamn watchdog, and not because these two goons of yours keep me on a tight leash. I want to see Belasco gone. The kind of heat he could bring from back east will only end up in my lap. I go down, I know I go alone. Not only that, but any more of these Wild West shows, I don't think I'll be able to hold off what little media we got in these parts. While Walsh lumbered off in a huff, Thornton examined the dead once again. The numbers alone were mind-boggling. Seventeen, no, twenty-one, when he tallied up Braxton and company from the previous night. And Thornton suspected he hadn't even begun to see the worst. And despite Crommon marching the sheriff off to put a word to the wise to Belasco, Thornton knew damn well the man wasn't going anywhere. The man was a killer, and his nose was full of the scent of blood, his mind buzzing with questions he wanted answered. The justice credentials were simply a smokescreen. 
Exactly who and what the man really was, Thornton might never know. Well, there was still Vince Leonetti about to step into the equation. According to Thornton's watch, the man was due to land in Reno any time now. Thornton hoped the Don came more prepared than the Trojans, meaning more guns, more skill, more brains. Given what he'd seen, he could be sure that Don would be leaving a few soldiers behind in the desert. That was fine, as long as Belasco was among the buzzard meat. An armed reception committee of three desert rats was waiting for him when Bolin rolled into Shambhala. He eased off the gas, then the executioner draped a hand over the HK MP5, taking in the desolate sights. This poor man's tourist trap was planted in a devil's tumbleweed-choked dust bowl, ringed by ominous black hills. The heat shimmer and shark's teeth edges along the hills were a perfect combo, Mother Nature's gift of concealment to any snipers. The immediate weapons in question, a double-barreled shotgun, M16, and a Colt 45, weren't aimed his way right off, so Bolin stole a cautious few seconds to further scope out his surroundings. And stay braced for the next sudden eruption out of nowhere. Welcome to Shambhala. Peering through the blasted-out window, Bolin felt his anxiety drop a notch when shotgun called out from his porch stand. It's okay, Rudy. Bobby. I seen a wasted biker scum that left here owing me over a hundred bucks for beer. The day was already full of surprises. And how did the desert rat know about the slaughter on the other side of the hills? Unless, of course, he'd seen it. Shambhala, Bolin noted, was made up of all three structures. The narrow dirt track cut between two buildings. Glinting sunlight off aluminum prefab made the disc-shaped rooftops glow. A near mirage that made the buildings appear set to lift off for the sky. To his left, he saw the wooden poles holding up the awning over the wooden boardwalk were festooned with E.T. dummies. Ceramic or carved from wood, it was hard to tell, but over twenty mannequins with large gray heads, black eyes, and spindly limbs lined the porch front. Then there were coffee cups, beer mugs emblazoned with grinning little gray men, silver discs suspended from coat hangers, models of E.T. sitting up in the hatch. Black, white, or gray T-shirts were hanging in the hot, stifling air. Logos ranged anywhere from The Truth Is Out There to We Come In Peace or We Need A Few Good Earthlings including all the obligatory declarations of a government military conspiracy to hide the fact that we are not alone. Shotgun held his post on the stoop to his store. Colt 45 was opposite, directly across the hard-packed dirt, in front of a plate-glass window painted Shambhala Diner in bold black letters with a floating E.T. dummy. There was a single gas pump ahead with silver structure number three just behind it, and Bolin saw the desert rat lowering the M-16 in that direction. Bolin leaned his head out of the window. Shotgun was lanky, a mane of white hair falling to bony shoulders. He had the sort of wild eyes that told of universal distrust. If you watched me work, then you know I get nervous when people point guns at me. Not a problem, mister. Long as you're not with the government, we have no beef with you. Well, are you with them? Who's them? The men in black. I'm with me. Good enough. I need gas, some food, and bottled water. Step inside my humble spaceship. Fix you right up. Bolin bailed out in the harsh sunlight, slipping on dark aviator shades. What's the uh, subgun for? Let's just say it's helping me build a bridge over troubled waters. What are you, smartass? You don't trust us? Like the t-shirt says. Bolin nodded at the Trust No One shirt hanging nearest his face. <laughs> Okay. You're saying the same reason what we got guns for. Bolin watched as the other two desert rats silently turned and melted into the shadows of the doorways to their respective buildings. What's your name, Rambo? Bolin followed the man through the door. Inside, he found enough E.T. paraphernalia to stock a sci-fi convention. Belasco. I'm Jordan. He offered a wrinkled, liver-spotted hand. Bolin accepted the handshake. Jordan took an empty crate, heading for the coolers stocked with beverages. How many bottles? Ten. Eh, nice round number. 
The soldier took some candy bars, beef jerky sticks, and set them on a counter where two four-foot ETs holding laser guns stood sentry. Maybe you think the three of us are paranoid or just plain crazy. Bolin shot the man a fleeting grin. Never crossed my mind. Heh, <laughs> patronizing me now, are you? Anybody ever tell you you got an attitude problem? I've fallen in with a bad crowd of people. Heh, <laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> Well, if you were one of them, I figure you wouldn't have come alone anyway. They never ride around the county unless it's three or four of them. You got the look of a killer about you, and the body can't out there to prove it. But it's not the same look as they got. Got our phones bugged. I see them all the time in the hills watching us. Like they can't wait for one of us to go out there where they keep them things so they can gun us down. Bullen was almost afraid to ask. What things? Why... <laughs> Flying saucers, of course. Usually it's Wednesday or Thursday night they go on maneuvers. Sometimes Sunday. Jordan came back, moving behind the counter, his eyes shining with a storyteller's gleam as he settled the crate on the counter. Been chased off fifteen times. Me and the boys, we seen it. Taped it even. <laughs> Wanna see a real flying saucer? Some other time. Kinda hovers, red and white lights glowing, then... Whew, Goes off to the horizon like a shooting star. But no meteor I've ever seen moves that fast. No, sir. Once in a while, one of us in the county turns up missing. Here yesterday, then gone. Once you start talking about going to the media, mostly. Me? I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Not like I'll ever know the real facts, anyway. How much I owe you? Oh, it's all Mr. J's mother ship, friend. Jordan finally let the shotgun go, laying it over the counter. Bolin figured he had passed muster with the old coot. Those bikers nearly tapped out two kegs before they shot out of here, cussing me and threatening to shoot me down my own place. Looked all doped up. Trash, but crazy trash. Shoveling shit up their noses on the way out the door. Eh, sounded like one of them got some bad news. I'm thinking it had something to do with you. You wondered maybe how I know all this good stuff? <laughs> this way, friend. Curious, Bolin followed Jordan toward the back of the store. A wooden bar front lined with stools ran from wall to wall, but it was the bank of camera monitors that grabbed Bolin's eye. Huh. Yep. <laughs> Not even the men in black know I'm watching the desert. I got my own eyes buried in the hills. Gives me a little peace of mind. They come. We're ready to square off. Me and the boys, few others scattered about. We're the only sane folks you're going to find in these parts. Bolin kept a straight face. First, you got a sheriff who was never duly elected, and who we know for a fact is one of them. Two deputies, look cut from the same cloth as the MIBs, their guys attached to Walsh's hip. Well, that's partly why we act so edgy. I don't even sleep at night unless that shotgun's by my side. What's the rumor on how Walsh got his job? Yeah, last sheriff up and retired, and Walsh just stepped right in, assumed his job. Nobody questioned it? <laughs> Why bother? They do what they want. Find me a square mile out here Big Brother doesn't own. Government and military properties staked out from corner to corner across this state. Signs everywhere telling us common folk they're authorized to use deadly force. Rumor is they have this spray they use, cover themselves with it, makes them near invisible in the night. I gather the stuff deflects light or, or maybe absorbs it. Invisible killers, yes, sir. I hear they can come up on you out of the dark. You never know what hit you till you're up there, crying to God how such a sinful thing could have happened. Hmm. Another thing, they have something that's been killing folks off around here. Something I'm sure has to do with that flying disc. Past two years, folks are dropping like flies from cancer. One day healthy, people with no history of medical problems, when a couple of weeks, they can't even get out of bed. And let me ask you, when was the last time you heard of cattle dying from radiation sickness? <laughs> Not only that, we gotta protect ourselves from odd riffraff. UFO cultists hunkered out in the desert like, like the apocalypse is as close as the next sunup. Looked like one big house full of shady characters on the run from the law when I went out there and took a peek. Bolin thought of weed and pressed Jordan about the cult. Jordan told him if he wanted to take a look that bad, he could go check himself, and gave Bolin directions to the yard. 
An army of lunatics with guns, he thought, snooping around classified black projects, drawing their own fantastic conclusions, armed and dangerous. But Boland wasn't inclined to go hunting down a loose end right now. If weed popped up in Boland's line of fire, he'd deal with the guy then. It occurred to Boland the man made no mention of anything he might have caught about the howling coyote. For people who seemed to thrive on rumor and speculation, it told Boland that news of the slaughter had been buried, swept away into the desert wastes. The soldier would even bet if he went back to the restaurant he wouldn't find the first spot of blood. Mm, looks like we got company coming, friend. In one of the monitors, Boland saw the white SUV framed by a camera. The light bar and county insignia on its side warned Boland the sheriff was on the way to pay him a visit. Two shadows appeared to be riding with him. They stopped, and Boland could almost read the grim faces, hear the worried thoughts as they inspected the graveyard of wreckage, the dead men strewed around them. Boland had plans to remove the thorny problem of the sheriff and the NSA deputies. You up for backing my play when they ride in? Jordan's smile made his face shine. <laughs> How come I'm liking the sound of that already? Think hard before you answer. You could be putting yourself and your buddies in danger. She <laughs> can't be any more dangerous than breathing the radioactive air out that door. The gates of destiny were about to open. Allow them all to enter where the great mystery would be revealed. They were about to cross a threshold to where the sinister government shadow powers jealously guarded a secret knowledge. And where one truth was hidden, there had to be more. The others, indeed, worked in mysterious ways. Sometimes they even used the enemy to do their bidding so the righteous seekers could prevail. Or so Jason Nixon told his assembled following. With the exception of Collins, most of them looked convinced by his brief impassioned speech. Voices of doubt, naturally, were raised here and there. What happened once they were inside the facilities? The government's assassins intended to split them up between two sites. Attempting to isolate them? Weaken them in numbers? Was it all a trap, duping them to do their bidding to help steal the device, then kill them? Bad idea, brother. No, it's destiny, my friend Ernie. It was time, Nixon decided, to start separating the wheat from the chaff. Disbelievers had no place in the grand design of the others. If they're so ready to let us play ball, why the armed guards outside? Go ask them if you need to know that badly. Oh, but they were like such frightened little children, afraid to venture into the unknown, he thought. They needed a gentle shove. So Nixon decided to prey on their fears, hold their shortcomings up to the light of his own wisdom. He was an educated man, after all, and words were primarily his weapon of choice. My fellow travelers, my fellow seekers of truth and knowledge, have you not yearned all of your lives to understand the mysteries of the universe, to have the unexplained explained? Have you not left behind dismal, tawdry lives to go in search of the truth? Finally, you have shed the stigma of past failures. You have arrived at a moment in time, a turning point that could make you immortal. In your former lives, you were aberrations in the eyes of your fellow humans. They called you freaks and lunatics who shouted the sky was falling, but no one listened. Can you not see what is happening? You have had what those common people call paranormal experiences. If they simply don't dismiss it with a smirk as hallucination, or tell you it was only a comet in the sky, or the Air Force dropping magnesium flares, or swamp gas... Listen to the voice of reason you know you have heard before. The others, we know from personal experience, have telepathic powers beyond anything we can imagine. They are showing us the way. They have inserted their own will into the minds of the enemy, sent them here to facilitate our enlightenment. They say we might have to kill the workforce. Civilians just like us. That albino thing hinted as much he may give the order to do just that nixon addressed radkin the hillbilly from georgia the man had come to him a wild-eyed drunk fleeing a bad marriage when his family mocked his sightings to the point that he was a physical wreck the man had been an emotional cripple who had only been brought back to health with several hypno regression sessions now he was a sober pillar of their vigilant community another nixon success story 
Maybe the M16 he carried was spooking them. Nixon rested the assault rifle against an armchair. He spread his arms, the prophet calling forth the faithful. Need I remind you they are pawns in the greatest conspiracy of all time? There are no innocents on the other side. Need I remind you they are likewise aiding and abetting the enemy, willingly employing their minds to profane technology the military has stolen from the others. Think back, my fellow seekers. Recall your own experiences. Think back even further to when you were children and perhaps caught that fleeting glimpse of the future. A faraway voice in the mist, telling you of the path already laid for you before you were even born, that the road would be full of trials, that your lives would appear difficult to the point where you perhaps would contemplate suicide, suffering the ridicule and contempt of the unbelievers. The trappings of this fleshly world were never meant for you. The way was shown you because you were chosen, and you have now arrived. This is it! What we have journeyed our whole lives for! The coming hours are our united destiny, a coming majesty that will transcend and transform our very souls. You are on the verge of knowing what, until now, only the secret shadow government has known. Nixon stepped back. Before the enemy returns here tonight, I need a show of hands. In or out? Hands up, if you're coming with me tonight. One by one, the hands rose. As Nixon expected, Collins was last to join in the show of hands. Now do I get a gun? Now that you appear willing, but of course. Bolin was out the door, HKMP5 poised. Moments earlier, Jordan had pointed the way to the back door when he told Bolin the good sheriff was pulling up in front. The warrior had a general principle about shooting a lawman, even a tainted badge. But he wasn't opposed to winging Walsh if the man turned a gun on him. The black suit deputies were fair game. All of 60 paces, and the executioner came around the corner, crouched at the gleaming edge, and weighed his next move. Walsh and the two deputies were advancing toward Jordan, the trio throwing looks around at the armed desert rats. There was no mistaking the menacing intent as they dropped their hands over hip-holstered pistols. Drop your weapons! The hell you say? Where's the man that came here in that vehicle? Showtime. Bolin stepped around the corner, glimpsed Jordan grinning his way, gesturing with the shotgun. It might have been the heat, or the slaughter they'd just seen, or it might have been a combination, but Bolin saw the deputies tense. There was a moment of indecision, Walsh set to pull his own pistol when Jordan brought up the shotgun. The deputies dug out the hardware, spinning, and went for broke. The NSA gunners had whipped around on their heels, their browning pistols nearly on line when Bolin chopped them up with a heavy sweep of 9mm rounds, left to right and back again. Meanwhile, the sheriff was shooting his hands up, hopping away from the dancing dead men. Hey, hey, don't shoot! Don't shoot! Hold your fire! as if it were all a terrible misunderstanding and they had come in peace. I'm not here for trouble, Belasco! Walsh had one eye on the twin barrels aimed from the porch. Bolin advanced past his SUV. On the ground, Sheriff. Walsh complied, stretching out in the dirt. All right, I'm only here to deliver a message from Thornton. Bolin relieved the man of his browning, stuffed it inside his waistband. Binding the Sheriff's hands behind his back with his own cuffs, Bolin hauled him to his feet. <sighs> Last night. Uh, what about it? Who gave the order? I, I heard it was that freak Croman. They went in probably like you already suspected. Leave no witnesses. What, what I overheard, it was something those two had on disc that Croman wanted back. So what? The idea they would murder women and children cause you a bad night's sleep? Yeah. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it damn sure did. You're telling me you've grown a conscience? I I'm, I'm telling you I want out. This big change of heart, was it before what just happened, or after? What's it matter? This has gone way too far. It's only just begun, Sheriff. Going to get worse before it gets better, is that it? The storm's only building. You'd better pick a side. How about the winning team? That remains to be seen. It may look like I'm ahead on points now, but if you make some fair-weather call when the going gets real tough... I'm with you, Belasco. We'll see. You want to tell me what... 
Wheeling, Bolin traced the source of the weapon's fire to a point high up in the hills, past the diner. A black-clad figure was tumbling down the slope, an awkward flopping of loose limbs identifying it as a corpse. Jordan, check those monitors of yours! Bolin set off. He made for an easy target, he knew, in full view of a sniper's crosshairs. But instinct told the soldier some X-Factor had just covered his back, and was now gone. The executioner was standing at the foothills, giving the ridge line around the bowl a search, when he heard Jordan. Nothing up there but another MIB behind the rocks, wasted. Bolin turned away from the unmoving lump midway up the hill and backtracked to Walsh. Whoever our Mr. Shooter was, he's gone by the time I looked. So what was the big message, Sheriff? Actually, it was Croman. Said for me to tell you to pack up and leave, or else they'd come for you. What else? <laughs> They don't exactly fill me in on the particulars of their daily agenda. Bolin decided it was time to bail Shambhala and keep building the fire. You don't mind if I leave those two laying out like that, do you, Blasco? Our way of showing them we're not just desert trash gonna roll over and get pushed around. It's your humble mothership, Center. I won't be the one who has to smell them. <laughs> in a cooler with this one? Jordan nodded at Walsh. Yeah. Sit on them until you hear from me. Give me a number I can call you. If this Thornton shows up here, give him a message. Tell him I have the disc. What are you going to do with me? Jordan reached out a skeletal hand and jerked Walsh toward the stoop. Going to get you cooled off, Sheriff. You look kind of hot and bothered. <laughs> Deep freeze you, so to speak. Like those little gray men I hear about time to time. A few more minutes here, fueling and stocking up, and the soldier would be on his way. He was now, more than ever, a moving target. A familiar feeling for Mac Bolan. The stink of death in his nose, Thornton inspected the dripping metal on the bike's engine and frame. Solid metal had been warped all to hell, he noted, melted by superheated fire to nothing but running silver goo. And the flesh on the bodies of three Trojans had been eaten to the bone by what the late Callie had described as a ball of intense white fire. Even more than two hours after the Trojans had met their gruesome demise, and he could still feel the heat smoldering from burned metal, catch the lingering whiff of cooked meat. Since when, he thought, did the Justice Department start using white phosphorus? The clank and grind of heavy machinery interrupted the train of brooding thought. More cleanup. He was nothing more than a glorified garbage man these days. It was time to change that, and quick, before it was too late. He stood, a chill running through him as the sweat broke down his nape. He waved the dozer on, turned his back as the massive shovel head scooped up the first few bodies and assorted wreckage. The black dump truck was rumbling up the track, the first four bodies and Harleys already picked up for waste disposal. Thornton glanced toward the big, sleek, black chopper. Trailing from its belly were the steel winches used to haul the dozer from the facility. The chopper was still hovering over the hills, kicking up dust storms. The pilot had just informed him of the latest situation. There were more dead men. His own. Thornton was numb over the latest round of grim news. Walsh was nowhere to be found, but his vehicle was abandoned in the rat hole at the end of the trail. Worse, four more operatives were down, two in the hills, the sheriff's watchdogs laid out in the bizarre tourist trap called Shambhala, rotting under the sun, shot to hell. At the rate he was losing men, he would have to put in a call for a fresh batch of reinforcements from the classified retreat to the east, near the Utah border. At least another fifteen guns were needed for this night's main event, if they even got it that far. Belasco, he knew, was long gone from the scene, heading south in the direction of the two facilities. Thornton had two units shadowing the man. Thornton was considering having them go ahead and take their chances against Belasco when Briggs patched through. Sir, the target stopped. Looks like he's going inside the restaurant. For what purpose, Thornton wondered? To confirm the cleanup? Maybe the guy's pit stop was meant to lure his men inside. It was time to make another judgment call. You and Marley go in. Leave the other team outside to watch your backs. And don't call back again unless you can make me proud. Over and out. Even as he signed off, Thornton knew he was most likely marching them straight to hell. Thornton had things to do himself. And there was still the matter of his own safety net. 
first the next order of business. He told his own team to supervise the cleanup there and wait for his return. He piled behind the wheel of the van, banging the door shut. The Don should be calling any time. And time, Thornton knew, was something he was running out of quickly. The soldier had them marked, about a half a mile on his rear, when he returned to the scene of the original crime. Two black SUVs pulled up on the road and sat baking under the sun, dark armored vehicles housing invisible killers. Thanks to the black tinted windows, it was impossible to get a fix on how many hard men had come calling. So be it. Boland grabbed the HK MP5, a fresh clip in place. He palmed a frag grenade, stowed it in the pocket of his windbreaker. There was no good reason to come back to where it had all started, except that it was in the general vicinity of his route to the makeshift grave site and the drop. It was also as good as any place to shave the enemy numbers some more, if they decided to come running and gunning. He figured Thornton had to know his game plan was blowing up in his face, and Bolin was working on a hunch that the standing order was to shoot him on sight. Good enough, if that was the case. At least everyone knew where things stood. Bolin was out of the door of his vehicle, rolling hard toward the howling coyote. No crime scene tape blocked the front entrance, of course, but the hung closed sign nailed to the door was left behind in the wake of the cleanup. It might send a hungry traveler grumbling off to find another eatery down the road, but the memory of what happened here only hours ago was fresh in Bolin's recall as he shouldered through the door. Inside, the air was still redolent of the final moments of terror. The ghosts of the dead seemed to hang in his thoughts, peppering his mind with brief flashes of the shock and horror on the faces of the innocent. He made out the dark splotches on the floor. The fact they hadn't put out the extra effort with mop and bucket only reaffirmed Boland's original assessment of his opponent's arrogant confidence in their own impunity. They were nothing more than savages to the executioner. From outside, he heard them coming. Take it easy, friends. Slowly, Thornton stepped out into the glare and the guns, showing empty hands. He looked at the faces of each desert rat in turn. They had the look of ravening paranoids. He knew it wouldn't take much to push them over the edge. After all, he was the armed tool of the great government military conspiracy that had fueled their fantasies for years. <laughs> you come in peace, that it? Thornton addressed the one with the shotgun. I'm not here looking for a piece of you on account of what happened to my men. Huh, <laughs> real sentimental, aren't you? I suppose those two were expendable, huh? That how you people work? Deny everything? Where's the sheriff? The flunkier you're ongoing government conspiracy to hide the truth about extraterrestrials? Why, the man said it was going to be a little too hot out here today. He's cooling off inside. Thornton knew he could have marshaled a team of ops and taken them down easily but that would only serve to dump another mess in his lap. He'd wasted enough time and resources. Later, when the Belasco problem was laid to rest, he could come back here and settle up with these three tumbleweeds. All I want is to go into the diner, have a cold beer or two, and wait for a phone call. None of what's happened is your problem. Heh! <laughs> I'm supposed to take your word on that? A beer and a phone call, that's all I want. Then I'm gone. Thornton waited and sweated out the silence, while they looked at one another in some communion of the minds. Three nods followed the stretch of quiet. Paranoids with telepathic powers, he thought sardonically. If I see one of your kind coming this way, I have your permission to shoot you dead? Thornton showed an easy smile he hardly felt. I wouldn't expect anything less. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot. Uh, Belasco? The badass 86 and anybody getting in his face? My new hero, the UFO hunter? Said to tell you, he has the disc. Thornton felt his heart lurch, but kept it from showing on his face. And the way things were going, he sure as hell wasn't surprised. If the drop wasn't due soon, it would be a sorry expenditure of a frag grenade. But Bolin saw no choice but to use it up on the two men in black heading for the front door. Getting bogged down, wasting rounds, trading fire. No option at all. 
A peek beyond the plate glass window and it appeared SUV number two was marking turf, waiting on the frontline shooters to clean it up quickly and neatly. The soldier's roost was at the far edge of the partition dividing the smoking section from the main dining area. He rose from a crouch and saw the shadows moving beyond the doorway. They stopped and hunched down. Bolin pulled the pin, released and silently set down the spoon. The muzzle of a subgun prodded empty air, the two hard men he'd seen move in still holding their ground as he counted off two seconds, then lobbed the lethal egg their way. They finally made their charge, SWAT-like, coming in one low, one high, weapons fanning the interior. Wrong way, leading to a dead-end street. The executioner kicked it into high gear, Subgun leading his surge toward the window. It was a bulldoze tactic, nothing more or less, as he caught full view of another gunner bailing out of the passenger door of their SUV. The man was frozen long enough at the sight of his comrades getting blown to smithereens for Boland to cut loose with a long barrage of auto fire. Gunner 3 took the stitching line of bullets across the chest, the burst rising to tear out his throat. He was dropping hard and fast, bouncing off the van, when Bolin hit the vanishing window on the fly. Another hard man was on the move, rolling around from the driver's side. His sub gun up and chattering in hopes of catching the blur leaping out of nowhere in mid-flight. Bolin counted on a split second of panicked hesitation to spoil the gunner's aim. By the next heartbeat, it was over. Bolin listened to the silence. Battlesense told him there was no one left in either van, but he checked just the same, throwing back the door in each vehicle. All clear. The road behind was free of traffic. But the executioner felt the heat rising, outside and inside, as he reclaimed the wheel to his SUV. Just because he couldn't see this particular enemy didn't mean the gunners weren't there, and he was making messes aplenty. He could well guess Thornton had more guns on tap. The executioner set off to pick up his special air delivery, a package that would help him carry on this shadow war game. Thornton scowled into his beer. He was hoping a cold taste would smooth the edges of his smoldering anger. Unfortunately, the beer wasn't providing much relief for what ailed him right then. For one thing, his bartender never let go of the big Colt 45, or strayed too far from his perch. He was surprised they hadn't asked he shed the Beretta, but who could figure how the wacko's minds worked? The guy just stood, watching him, a dozen questions clearly dancing through his eyes. Unless Tumbleweed got antsy or aggressive, Thornton dismissed him as a viable threat. No, the threat was out there in the desert, and he had the disc. Thornton checked his watch. The call was late. He wanted to relish the time alone, this peace in the eye of the storm, but it was hard to sit still and enjoy the simple pleasure of a cold brew when his world was falling apart. Yeah? Is it true? Is what true, friend? You people have a flying saucer out there? You got alien bodies in storage? <laughs> You watch a lot of X-Files reruns, don't you? Well, you sitting there drinking my beer. Think you owe me the courtesy of some straight talk? Thornton drained his beer and let Tumbleweed stew. Briefly, Thornton pondered how to answer. He'd heard the rumors himself, but not even he had the kind of security clearance that allowed him access to the kind of knowledge Tumbleweed wanted. From what he had heard, he didn't even want the kind of top-level pass only a few men in the world had. Rumor was they didn't live to see retirement. <laughs> I'm just a pawn in that ongoing government conspiracy you mentioned. A little guy, bottom of the heap. I know as much as you do. Tumbleweed bared a mouth with half his teeth missing. Thornton stood and walked to the payphone mounted on the wall. He picked it up. Yes? Shadow Man, I'm on the way. That's good. Your boy Belasco? He's gotten a little nervous, walking around with your money. He's going berserk all over the place. What the hell are you talking about? The guy's trouble, that's what I'm talking about. The kind of trouble you had better be ready to deal with. If he was helping Barkle and stick it to me, his life is numbered in hours. Glad to hear it. Okay, here's the story.
One moment's viewing of the skeletal remains and the hole in the skull was all Bolin needed to confirm his worst suspicions. He kicked the small pile of dirt back in place. There was no point laboring to uncover the second mound with the small collapsible entrenching tool he carried in his kit. He'd seen more than enough. Perhaps he had gone there simply hoping it wouldn't be true what he'd learned on the disk. The two young people had their lives snuffed out on the orders of a man he kept hearing referred to as a walking freak show. Whoever the dead had been in life, it would take some work by the Justice Department or the farm, but with the information he had, their identities could be eventually run down. If nothing else, their next of kin deserved to know what had happened to their loved ones. Suddenly, the executioner felt incredibly weary. It was different, cleaner in some way, he supposed, to wage war against a clearly defined external enemy. The frothy-mouthed terrorist, for instance, or this week's crime lord, armed subversives or foreign spies. It was something else entirely, something dirty and bitterly distasteful, when he found himself pitted against rogue factions who were supposedly on the home team. Traitors. Bolin knew better than to get sidetracked by his rising anger. But as long as he kept breathing, whoever the dead buried at his feet were, they would be avenged. He was walking back to the SUV, alternately checking his watch and the burning stark lay of the land. The drop was late. There could be any number of reasons why the chopper hadn't yet shown in the skies. None of them good. He shelved the line of negative thought. He'd give it another thirty minutes, then raise Brognola. Right then, he sensed he was once more being watched and marked. Where the broken hard pan ended to the north, a vast salt flat stretched toward a low hump of black hills. Before the task of uncovering the body, he'd spotted a distant dust pool to the east. There, then gone. Black-suited NSA eyes, no doubt. As he strained to scour the unearthly panorama, he made out the sound he longed to hear. Turning his head, he saw the shape of the chopper, cutting an arrow straight line, 700 feet or so above, and bearing down. As planned, the black suit pilot raised him on his secured cell line. Special delivery to Stryker. Come in, Stryker. Stryker here. Apologies for the late arrival, Stryker. The spook show at Nellis gave us a song and dance about mechanical problems on the mail truck we requested. It took us a little longer than we liked to go through our own pre-flight checklist. No sweat, special delivery. I'm not surprised. Just watch yourselves going back. Roger that, sir. I left one of our people with our ride home, just in case we were left suddenly wondering why our engines might be stalling out 20,000 feet over Nebraska. Stay frosty, and eyes peeled on your six. Likewise, sir. And good luck. Special delivery, over and out. Reaching the SUV, Boland dumped the entrenching tool over the back seat. He took his bottled water, uncapped it, and slowly drank. The subgun in hand next, he walked away from the SUV, as the Bell Jet Ranger's hatch opened and the package was sent falling before the chute blossomed. Even with the dark shades, Boland found he had to squint some against the harsh sunlight. The package landed. The chopper veered to starboard, then began its short run back to Nellis. As he scoped the salt flat and closed on the war bag, Boland spotted the black bulk of a vehicle in the distance. It was long and low, and there was no mistaking that rolling boat Taggart had mentioned. The hybrid cross between a stretch limo and a town car ran a slow parallel course with the black wall of rock. Finally it swung around, then sat out there on the sea of white glass. Grabbing up his war bag, the executioner retraced his steps to the SUV. He decided it was time to pay the freak a visit. Vince Leonetti wasn't used to doing things the other guy's way. It had been some time since he'd jumped through hoops, pretty much at the beck and call of another man, particularly an individual he'd never seen and didn't know the first damn thing about, other than the guy was some sort of government spook. If he had doubts, then the Don was sure his crew had more than a few questions stewing in their heads. They were smart enough, though, to keep any reservations to themselves. They were paid to follow orders, keep their mouths shut. Still, he couldn't help but feel tension around him in the Lincoln as Gino Buono kept them rolling east on I-80, clipping along down the endless black arrow at around 70. With the passenger seat all to himself, Donnie, Marino, and Chubby Stanelli squeezed in back, Leonetti felt a sudden impulse to check on the second Lincoln in the side glass. 
Good. It was there, he saw, carrying five more soldiers from Chicago. Why wouldn't it be there? Leonetti chalked up his nerves to a couple of nagging factors. The Shadow Man, for one thing, and his story about some wild-ass Belasco out there, running around with his money and shooting up the desert. Parkland's pilfering had been confirmed, though, thanks to the wonders of modern technology and some old-school muscle. He'd sent a few of the boys to the guy's associates, rousing them out of bed last night, tearing through their books, the terrified worms on a hook confirming the missing money. And oh yes, Mr. Barklin was all of a sudden missing. And for two days at least. No rhyme or reason they could see for the disappearing act. They didn't know the guy was stealing. Well, when he returned to Chicago, Leonetti had plans for the guy's partners. And this godforsaken region was working on his nerves, too. Nothing but burning desert, scrub, cactus, and black hills that looked transplanted from the surface of the moon for as far as he could see in any direction. How the hell could anything human live out here? They were on a main roadway, well into the afternoon, and encountering not more than a few passing vehicles, mostly semis, going west. They might as well have landed on another planet. And in their haste, they certainly hadn't come dressed for the environment. Ten shooters, including himself, were decked out in sport or aloha shirts, silk slacks, Italian or alligator skin loafers. Dark shades, a few jackets and windbreakers concealed the sidearms. Say a cop stopped them, wondered about the rolling NRA convention. Well, to a man, they were all licensed private investigators. Gun permits for both the state of Illinois and Nevada, as luck would have it since Leonetti often did business in Vegas or Reno, or hit the slopes of Tahoe for some R&R &R with the Snow Bunnies. He had earlier acknowledged due respect and gratitude to an associate out here who had aided him in his time of trouble, stuffing both trunks with automatic weapons. Not even the Don of Chicago could walk through an airport with six or seven oversized duffel bags stuffed to the gills with enough hardware to take down a small city without raising an eyebrow from customs or the lurking DEA or Justice staff. Power might have its privileges, granted, but the Don was feeling anything but in control of the moment. Wono was looking all around, fidgeting. What is it, Gino? You told me the spook said it was just past a sign that said Shambhala. I'm looking for that black chopper you said was supposed to meet us. I don't know, boss. What don't you know? I mean, all due respect, boss, but who is this guy we're supposed to meet, for one thing? How do we know this ain't some kind of setup? We don't. That's why we're here. I'll know soon enough whether I'm getting jerked off. What I do know is he knows about Barkland, and I know that little shit fled with six million of my hard-earned dollars. There! The chopper! Wono hit the wheel, slowed down, but not quite enough as he took the shoulder hard, bouncing next onto the desert. Ah! Fuck, Gino! Easy! Leonetti watched as the black chopper set down in a storm of whipping dust. Ah! Pull it up, away from all that dust cloud, though. I didn't come here to eat any more dirt than I already had. He gritted his teeth, riding out the next series of bumps. Wono let off the gas, veering away from the rotor wash, well beyond the flying storm. Park it, you know. Out, boys. If I smell a problem, you'll hear up yours, then we start blasting. Marino, you fall back and pass the word to the others. I got it, boss. Leonetti stepped out into the heat. Holy fuck, it's hot. Not two seconds under the sun and he was breaking a sweat. The temperature pasting flesh to clothing. He was too old for this shit, he thought. But he wasn't old enough yet to be put out to pasture by some pink-faced suit who jammed a knife in his back. Or some wild ass alleged to be in cahoots with Barkland. Leonetti rolled his shoulders, snugging up the weight of the shoulder-holstered 9mm Browning under his silk suit jacket. Whoever the spook was, he took a sweet time before he came hopping out of the chopper. He was a lean, mean type, bullet head framed in dark shades, no expression as he marched out of the dust storm. A look around, and the Don saw his crew falling in. You shadow man. Hey, Vince. Pleased you could make it. That's Mr. Leonetti, asshole. What the fuck you smiling about? Shadow man pulled up short of the gathered soldiers. Leonetti ran a closer look over the man who was wearing some kind of skin-tight black suit, one piece, like a spaceman's underwear, a pistol hung in shoulder leather. <laughs> Forgive me no disrespect intended, Mr. Leonetti. I've been under a lot of stress. Tell me about it. 
When we spoke earlier, I told you your man is hiding out in the desert. You can't miss him. Big guy, armed to the teeth. I understand there's some damage to the right, front side, and rear of his SUV. There's also the briefcase of money I saw him take from Barkland after he gunned the man down. I'm thinking I need a little more convincing. The spook nodded, then grabbed a handheld radio. Bring it out. Leonetti felt the tension knot his shoulders as another man in black leapt through the open maw of the chopper. He reached back inside, then hauled out a rubber body bag. It hit the earth with the unmistakable thud of a heavy corpse. Then the man in black dragged the body bag out of the dust wall. Leonetti waited until the man in black dumped the bag nearly at his feet. It was Barklin, he saw, with a big black hole in his forehead. Shadow Man jerked a nod over his shoulder, and the gopher zipped up the face and began dragging the weight back at the chopper. A piece of paper was held out, and Leonetti took it. What's this? Directions. I've mapped out and marked off clear and precise territories where you can find your man. That's all you got for me? Should you need to reach me, there's a number I wrote down. I apologize, but I have urgent business of my own to attend to. And like I mentioned, Mr. Leonetti, I figured my time and effort on this matter was worth a little something to help me get settled in my golden years. Leonetti didn't know quite what to make of the man or the moment. Still, he didn't see any other course of action but to follow up. It might be good, after all, to rediscover the old street tough he hadn't had to exercise for a few years. What the hell, he figured. He hadn't come all this way to kick a gift horse in the teeth. How much sweeten are we talking about? Shadow Man shrugged. Well, I'm not a greedy man, Mr. Leonetti. Let's call it a nice round figure of 200 grand. Relative chump change if you can make your man give back what he and his pal took from you. So you figure. Where are you gonna be? I'll be around. I'm sure you'll be in touch. Yeah, count on it. Good luck, Mr. Leonetti. Just like that, he was moving, the Don watching as the spook spun and marched away, then bounding into the chopper. Leonetti figured there was only one way to really find out what the hell was going on. As the chopper lifted off, taking the mystery man away to the south, he turned to his crew. Let's go. As he retook his seat, grateful at least for the blasting bands of chilly air in his face, Vince Leonetti's old animal instincts kicked in. It was a fleeting gut warning, but it was there just the same. Something didn't feel right where the spook was concerned. Something was missing. It all seemed too damn easy. <sighs> there was only one course of action he knew of, though, to dig up any hidden truth from the vast desert. In short order, he'd find this Belasco. One guy, ten shooters. How tough could it be? Figure he'd be in Vegas by nightfall, telling war stories over whiskey. Try to fucking rip me off, will ya? And if it took some sweat and rising blood pressure to track the guy down, so much the better. A little discomfort was a great motivator. And Leonetti had to admit he was looking forward to delivering some discomfort himself. Maybe, he decided, Shadow Man was playing it straight. He was a government employee, after all, looking toward the future, wanting some good times to roll his way. Let's go find us this asshole who took my money. The Don felt alive and in charge for the first time since he'd hit Nevada. Take us back to One Base Alpha. Thornton moved back into the flickering shadows of the monitors in the belly of the aircraft. For some reason, he was weighted down with more doubt than when he'd played the Trojans and sent them roaring off to do battle with Belasco. It felt like the worst call he'd made yet. Hell, they had come here in silk threads, their aftershave smell still in his nose. And these were the mighty gangsters from back east? They looked more like a bunch of overweight, punch-drunk former contenders shuffling through a Vegas casino than the lean, mean-eyed pack of shooters he had envisioned. Thornton shook his head. Nothing he could do except loosen the safety valve once he landed at the facility. Crowman had radioed moments after he'd hung up the phone on the Don at the diner. More flack, more blame dumped on his head. Thornton had passed on the word Belasco had the cherished disc in his possession, informed Crommon the guy was out there in the desert in uncomfortable proximity of the facilities. Crommon was on his own for the moment, doing whatever he was doing. Screw him. It was time to start thinking about number one. He still intended to see Crommon grab the device for himself. No problem there, the freak could have it. And Thornton fully intended to make the run with the man to wherever and whoever he had lined up for the sale. 
But if Kraman turned against him, the Man-Thing would never know what hit him. The black-suited hard man rose out of the driver's door, gathered a head of steam and a few paces forward to cut off Bolin's advance from his SUV. Rolling toward the human barricade, Bolin was mentally tuned in to potential snipers, perched and hidden in the sheer black walls behind the customized limo. Lose the sub-gun. Bolin slowed his strides, but held on to the HK MP5. He gave the muscle a hard once-over. The crew cut, the dark shades, the holstered 9mm Beretta, and the one-piece combat suit were all standard insignia of their trade. You first. The gunner made no move to empty his holster. Then I guess it's settled. The man pointed toward the passenger end of the vehicle. Down the side, stand there, I'll be watching you. As if Bolin needed to be told that. The executioner stopped at a midway point on the unmarked limo. No plates, no insignia, but two antennae pointed up from the rear. He caught his grim expression mirrored in the black glass. A blast of air, cold enough to keep a meat house refrigerated, washed over Bolin, chilling his sweat-slick flesh. At first he thought the well was empty. Then he took a step back, peering inside, and found the shadow sitting on the other side of a tinted partition. The freak. It was hard to clearly make out the face on the other side, but Bolin saw the outline of a hat, some kind of Jimmy Buffett beach job, then noted the visor wrapped around the shadow of a face that had no visible features. So, we meet at last, Special Agent Belasco of the Justice Department. <laughs> or whoever you really are or work for. I have the disc, Kraman. I know all about this marvel of super technology you want to steal and sell to your so-called subcontractors. Since you've been watching me, and since you know I have the disc, then you know I know about those two kids you gave the order to murder. I hear a hostile tone in your voice. Well, at least your ears still work. <laughs> a few parts still do. You're going out of business. How it gets done is up to you. Uh, the easy way or the hard way. Your choice. It will happen. Thornton's going down, and this Project Orion is about to get scrapped. Ah, yes. Your single-handed gunslinging shall foil all my hopes and dreams. Just watch. This is where you tell me anything I'm not taking into account. Oh, what you don't know, Belasco, covers a lot of ground. For one, I am sitting at the threshold of obtaining one of the greatest discoveries of all time. Soon I will be holding the key to the future of humankind. Science fiction is becoming fact. Things that will make Spielberg stuff look mundane. I don't get out to the movies much. You do realize you've been extraordinarily lucky so far. I make my own luck. Of course. A bunch of bikers used to slapping around their women or gunning down unarmed men. Not much of a challenge. Just warming up. Bring on the first string. <laughs> In time. Consider yourself warned, Belasco. I will not allow you or even the entire weight of the U.S. military to keep me from possessing that which has left me the monstrosity I am. Before we wrap up the ride banter, there's one more thing. What's that? Those kids you left rotting in the desert. <laughs> Insignificant in the larger picture. Which is what again? Why, my own immortality, of course. He who has the device could be capable of ruling the world. Now I know you've seen too many movies. Crumman made a subtle hand movement in the shadows. It's you or me. The device will be taken. And tonight, there's nothing you can do to stop that from happening. Bolin felt it in the air. Without looking away from Crumman, he raised his subgun in the direction of the black suit, who, of course, was now reaching for his Beretta. <laughs> Bolin swung the subgun toward the shadow behind the tinted barrier. <laughs> this glass is bulletproof! Not a problem. I have a few grenades I could dump inside. You... Maybe I'll just burn you out from behind your shield. Rip off that visor. I understand your eyes are real sensitive to light. <sighs> You're a cold bastard. That's me, Mr. Insensitive. Looks like you'll have to drive yourself for a change. Unless you are available? Not for hire. Uh, well, I had 
to try. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. Boland turned and walked past the body, heading for his SUV. It was time to go have a look at the site where it was all going to happen, where the marvel of all time was housed and ready to be sold to enemies of, well, national security. Behind the wheel and rolling across the salt flat, Boland gave the limo one last look. It was still sitting there, a black shimmer in the burning mist, fading rapidly from the soldier's sight as he motored on. Thornton couldn't decide if the wonder device of the ages looked like a giant kid's top or the funnel of a tornado. Sitting at the console in the shadowy lair of his personal control room, he stared at the object of all Kraman's desire on the far monitor. The next two or three hours, getting the device prepared the way he wanted would prove the tricky part. Worst case, he'd put on a spacesuit himself and power it up. But if it came down to that, it would mean that none of the science crew was willing to pump the thing up with radioactive juice, which in itself would mean they were all very much dead. The small nuclear reactor was housed in a special glass-reinforced bay beyond the shiny tornado funnel. The device could remain standing, like now, supported by steel cables, with clamps attached to the disc-shaped head from the reactor. Another monitor showed him the science crew was off in an adjoining room, poring over mathematical and chemical data that was light years beyond him. Numbers and symbols, he thought, that looked utterly alien. And who knew, he thought. Not even he was privy to where the mystery element that powered the thing came from, or how it had fallen into their hands. He did, though, have the clout to engineer his safety net, one of the perks that came as head of special security. He took the disk out of the safe and slipped it into his computer. Thornton punched in a series of codes and passwords only he, as head of special security, knew existed, and he was online. First order of business was to memorize the eight-digit numbers, forward and backward, since to initiate any countdown, he had to run them through both ways. As a precaution to keep the thing from falling into the wrong hands, a miniature radio detonator had been built into the skin of the device. He had the numbers down, the black box in hand, and stowed in his pocket. Kraman, calling back. He had ignored the man two times already, but knew a third silence on his end might scramble the freak to the back door of the facility sooner than he wanted. Yes? Where have you been? I've been busy making the necessary preparations. I need a driver, and now... I'm stuck out here on the salt flat. Even with the windows in my visor, the light is killing my eyes. Slow down, Kraman. Fill me in on your situation. And he did. Belasco again, shooting down his personal chauffeur and bodyguard, driving off and toward the facility, stranding him. I'll send somebody. Thornton intended to let the freak stew and curse the light for a little while before he dispatched a man. It never occurred to Kraman, of course, to endure a little more pain climb in behind the wheel and drive himself. When? Soon. Now. He'll be there. Anything else? Get the chopper ready. When the sun goes down, I want those cultists loaded up and given one last briefing. How many men on your end do you have a firm fix on who will aid us? Well, that was something else I was working on before I was interrupted. Lose the attitude, Thornton. Is that all? For now. And Thornton was grateful for the silence once more. A check of the time, and he knew the 15-man backup was already bust and rolling toward the facility. They should arrive, he figured, in 30 minutes, give or take. He already had their briefing down, how the thing was going to be moved to another facility, that security here had been breached. Most of the ops he knew personally, and believed if the right amount of cash was promised, they'd play ball. For maybe five ops now under the roof were the ones he needed a face-to-face -face with. Thornton decided it was time to have a chat with the head scientist an astronuclear physicist named Anderson. Mr. Anderson? A balding, slight figure in a white lab coat looked up from his work bay. Come to the control center. Now? Right away. He waited, watching while Anderson lingered another moment, then walked out of his bay. Thornton stood, aware that the next few moments were crucial. He slid open the wall to his personal mini-armory and selected an HK MP5 SD3 subgun. The walls to his control center were reinforced steel, soundproof, but he unlimbered the Beretta 92F and threaded a sound suppressor on the muzzle. 
Thornton knew from past experience that when a guy found himself staring down the narrowed black eye of a sound-suppressed weapon, he tended to listen harder. Since the line in the sand was drawn, Bolin didn't much care if they knew he had breached the perimeter or not. He was beefed up with firepower, though, just in case they came charging the hilltop roost where he spied the facilities. The trusty M16 with attached M203 grenade launcher was resting beside the soldier's prone post, 30-round clip in place, with a 40-millimeter frag bomb up the launcher's snout. Lugging the war bag several hundred yards from where he ditched the SUV in a wash to the east was a grueling task. But he couldn't afford to risk finding the war bag liberated from his possession when he returned to the SUV. As soon as the sun began to set, Bolin intended to slip into his own black suit, weighted down with enough party favors to entertain one and all. A battle he intended to wage on his terms, time, and place. Sipping from his bottled water, the soldier gave the lay of the land a search in all directions with his field glasses. It was broken ground, cut by gullies and washes, studded with cactus and littered with rocks and boulders. If there were high-tech surveillance devices in the vicinity, he hadn't spied them out. It didn't mean they weren't there. No posted signs authorizing use of deadly force, either. Two facilities had been built into the hills down in the valley. The larger of the two was due north. It looked like a giant silver dome. Constructed, it appeared to be part of the hill chain. Only one way in and out that he could see, straight through the dome. There was a conspicuous lack of activity in that direction, despite the grounded black chopper and five vans near the dome. Were they inside, watching him, planning their next lethal move? Let them come, he decided. The sooner the better. The more he took out of play before night, the merrier. Panning on, he searched the hills, framed shiny vents and fat smokestacks rising from the ridge. Air shafts for a ventilation system. No doubt a generator inside, probably a nuclear reactor below ground. That meant any number of levels of floors, a whole maze of interlocking holes. The sister facility was a smaller dome due west. One black van, again no sign of life. He gave Kraman a brief moment of consideration. It might have been a simple bloody task to have burned the creature out of his shield, chop him down in a hail of bullets, but Bolin figured that where Kraman went next was where the action would unfold. Lowering the binoculars, Bolin detected distant movement in the corner of his eye. He slid up, crouched, then moved deeper down the narrow cut in the hill for concealment. Adjusting the binocs, he lined up two town cars, several hundred yards off and heading his direction. No tinted glass, Nevada plates, but it appeared five figures were packed into each luxury vehicle. From their slow run across the tabletop, he knew they could make out his SUV down in the wash. Now what? M-16 leading the way, the soldier hauled up his war bag and set off down the slope. Do you understand what you are proposing? Do you even begin to comprehend the risk involved? Thornton felt himself coiling up as he leaned back in his swivel chair. He felt a muscle in his arm twitch next. The Beretta so close, with Anderson standing a few feet away, staring at him as if he were insane to even contemplate such a recipe for disaster. Let me understand this. You want to power it up to a level 10 readiness? For full maneuvers. The mother of all test flights, if you will. And by 2200 hours? Those are my orders from back east. Now passed on to you. He pointed to the red phone, the hotline to their man at the Pentagon. You want to make the call yourself to confirm it, or do I simply relieve you of your duty now? Your choice. For one thing, it's stretching our resources alone simply to see that it's up to level 10 within the time frame we're allotted. Then you're wasting precious time pacing around here. <sighs> the element is of a very unstable nature, my friend. Try to understand our position, which is that our very lives are in grave danger if we go as far as you want. Once the element is infused with radiation and it is pumped into the device, well, we don't know exactly what could happen, say, if it decides to take off on its own, perhaps reaching hypersonic speed in seconds and end up hovering in the skies as far away as Maine. The core of element-fused nuclei acts as its own regenerating and self-sustaining source of power by, we believe, an ongoing splitting of atoms, a process we still don't understand. 
In other words, it acts as a continual but self-contained nuclear implosion. Constant critical mass, how should I say, only appeased, it would seem, by the element itself, which somehow keeps it from detonating into an explosion of unfathomed power, which could combine both a nuclear blast and the spread of the element in a wind of radioactive fire. And if that happens, not even we can predict the outcome. At the very least, I'm concerned about a repeat disaster, such as the tragic incident which befell my now-dead colleagues. We've fixed that problem. Yes, added a few monitors to tell us if the element is leaking. Only by then, it would still most likely be too late. Not only that, but since the element is stored in the other facility, it has to be carefully shipped here to even begin to You're wait. wasting time. Are you going to do it or not? Anderson hesitated, shaking his head. I'm the only one with the sufficient expertise to pull it off. That's a yes, then. Yes. You're dismissed, but remember, I'll be watching you. Thornton saw a new look of doubt and suspicion in the eyes behind the glasses. What? I should confirm this with General... But... Thornton grabbed up the phone. Let's see how he feels about you wasting his time. Anderson held his ground, thinking about it, then shook his head. Let it be on record, I am opposed to this. Duly noted. Something goes wrong, it's my ass they fry back at the Pentagon. Anderson held his ground, a grim smirk on his face. If there's anything left to fry... Thornton took the small remote, hit a button, and released the lock on the steel door. Anderson left, looking to Thornton as if he had just aged another ten years. Now to start finding out who was with him and who was against him among his own ranks. Thornton slid the Beretta free, resting it on the console for easy access. Olin followed the wheezing and the huffing coming up out of the wash to a point where he found himself on the lip, looking down on their rear, roughly a hundred paces out. The executioner dropped behind a boulder, then brought the M-16 around the edge. He counted ten of them, wandering around his SUV, peeking inside, inspecting the front-end damage. Well, this is his SUV. No shit, Gino. Banged up like the spoke said. So where the hell is he? How the fuck should I know, Donnie? Let's spread out and go find him. Big guy, big guns. Yeah, so the spook said. What if it's more than one guy? What if it is? There's ten of us. All right. The executioner pulled out two more rounds from his war bag, another frag bomb and a buckshot round for the M203. So, now what, boss? We go traipsing all over the desert looking for some guy we've never seen? Hey, we'll do whatever it takes. I'm not leaving without that asshole's head in a sack. Enough. Bolin had the gist of it. He couldn't pin down the accents, but they sounded Midwest. Probably Chicago. And Bolin knew mob when he saw it. Clearly, they were city boys, probably accustomed to rolling out of bed at the crack of noon. Gone soft. They had broken out the heavier hardware from opened trunks, and he could bet they hadn't come all this way to pack it up at the first sign the going would get tough. Subguns and assault rifles, even wielded by subpar talent, could prove deadly enough. To a fancy shirt, they had an automatic weapon, with sidearms either openly displayed or bulging under silk jackets. Once again, Bolin figured Thornton had contrived a wild card factor to do his dirty work. The executioner knew his ancient war against the Mafia hadn't, of course, wiped the scourge of organized crime off the American landscape. Most of the old dinosaurs were pretty much, however, extinct by now. A few ancient dons were still creaking around, barely holding on against the conniving rat packs under their own roofs, with feds planted on their doorsteps around the clock, and the new breed of up-and-comers who were pretty much all show and little go, waiting for the old men to finally croak. Yes, Bolin had blazed through their ranks long ago, kicked enough ass to send them into bloody disarray. But they said cockroaches would be the only survivors of a full-scale nuclear holocaust. The analogy here was obvious. Second thought. Let's go take a ride around these hills, boys. The executioner slipped his finger through the trigger of the M203. The pack was splitting up, huffing and puffing back for the vehicles. He folded back into cover of the boulder, in case a couple of pairs of nervous eyes darted his way before he was ready to unload. A few more seconds, riding out the wait, and Bolin would introduce himself. 
Whew, holy fuck, it's hot out here. Could really go for a brew right about now. Whew. Hey, Gino, prostitution's legal in this state, isn't it? How far are we from Reno? The old instincts warned Leonetti they were being watched. The HK-33 assault rifle was up and fanning the ridge lines on both sides of the wash. Nothing he could see up top. The sun hammered down, dropping a shimmering curtain in his eyes. Forget hearing any movement, such as a shoe-scuffing rock or a sharp intake of breath, since his soldiers were babbling now among themselves, huffing about like old women. It didn't make sense to Leonetti. He pulled up short of the lead town car, looking around. Why would the guy just abandon his SUV? Unless he knew he was being followed, spotting them on his tail earlier, on foot now, obviously. Circling in from behind? Gino, Petey, Donnie, hold up. What is it, boss? Keep your voices down. Leonetti was sure he'd just seen movement, up there, along the top edge of the rock wall, at some point off to the rear of the second town car. It was a blur, maybe the sun and the heat playing tricks on his eyes, but he'd swear a figure had just melted the cover behind a fat rock above them. Okay, this is what we're going to... And then his grim suspicion became a horrifying reality. The figure popped up over the rock like something in a carnival, a massive weapon in his fists. The old instincts told Leonetti to hit the deck, but the legs wouldn't respond to the warning cry in his head. It was like one of those bad dreams where the feds were chasing him, but he was paralyzed. He got some much unwanted help in the next instant as the explosion tore through a few of his soldiers near the second town car. The shockwave reached out, a giant fist, hurling metal and wet pieces of flesh in his face. Ugh. Leonetti squeezed his eyes shut out of instinct, his ears full of thunder and the screams of his men carved up by flying shrapnel. Before he knew it, he was on his back, but he was still breathing, and now he was really pissed. Clearly, Shadow Man had been right all along. The guy, Velasco, was up there, ready to stick it to him again. God damn it! Where the hell are they? I've got a roast out here in this fucking inferno. <laughs> Croman cursed everything and everyone under the sun, especially the sunlight. He had no more pills, no water at any rate to swallow one even if he did. And where the hell was Thornton's rescue? Oh, but he intended to see Thornton pay for this humiliation, leaving him stranded like this. The bastard was safe and smug, probably cooling off at the facility, even chuckling over his predicament. Crumman would fix him in due course. He had planned to anyway, once the backup unit from the east was on hand tonight. Thornton didn't know it yet, but Crumman had been sent along an envelope with cash and note, unsigned, that simply stated for them to be prepared when they were called to act. Thornton would think they were more NSA black ops, arriving at the site to beef up depleted guns. Thornton was in for a very rude awakening. But first, Crumman had to get out of there. Panic set in next. And steam, he saw, was hissing from under the hood. The air conditioning died next, and Crumman oh, cried God. out in horror. Oh, God. No. He would no. have to get out no. now or suffocate. He would have to walk, but he feared he would die from the first few steps he ventured across the salt flat, the sun burning up his brain. Visions of shooting down Thornton and Belasco stoked his rage and terror. He was shaking now, balled up against the door, curling up into a fetal position. Mr. Crawman! One of Thornton's men. Could he see inside through the tinted glass? See him blubbering, the great man with the plan? No, of course not. Crawman realized he was hyperventilating, unable to respond as the man kept hitting the window, calling his name. Thornton was a dead man, he decided. But first, the device. Once he had that in his hands... Mr. Crawman! Somehow he found his voice. <laughs> Pull your van up alongside the door. He would have to step out into the light, no matter what. Yes, sir. Hurry, this side, the driver's side. He tried to steel himself, pull it together. He had to appear strong, in control once the door was opened. He saw the van's shadow falling over the well. He sucked in a long breath, felt some composure returning, the shaking in his limbs fading a little. Escape, relief was coming. First, he needed to fight his way through the goddamn light.
Thornton hit the button on the metal box that would carry his voice to the intercom beside the door outside in the hall. It's open, Benson. He kept his back turned as the man entered. Sir, we have a situation in the East Quadrant. Close the door, Benson. Thornton knew all about the situation. Velasco was kicking ass again, only this time in living color on a monitor to his right. That wasn't the work of any Justice Department issue. The guy winging down a grenade into the pack of mobsters, bowling down three right off the bat. But Thornton already knew the guy was far more than he claimed. Sir, security is being violated. The manual states that we must initiate immediate and decisive action in the event of an armed intruder. Also, sir, I and a few others have questions about procedures the past two days. Names. Sir? Who is doing all this squawking? Why, I, I wouldn't call it that, but, well, Matthews, Thomas, and Corley. We have some questions. You're dismissed, Benson. Sir? Oh! Before the body even hit the floor, Thornton was up and dragging the corpse to the corner of the room. Three were down. The second 40mm frag projectile was dumped into the M203's black hole, and Bolin rose over the boulder, sweeping them with a long burst of auto fire. The Aloha Shirt Convention was gathering some speed when the first line of 5.56mm lead hosed a slab of human flesh. Too beefy and too slow to ever have a hope in hell of beating the warrior's tracking line of fire. The survivors darted for cover behind the front ends of the luxury rigs, subguns spraying and praying to cover their flight. A fresh clip cracked home, a few heads popped up over the front end, and shaky hands winging off more wild rounds from subguns, and Folan went back to work with the M16. They came close, three or four rounds snapping the air around Bolin, when he turned both town cars to ventilated scrap. The wall of Bolin's flying lead raked the luxury vehicles, stem to stern. They could run and hide, but no one was leaving. Glass took to the air in sheets, and countless gleaming shrapnel bits. A howl or two of pain as he either clipped another shooter with lead, or someone received a glass facial. Tires blew under the onslaught, a radiator erupting in a hissing white cloud. Before the rigs flattened out, Boland pumped off another 40mm round, dropping the projectile into the closest hunk of metal. The fireball belched out the doors, blew the roof into warped tin. And it appeared to the soldier they didn't know what to do next. They were like mannequins, frozen and gawking at the horror of it all, even as the world was blowing up in their faces. The thundering shockwave had kicked one shooter off to the side, the vehicle jumping up in the air before it settled back on limp tread with a pounding crunch. The fuel line had to have been punctured by either the blast or all the lead he'd poured over the vehicles, but a secondary explosion ignited. He took a moment to get his bearings the lay of the land down the top edge of the wash. It rose in broken humps and jags, perfect to shield his move toward their rear. The way they'd suddenly gone silent and still, hugging cover, told the soldier he'd have to go down there now and root them out anyway. Four fancy shirts left. He could have burned up another 40 millimeter round or two, but wasn't sure what he'd be facing later and needed to be conservative. He was never afraid to do things the hard way if it came down to that. Bolin crouched, advancing the few steps up the narrow gully cut into the near vertical face. He risked leaving the war bag behind, simply to lighten his load, opting instead for speed to wrap this up ASAP. On his way out, he spotted the eye of the camera, buried in the ground. He couldn't be sure, but he hoped Thornton was watching the show. The executioner threw a mock salute to the camera, then set off to wrap up the mock convention. The big badass had some pair on him. Thornton had to give the guy that much. Yeah, fuck you too, soldier. Thornton returned the salute with his middle finger before the bastard vanished off the screen. If the Don was dead, Thornton couldn't tell. And what did it matter anyway? The camera showed the flaming heap, the smoking bodies. At last count, he knew six of Chicago's meanest were out of the picture. Meanest? That was a joke. He might as well have recruited soccer moms. While whoever was left standing, or hiding, which was more likely the case, Thornton figured Belasco was moving out to come in on their rear, tie up the package up close and personal, maybe grill one of the goons. 
Not that it mattered if one of the Chicago hitters filled Belasco in on what little they knew. Thornton knew he was next on the bastard's shopping list. At least, he saw the science detail was decked out in hazmat suits, starting the process of pumping the radiation laced with the element into the device. Another lead bin of the element was now being slowly driven from the sister site. Garner was patching through. He was one of the few ops on site that Thornton could trust to help him seize the device. Even in the spook world, Thornton knew money talked. It was something of a plus that more than a few of the ops now on the way to beef up the numbers were either former NSA assassins or had sold their services around the world as soldiers of fortune. He knew they would prove themselves loyal in the end to the hand that fed. Whether their cut came out of his pocket or Crommon had to cough up a few dollars more. Sir, what about the situation in the East Quad? Let it be. Sir? Let it be. I want you in the briefing room in 20 minutes. He heard Corley's voice over the speaker next. Here, sir. Thornton let them in. The trio marched into the room. Close the door, Corley. What's that smell? By the time Matthews spotted the heap of his fallen comrade in the far corner, Thornton had the sub gun up. <coughs> <coughs> Where the hell is he, boss? How the fuck should I know? Vince Leonetti didn't know much at all right then, except that all four of them were in a world of hurt. For the first time he could remember, he was, in fact, clueless, and very much afraid of dying. And one bastard had done all this? The stink of Marino's toasted skin was swelling up the nausea in the Don's belly as he fisted the sweat out of his eyes. He risked a look over the town car's hood, scanning the empty lip of the wash. Nothing. The guy was gone, like a ghost vanishing into thin air. Likewise, it was hard to make out any sound beyond their hiding point, the flames eating up the town car. Fratelli, Donnie, and Bodolico were all sucking wind. Statues of fear. It was unbelievable. It had been a long time since Leonetti had pulled the trigger, granted, but he couldn't have lost this much edge over the span of a few short years. A brief but vivid recollection of all the guys he'd wasted over the years seemed to dance a montage of faces through his head. Rivals, witnesses, snitches, even a cop who wouldn't be bought, and that lawyer who had been more interested in scribbling memoirs than defending him against twenty life sentences. No, he wasn't opposed to taking down a man, armed or in cold blood. But this? Rockets and his own men dropping like dominoes under precision auto fire? This was more like something out of Bosnia or Beirut. He had to make the effort just to remind himself they were in Nevada, the good old U.S. of fucking A. And that, as far as he could tell, they were up against only one man. Jesus. Some feral rage, perhaps brought on by sheer panic, had Fratelli swinging up the Mac-10 to bear on Boland's SUV. What are you doing? Leonetti swatted the muzzle away. You plan on walking all the way back to Reno, numbnuts? Leonetti grasped his HK-33 tighter, the assault rifle feeling unusually heavy, as if it wanted to slide right out of his sweaty palms. He checked the jagged slope, a narrow gully running up the side for the top east edge. A plan came to him. No way would he sit there and wait for the bastard to come to them. Okay. We're going up top, that way. Gain the high ground. That's how the bastard took the edge in the first place. They didn't look convinced it was that simple. Get your thumbs out of your asses and let's go. The Don had spoken, and Leonetti was breaking cover, leading the charge for the high ground, when all hell broke loose again. The flaming purple shirt with the Mac-10 would have spotted him on the advance to their rear if the boss hadn't stepped in, concerned about the only available ride out. The executioner surged past his SUV and started round two. Holding back on the M16's trigger, he nearly made it a clean sweep. They were breaking out in a sluggish, staggered line, going for an opening, a way out of the wash. Boland chopped the first mobster to shreds, then tracked on. Two subguns and one HK-33 were swinging around, a last-ditch gasp on their part to draw blood. Boland showered them with lead, eating up the silk shirts. Number eight was spinning on his heels, snarling out the venom but tumbling out of play, 
when Bolin adjusted his aim. Up close now, Bolin put a name on the face of the white-haired man. Vince Leonetti had escaped the executioner's brand of justice over the years, more out of luck and a conflict with Bolin's own busy schedule than anything else. Funny how things happened, though, Bolin thought. Whether it was pure accident or misguided sense of loyalty to protect the boss, but another shooter who'd seen one too many buffets shuffled into Bolin's line of fire. The executioner beat a sidestep out of the blazing lead rain, rounds slashing the air he just vacated. Shooting from the hip, Bolin stitched him, crotch to sternum. The Don nosedived out of sight into a rocky gully. Ah, fuck! The executioner heard the Don throwing out vicious curses between ragged gasps. Bolin moved in behind the shield of fire, angling down the burning town car to bring the man into sight. The Don started triggering wild bursts from cover, winging bullets down the wash. It was blind panic, pretty much, but that didn't make the man any less dangerous. Okay, Bolin decided, the hard way. So be it. There was a sudden lull in the shooting, the Don probably weighing his options. Less than zero. Let's go, Vince. I don't have all day to play games. Leonetti froze. He nearly laughed out loud in bitter spite at those words. The bastard made it sound as if he had a busy day ahead of him, that this was just some poor man's skirmish, an irritating diversion against a few punks with guns. Made it sound that he should walk right out of there and take it like a man. And how the hell did he know? He struggled onto a knee, the assault rifle up and ready again, his eyes burning from sweat but trying to focus on any movement beyond his perch. A piece of flesh was missing from his right arm, blood running freely. Who the hell are you? If he got the guy talking again, there was a chance he could cap off a burst. Nail the bastard from where the voice sounded. You with Bartlett? I'm with me. The man said you took my money. The man lied to you. You telling me I've been set up? More like used to do his dirty work. What? He's got my money? There is no money, Vince. There's just you, me, and a con job you fell into. The man sees you as disposable. The mobster pinned the voice to the tall shadow, rising up out of nowhere. Leonetti was sweeping the assault rifle around as the guy appeared, as if by magic, on the other side of the fire, devouring the town car. Before he even pulled back on the trigger, Leonetti knew it was over. <laughs> Bolin walked up, confirmed it was over with a nudge to the ribs. There was nothing in the eyes but frozen rage. The question now was, would the black ops agents use the time he'd burned up on the mob party to scramble the troops? After slapping a fresh clip into his M16, another 40 millimeter hell bomb down the M203's chute, Bolin made swift progress out of the wash. Topping out, he scanned the open ground around the two facilities beyond a rolling stretch of broken tableland. All quiet, all still, and it felt all wrong. They had circled the wagons, hunkered down inside, sitting tight, waiting for the night's big show. He moved down the lip, setting off to retrieve the war bag. Other than waiting for night to come, Bolin figured there wasn't much he could do but ride it out. If they came for him, fine. If not, the executioner would go inside. One way or another, he would be there when Kraman came to take the device. The curtain had dropped on the slaughter show, the Don long since on his way to the other world. Now, what Thornton couldn't figure was what the hell Belasco was up to next. The guy was out there, taking a casual drive, then a stroll on foot around the far perimeters. The bastard was hardly ready to break out the picnic basket and champagne. He was out there looking for openings, any weakness in defenses, hoping to get a fix on the numbers of shooters inside. Well, there was only one way the bastard could get inside, and that was straight through the front door. Perhaps that was exactly what Belasco intended. A full charge right up the gut, blasting his way in, shooting up the facility. That should be a suicide move, but wherever he walked, Belasco was like some lightning rod of death and destruction. Thornton was nearly ashamed of himself for having so underestimated the man's martial talent, or placing too much faith in the hands of clearly marginal skill. The Trojans and the Chicago gangsters never stood a chance. 
Oh well. Live and learn. Traman was on the handheld radio once again. He had almost forgotten all about the freak, having ordered the operative he had dispatched to round him up simply to take him to his mobile home, sit on him. And what could Kraman do about it? Since he deemed himself too good to drive his own car and couldn't possibly walk around in the sun, Thornton snapped up his handheld radio, sniffing the air. The bodies in the room were starting to get a little ripe. Yes? When this is finished, you and I are going to settle up. Thornton, you aren't in charge of this, do you hear me? Aye, aye, loud and clear. Don't patronize me. There's something you should know. Let me guess. You have Belasco perched on your doorstep. That was exactly what Thornton saw on the monitor. The guy was parked on a ledge in the neighborhood of a quarter mile south. Just standing by, waiting for the night to come. A lion ready to pounce. I scrambled the backup unit. So, you're thinking ahead and about what we must do. Good. I'm keeping the shipping procedure to myself for the time being. Just have it ready at the gate to be choppered out. When our stooges go in and the shooting starts, with Belasco still lurking around, I've arranged an alternative to move the device. Oh, and Thornton, I expect to see that chopper in my yard as soon as the sun begins to go down. Roughly an hour from now. Don't force me to drive myself there. It's your show. Indeed it is. Thornton stood. The idea was to use the cultists to round up, then mow down the science detail and the civilian labor force. Once Nellis came here to investigate, a fair amount of the blame could be laid on the cultists. That much made sense to Thornton. By the time the special investigative detail from Nellis sifted through the wreckage, ID'd all the bodies, discovered the wonder toy of the ages was missing, Thornton would be well out of the country, with money in his pocket and a load of cash socked away in an overseas numbered account. There was a sweet and promising future to look forward to. Tahiti sounded pretty good. Or Thailand. Some place far away where there were no Cromans or Belascos. Garner patched through. Sir, the backup team has just arrived. About time, Thornton thought, moving for the door. The first string, the heavy hitters, were finally pulling up to the gate. The bus was a Black Mariah, the sort of rig they used to haul convicted felons to prison. Bolin watched, curious, as the bus pulled up and Thornton stepped through a narrow slat in the dome to greet the new arrivals. The windows were, he noted, black-tinted, so he could forget about getting a clear early head count on the number of new shooters. M-16 in hand, the soldiers strolled down along the ridge, cutting the gap until he could start counting heads at a closer angle as they disembarked. Two hundred and some yards closer, and he used the field glasses. One by one, they stepped off the bus. He framed Thornton in the glasses, the guy actually looking his way, and Bolin half expected the middle finger salute. The eyes may be hidden by dark shades, but there was no mistaking the new look of confidence radiating from Thornton's expression. A few heads among the black-suited crew turned in Bolin's direction. These guys had hair, some beards and stubble, a mustache or two, an eye patch on one guy, dark shades all around. They looked more like felons on work releases than the clean-cut black ops Bolin had seen up to then. More like mercenaries. Fifteen in all. Stone-cold killers. They lugged large black nylon bags, bulging with the heavy stuff Bolin could well guess they were anxious to use. The executioner considered dumping a 40-millimeter charge into the ranks then passed. Soon. The sun was waning, shadows already reaching dark skeletal fingers over the valley. When darkness fell, he would walk down into the valley of death. Thornton smiled. He had to believe that these badass saviors would lead him out of the dark tunnel. Carey, Jones, Barlow, and McMurtry piled out and fell in. It was good to see these men again, aware of the reputations that preceded them. They had done wet work, he knew, in places like Beirut, Damascus, Angola, and Myanmar, just to name a few third-world hellholes where life was cheap. These were the best guns money could buy. They had also been used before, Thornton knew, in various black projects, as a last resort. Emergency muscle. And the word failure wasn't in their manual. Bags were dumped, a few cigarettes going up with the touch of a lighter. Thornton nearly felt like a proud papa. Then the clean-up boss of bosses rolled off the bus last. 
He was muscled, a mop of shoulder-length white hair like a halo in the fading sunlight. Stubble on the chin, his face looked carved by a hatchet, sharp and angry, a couple of scars along the jaw where he had taken some shrapnel or flying lead. And he was known in black ops circles as Mr. 71. The floating rumor was the man had, a few years back, engaged in a running bet with another operative. The game, Thornton had heard, was to see who could break the old record of the wet work body count, reportedly 66 confirmed kills. The scuttlebutt was the other op was ahead by two bodies, one kill from tying the old record, when he had a strange and sudden accident in the Sudan. Something about a boating mishap on the Nile. Due to a few roving, hungry crocodiles, the body was never found. Or so the story went. Mr. 71 didn't play to lose. Gentlemen, glad you could make it. 71 fired up an unfiltered cigarette, stepping down from the bus. I trust a little R&R &R has got the batteries recharged. They were too busy watching the big shape of Belasco on the rise. The guy sure as hell wasn't too concerned about not being seen. 71 blew smoke back at Thornton. <sighs> Who is that? That, Mr. 71, is the problem. The cigarette nearly disappeared in one massive intake of smoke. 71 pitched the butt away, then reclaimed his bag. Not anymore. The onset of twilight brought the anticipated activity down below. It looked low-key at first, but Boland saw a few of them moving with a sense of urgency. The executioner had donned a black suit and was harnessed and buckled, weighted down with enough grenades and spare clips to tackle big numbers. Ready to rock. Thornton and the white-haired gargantuan came out of the dome. The rotors were spinning to life, but Thornton was waving two black-suited gunners into the belly of the black chopper. Apparently, he was staying behind to guard the lair. Why? And where was the bird headed? Winged pylons showed the soldier that rockets were housed, and Bolin figured there was a machine gun or two in the nose turret. The executioner took up position on the far side of the SUV, lifting the M16-M203 combo. It wouldn't take much effort on the part of the flyboys to blow him off the hill, and if they started his way, nose down, he'd have no choice but to fire off a 40mm round. Figuring the black chopper was armor-plated, he decided one well-placed round to the tail rotor would do the job nicely. And there was still no sign of Kraman. The bird lifted off, Thornton and the big guy holding their turf in front of the dome. Moments later, Bolin saw the chopper streaking over the desert, eastbound. Now what? Rounding up Kraman? Was Thornton hoping he'd follow the black chopper? But Bolin was staying put. Bolin dug in just the same, alert for any movement around the compass, any shadows headed his way. The darker it got, the closer it came to showtime. I appreciate the cash incentive we've been receiving. Money's always nice. It's what makes the world go round, according to Candor and Ebb. There were a couple of disturbing revelations there that caught Thornton by surprise, but he kept the puzzled look off his face. Someone else had been sending along this monetary incentive on the sly, and just as startling, 71 was into show tunes. Since Thornton hadn't been sending the money, it had to be Kraman. This latest maneuver by the freak, and behind his back, started nagging Thornton with two concerns, feeding doubt that he was meant to see his own payday. One, Kraman had already reached out to the heavy hitters, greasing the skids, buying their loyalty, perhaps ready to make the announcement at a critical juncture that he was their bank of Project Orion. Two, Kraman had to have already received a down payment for the device from the foreign subcontractors, all along holding back any cash advance from Thornton, the man who had the power to facilitate his plans from the inside. Sneaky freak bastard. You know what to do? Hard to believe one guy has kicked all the ass you said he has. I showed you the man's work on the video. Believe it. The guy's been a major pain in the ass. Real Rambo shit. Rambo was a pussy. Right. Soon as the chopper drops off half the cult nut jobs at the sister site, believing they're free to take some of the super tech for themselves, 
I'll send four of the boys out to say hello to our Mr. Sunshine. Last thing I want is some wild card fucking things up when we've got a busy night ahead of us. This is Crommon's gig for the most part. We follow orders, get the thing in the chopper. There's going to be shooting. Chaos out the wazoo when we let the wackos in to hold down their part of the game plan. Huh. Cannon fodder to take care of all non-essential personnel. I like it. Then what? Crommon can't really intend to let the cult freaks in on the story, the NSA's cosmic water gate. That's where you step in and fill in the blanks for the wackos. Uh, lambs to the slaughter. But Thornton had to wonder who the lambs were really going to be when the slaughter began. He didn't want to even consider it, but he hoped to hell 71 wasn't underestimating Belasco's threat. Failure couldn't be an option here. Failure meant he was dead, and Crommon was skipping off to the wild unknown, the marvel of humankind in tow. Thornton caught 71 throwing him a glance. <laughs> Lighten up. The party's just about to start. This was the night Jason Nixon knew his destiny would be fulfilled. He led the other world following outside, held up the hand free of the M16 to signal they should stop, allow him this moment alone. He stepped into the white beam, raised his face toward the epicenter of the light. It was a warm shroud, the light calling down to him with silent words of encouragement and approval, ready to uplift and transform his earthly flesh and take him away to immortality. Soon, he would know what the gods did. It was only the expected chopper, of course, not the chariot of fire, he remembered, but the experience was similar to the sighting he'd encountered in the California desert. A dark, silent mass floating down from the heavens, a blinding white light washing over his vehicle. Back then, he recalled, there was a static burst over the radio, a whine that pierced his senses like a swarm of hornets in his ears, then his Lexus had died suddenly, everything shutting down. Here and now, the grit slashing his face was an annoyance, nearly snatching away the grand moment, but he knew he was a man of the ages just the same, poised at the gates of knowledge itself. The loud noise in his ears was also nothing like the silence of the gods, he recalled, but this moment was surely the signal from the others, the chopper coming down to scoop them up. They were on their way, the gods were simply using the enemy to show him the mother of all truths. Take me away! I am ready! I am your servant! Then, just as it happened on that earlier occasion, the light died, leaving him to wonder at the darkness and the silence, ponder exactly what he had seen. The man-made craft settled on its landing skids, all swirling dirt and ungodly noise. The albino creature nearly stumbled out of the black hole, walking quickly up to Nixon's face. Let's go. I hope you know how to use those weapons. Oh, ye of little faith. Spare me. Get your people inside. Nixon turned and waved the assault rifle. One by one, his people boarded. Time to go. Do you and your people understand what it is you are supposed to do? But of course. And you, sir, have made certain promises to be met when we fulfill our obligation. I intend to deliver. You'll get the truth. It is why we are prepared to do your bidding. Even if that means killing anybody you are ordered to. Especially so. Evil walks at this place. I and my people are in agreement that the tools of the greatest government military conspiracy of all time must be destroyed if the truth is to be made known. Whatever floats your boat. The big event started to go down as soon as the chopper landed at the smaller dome. Bolin took a read of the flurry of activity at both sites. The black-suited barbarians were at the gate at the main facility, armed with subguns, decked out in full battle regalia. One of the vans pulled out and began rolling away from the motor pool to cut a hard path on through the valley. Full-blown night had settled over the facilities, but a cyclops beam of white shone just above the domes. The van appeared to be beating an intercept course to greet the black chopper's return. Bolin's bold stance was something of a double-edged sword. Since the enemy knew exactly where he was, the chopper had veered far to the north before flying on for the sister facility. 
The Flyboys, he had to believe, were under orders to stay well away from any projectile Bolin could fire to bring the works down. The chopper, then. That was how they planned to move out the device. Which meant moving in on foot. No problem. That was part of the soldiers' plan anyway. He had to figure Crommon was now on board the chopper, but who were the new players dropping into the fold? Ten or so armed shadows were leaping out of the chopper, into the rotor wash, charging the dome. Bolin switched his field glasses to infrared. Except for the assault rifles and subguns, the new batch looked more like civilians than soldiers or assassins. Okay, the UFO bunch. But why would Crommon or Thornton bother fielding a ragtag army like that? Simply more guns to throw into the mix? Stack the odds more on their side? Help move the device? He didn't know how big or heavy the Supertech Marvel was, but maybe Crommon and Thornton were looking at the UFO cultists as nothing more than cheap labor. Well, Bolin knew that Crommon wouldn't stoop to thrusting himself into all-out battle. No, he would stay perched on the sidelines, pulling the strings, getting the device hauled out and loaded up. And since Thornton never strayed more than a few feet beyond the dome, a small gathering of his new shooters by his side, Bolin strongly suspected the device was stashed in the main facility. Game time. The warrior would have to chance leaving behind the war bag. If what he was taking to the show wasn't enough to bring down the roof, he'd be dead anyway. The mini Geiger counter fixed to his harness would aid his penetration of the facility, steering him clear of any hot zones. When the shooting started, however, it was a safe bet not too many folks would be concerned about a little radioactive dust. He almost missed the first shooter. Bolin was moving out to parallel the east side of the ridgeline and head north. It was incredible, nothing more than a snatched glimpse, one o'clock and rising fast. The figure was barely even a shadow in Bolin's eyes as it boiled up out of a gully spined down the east face. In fact, the black-suited gunner was nearly invisible. I stay with you! Nixon didn't have the time or inclination to bicker with the vagabond. He gave Collins a curt nod as he ordered the last of the chosen ten to jump off. He was beginning to wonder how smart it was to hand an M16 to the man, but there were other matters to be more concerned about. Such as getting into the main facility, living up to their end of the deal, and getting out in one piece. The van is on the way! The rotor wash pounded his senses, and Nixon had to strain to catch the albino's words. Supposedly, the hatchway to the smaller facility was open to allow easy access to the lead-encased vat with the supernatural element that fueled the anti-gravity device. This was part of their earlier agreement. A little something to take home. Fruit from the tree of eternal knowledge. With any luck, Nixon hoped to land himself a segment on the Today Show, trumpet to the whole world he was in sole possession of the truth of ages. And, of course, a highly lucrative book deal. Even the eternal wisdom of the gods had to have a price tag. One man. That's all you get to take to question. The rest of the science detail and all non-essential workers will be executed on the order from my man. Agreed? Yes! And when do you and I have our little chance? When I have the device safely aboard this helicopter. Nixon felt the electric charge of raw energy in the air. He had never fired a shot in anger in all of his life, but he was ready now to do what had to be done. Practicing on beer bottles and cardboard mock-ups, blasting unmoving objects all to hell was one thing. They were going into gun-down, earthbound prisoners. And he had to remind himself the men or women they would be asked to shoot down in cold blood were enemies of the others. The chopper was lifting off. A few more minutes now, Nixon told himself, and they would be inside, closing in on the truth. Had Bolin not moved out when he did, he would have been tagged right out of the gate. As it stood, it was close enough. The tracking line of steel-jacketed hornets buzzing a hot path inches from his scalp. The executioner held back on the trigger of the M16, jacked on adrenaline. The invisible man dropped, his HK subgun flying off into the night. Bolin had earlier memorized the lay of the land running to the main facility. It hardly made his swift charge any easier, up and over broken ground, down into a narrow spine, his eyes scanning the darkness. He heard the bleat of the rotors in the distance, but kept combat senses tuned to another near-invisible threat. How had he missed the shooter leaving the facility? 
The glint of a stainless steel tubular weapon, catching a wink from the Cyclops beam, galvanized Bolin into action. The multi-round projectile launcher was popping off around when Bolin nailed the Shadow Assassin in the chest. Launcher and Hardman shot up straight, then tumbled down the slope. The projectile sailed past Bolin, falling to earth in the distant south. Something warned the executioner to hit the ground. He dropped into a dark bowl. The expected rounds whining off rock never came. Don't shoot, Melasco! It's me! Bring it outside. Five minutes at counting. Take our helpers down below, and I want this done and wrapped in ten minutes. Thornton had taken up turf near the rear of the bus. With Belasco out there, no doubt on the rampage again, cover was the best idea he could come up with at the moment. 71, though, was rolling around beyond the bus, checking the ridge line. The HK MP5 SD3 subgun held in one massive fist. Bring in the chopper, Crumman. No way. If Belasco wings my ride with grenades, the Belasco problem is being taken care of. I've heard that somewhere before. The little freak wasn't about to get out of the chopper, Thornton saw, as the wackos bounded out of the fuselage, came running from a good hundred yards out. The chopper was rising, Crommon bleeding. Go back when the device is outside. Hurry! Where the hell is he? Thornton ignored 71 for the moment, raising Anderson. You have five minutes to finish crating it up. We'll need some help bringing it out. Myself and the others have to decon first. Help is on the way. Thornton severed the connection. A check of his watch and everything was running right on schedule. He turned to three of 71's hitters. Take these cult assholes down below and start bringing it out. But pick four of them and leave them inside the hatch to stand guard. You know what to do. And they did. His earlier briefing successfully communicated. Every move along the way mapped out. Only he had pretty much glossed over the Belasco factor. No sense in pushing panic buttons. 71 and company would think him a coward for messing his britches over one guy. The trio of shooters marched away, he saw, intercepting the cultists. From there on, Thornton knew it would get dicey. There would be squawking and screaming aplenty once the labor force and the science crew began falling under the guns of the murderous civilian radicals. There could be a mass stampede, a blind charge. He'd deal with it. And where the hell was Belasco? 71 had dispatched four shooters to hit the ridgeline and clean up the Belasco mess. He had heard the shooting down there, two explosions rumbling in the distance like rolling thunder. More than just about anything he had craved in his life, Thornton wanted that guy dead. He was moving to the rear of the bus when 71 obviously couldn't wait any longer. Carry Hanks, McMurtry, Stone, report. They didn't make it. Fuck. They call the stuff I Mox. Bolin was a roving human compass, his M16 sweeping the darkness, the slope leading down into the valley, muzzle fanning, 12 to 6 to 12. He waited, heart thumping in his ears as Taggart materialized out of the night. The man gave each of the two new kills a savage kick. Satisfied they wouldn't rise from the dead, Taggart took a few cautious steps closer to Bolin, the man smart enough to keep his HK-33 assault rifle aimed toward the valley. Bolin tossed away the black-suited gunner's radio. A little voice is telling me this is more than just coincidence. <laughs> what you lack in gratitude, friend, you more than make up for in the balls department. Well? You're welcome, Belasco. Again. Bolin lifted the M16, just enough to stop Taggart in his tracks. I followed you, okay? Instead of giving me attitude, you should be thanking me. Those two had you dead to rights. Maybe. See how they smeared themselves with black war paint? The stuff they spray on themselves is odorless, colorless, something like a few police departments now use, mostly SWAT, when they have to batter down a door, charge into a black hole. The stuff deflects light somehow. I had a heat-seeking sensor, but it just barely let me pick them up. Four down. No more on the way for the moment. And now you want to come to the party? No agenda. I like Jim. That simple. I know, I know. If you even see my weapon twitch your way... Then we understand each other. With Taggart up close now, Bolin saw the man was weighted down with combat harness, complete with pouches stuffed with spare clips for the subgun and the holstered sidearm. 
A dozen or so grenades hung on the harness. Bolin figured he could use the extra help when he went into the main facility. So, we do this act together, Belasco? <sighs> Stick with me, by my side, and do what I say. Thornton wouldn't have believed it if he hadn't seen it in the flesh. The first flicker of doubt shadowed 71's face. Those were four of my best hitters. Who is this guy? He's the fucking apocalypse on two legs. <laughs> I like that. So we have a bit of a challenge after all, okay? I see what to do now. We leave the hatch open, let him come in. Chances are he won't even get past the front gate. Forget the desert trash, I'll put a couple of my guys just inside. Now, as I recall, there's a second level hall leading up from the work area. We roll the thing out on a dolly, come up the emergency elevator. If Armageddon Boy gets inside, he'll move ahead, come looking for us. By then, we'll be rolling out past his rear, right out the front gate. Thornton liked the sound of that, but this was about to get real ugly if it didn't completely unravel all the hell in the next few minutes. Crommin out there, calling the shots, the heavy hitters bought and paid for in the freak's pocket. Then the UFO nuts, duped into thinking they were part of the team, marching down below to their own inevitable slaughter. What a mess. Thornton took up his own HK subgun, then trailed 71 toward the hatch, into the light. There was nothing left to do but keep moving. Velasco's luck had to run out sometime. Ernie Collins knew a scam when he saw one. Confidence games normally involved skillful planning, a discerning eye for subtle weaknesses in human nature, and an ability to act. All of which he never much cared to expend that much thought and energy on. So we didn't consider himself a master scam artist. He did, though, give himself some credit for having worked the shrink enough to get his hands on an assault rifle. He was one of the boys. And all hell was set to break loose. The M16 in his hands may be the difference between life and death. His own. Clear and present danger was sure the hell in the air. Weed was stuck for the moment, but he would find a way out of there and run like there was no tomorrow. Once free of the shadow men and the star children, he could at least wander the county, stick the muzzle of his assault rifle in some poor sap's face, relieve the victim of cash, then boogie on in a stolen ride. Hopefully. San Diego sounded pretty good. Close enough to the Mexican border, a few decent Yankee dollars in his pocket, and he could start over. But that was still way in the future. Right now, he was in the middle of the pack, marching down the steel-walled corridor, a view of the universal biohazard sign painted on the glass partition straight ahead. The super-secret house of the truth Nixon so desperately sought didn't look like much at all to Collins, as he frantically racked his brain, searching for some avenue of escape. Steel walls, narrow corridors, a mounted camera here and there. Metal steps taking them to a lower level. Steel doors sealing off whatever lay beyond as the group rolled ahead, led by two grim hard men. They rounded a corner and Nixon started bawling. That's it? It's packed up, hidden. Shut your hole, do your job first. It was the guy from the house. The setup was planned, Collins figured. All the workforce gathered now in some large room that looked more like a rubber pad at the nut house. Except for the few bunks mounted into the walls, a steel table where frightened faces were framed in a glaring white light. A dolly with some big gray box, probably made of lead, was being shouldered by two black-suited men down an adjoining corridor. Help them with that! The hard man from the house barked for a few of the cultists to go help with the chore of pushing the miracle from heaven. I wanted to see it! Not now! Collins felt it all but set to blow up in his face. The project's workforce was here 30 or 35 guys, snapping out the questions. Nixon, he saw, was at the limits of patience. His eyes fired up with a weird light. Good and angry now, as if they had never really planned to clue him in, Collins thought. A look over his shoulder, and he saw three hard men peeling off his rear. To his right, all clear at the moment, there was some sort of thick glass partition leading back to the hall. This game was history, he decided. Nixon and his followers had been led here by their noses, for reasons we didn't care to know. Collins was taking a slow shuffle toward the partition when the sound rolled from up top. 
Someone upstairs was crashing the party. Then the shooting started in earnest. Poland reached a fire point on the dome first. The soldier was taking up cover behind the last SUV in line when Taggart fell in. The former black op was sucking wind. As far as Bolin was concerned, the man could tag along, not that there was much choice. If Taggart had wanted him dead, he'd already passed on two opportunities to put one through Bolin's head. They whipped low around the corners of the hatch. Bolin made his move to start bringing down the house. The executioner aimed the M203 for a gray wall just beyond the shooters as his point of impact. The buckshot round was special delivery. For Boland's purpose at the moment, it was meant to cause a whole bunch of pain and horror. The projectile streaked past the shooters and slammed into the wall. The impact fuse on the warhead exploded the works of countless flying steel mini-razors of flechettes. Bolin dropped a 40-millimeter frag bomb inside the opening of the dome, adding more punch to the mix. Bolin was up and running for the smoke, Taggart huffing on his heels. The op was clearly in sorry shape, drowning his demons with booze for years. The soldier wasn't about to let the man become a liability. He had no time to spare pondering Taggart's condition. Once inside, they were both on their own. The toughest part, Bolin knew, would prove the first breaking charge into the dome. A whiff of the air beyond the slat and his nose was full of a mixed bag of smells. Not even a groan stirring the ripe air. All clear just beyond. After that, Taggart had his flask out, slugged one down the hatch for courage. Ah, SWAT charge. Bolin shot an angry look at the man. Any number of listening devices could be planted in the vicinity, likewise eyes mounted in the rock or the dome. Bolin gestured silently with his hands that he would go first. A high charge, Taggart trailing low and breaking to the left. Bolin filled the M203 with a frag bomb and broke inside, surging past five corpses. No time to question Taggart about the layout. Bolin would have to keep rolling, watching, and shoot down anything that moved into his path. The executioner hit the edge of a rounded wall, a peak beyond. Two, maybe three down there. Bolin plucked a frag grenade off his webbing, released the spoon. Two count, let's roll. Bolin mentally ticked off the numbers, hunched low and sent the lethal egg around the corner in a sideways whip of the arm. He fell back to ride it out. Thornton got the slaughter started. A long sweep of his HK subgun, and the first few bodies were mowed down. 71 jumped into the act next, standing tall and firing away with his own subgun. The cultists had hesitated at first, unsure what was really happening now that the bullets were flying and corpses were tumbling at their feet. But once a few heroes among the work detail figured out they'd been rounded up for a massacre and not for an emergency briefing on a security leak, as Thornton had told them, they started a bulldog charge for the cultists. Sparked by panic, the cultists cut loose with their subguns and assault rifles, hitting the work detail at point-blank range. Bodies were spinning, guys bellowing out the rage and pain. Figures were slipping and sliding as blood rained to the steel floor. Wild auto fire was hammering the glass partition. Thornton glimpsed from his stand inside the doorway, the whole thing groaning, pocked with giant spider webs before a flying body went through it head first. Let's go, 71. They can finish up. Then Nixon was backing out of the riot, Thornton saw, raking his M16 all around, taking out workers and a few of his own people in a blind panic. Wait! Thornton saw they were straining to move the lead container down the hall. It's locked up! The wheels won't turn! They were checking the wheels on a car. A quick check by 71's shooters and they found the wheels weren't locked at all. Ah, shit! The container feels hot! Thornton kept the knowledge to himself. The thing, powered up to level 10 now, was on the verge of acting on its own will. He didn't anticipate this problem, but the thing was caged up in six-inch walls of lead. No way in hell could it break out and fly off for a trip around the Vegas skies. 
Nixon, grab four of your people and help us move this thing out of here. Thornton heard the screams above. Even muffled by steel barriers, there was no mistaking the screams of, once again, men in terrible pain. Velasco. <laughs> that son of a bitch. Thornton stood there, shaking his head. If I had just two guys like that... Thornton, give us a hand with this damn thing. They finally had the container rolling around the corner on the way out. Here, let me give you a hat. Thornton looked over his shoulder from where the guy had run. He recognized the face. The guy Braxton had used as a scout, he figured, had jumped out the window after it was shot to shards, waiting in the hall to make his escape. Just like that, everybody was looking out for number one when the going got rocky. Why not? Thornton stepped back and allowed the man room to join in pushing the unwieldy cart. He needed his hands free for the subgun if Belasco popped in. Check that, he thought. Not if, but when. Three more of the Black Ops were down and out, fragged to hell, when Bolin hit the steel door. What was happening on the other side remained to be seen. The soldier gave the hallway one last check. Clear. Grasping the metal handle, he gave it a twist and cracked it open, braced for the bullets to start flying for his face. Apparently, all hands were elsewhere, engaged in the audible slaughter below. Watch our backs on the way down. Taggart gave the soldier a nod. The soldier hugged the wall, descending the flight of steps, M16 cradled and out front. The camera hung over his head didn't escape notice, but Poland figured whatever was going on beyond the door at the landing had everybody's undivided attention. Through the door, Poland found a roaring gun battle waiting on the other side. It was a one-sided slaughter he walked into, and the cultists were blasting away with auto fire on unarmed men and a few women. Briefly, the warrior pondered the insanity of it all, then concluded this slaughter was orchestrated by Thornton or Crommon, or both. Meant to heap blame on the heads of the cultists when the heist of the device was discovered. Crommon and Thornton had most likely cleared the scene for parts unknown. A quick search of the hallway running parallel to the room where the bloody scam was being acted out, and Bolin found he was in the clear. The cultists seemed caught up in a frenzy of bloodlust, mowing down the few remaining unarmed technicians, oblivious to the arrival of Bolin and Tank. Bolin waited. He hit the dozen or so cultists with a long barrage of auto fire just as their last victim collapsed to the floor. Taggart's assault rifle chimed in, the former op picking out two runners who thought they could dive out the hole where the glass partition had vanished under the original onslaught. He caught them in mid-flight, sending them slamming to the base of the wall as Boland burned out the clip on the final two standing cultists. <sighs> Devious bastard, that Crommon. Crommon conned these slobs to do his dirty work. He's probably... Taggart's skull came apart in a rain of gore. Bring it on! Make it snappy! The house is burning down as I speak! Copy that. We're on the way. Thornton could already picture the freak holding the harness in the doorway, the chopper probably as close as the hilltop above, his big moment of triumph. And once again, Thornton found himself bearing witness to more of Belasco's work. God damn it! 71 was looking more distressed by the minute at the sight of yet more of his best shooters mauled by Belasco's special touch. No matter, 71's ploy seemed to be working if Thornton judged all the shooting coming from below. Velasco was mired down, two of 71's hitters left behind to make sure the cultists finished their butcher's work, as well as mop up any threat following on their tails. Velasco should keep until they were out of here, he hoped. Nixon and another cultist and two of 71's hitters had the big push cart trundling outside when Thornton saw the chopper landing. The loading ramp already built into the aircraft was growing out past the skids on Crommon's push of a button. The man was beaming as he stood in the mall, waving them on, arms outstretched. Hurry up! Come on! Thornton looked back, wondering if their badass pursuer would appear at the last minute. Thornton turned and found Crommon and 71 discussing something as the others strained to shove the container up the ramp. Warning lights flashed in his brain. He could almost read their lips, even as their faces were obscured by a thin, swirling screen of grip. Talking about the money in the mysterious envelopes. Crommon naming a figure, and who else but he could know the amount. 
Thornton cursed himself more than Crommon. Crommon shouted to make sure the punchline was clearly heard over the rotor wash. Thanks for your help, Thornton! Thornton almost beat 71 and the hitters to the punch. The sub gun was up and jumping around in his fists, Thornton winging around the lead, when he felt four, maybe five rounds slam him in the gut, blasting holes out his ribs. Somehow he held on, pitching back through the hatch, sweeping the SMG in a wild hosing. They were scrambling up the ramp, and he heard Crommon's voice. He's history! Forget about him! The lights wanted to fade away, but the burning pain told Thornton he had a few minutes. He was on his back, saw the chopper rising beyond the hatchway, gone. If he could just hold on, he told himself, digging into his pants pocket. Poland didn't know how many shooters were out there in the hall, but knew they'd come rushing any second. Could even feel the living heat, smell the fear beyond the doorway where the dead were cooling off. A heavy blanket of quiet had fallen after their nailing of Taggart, the calm before the next storm. The sound was unmistakable, loud and clear as it hit steel, alerting Bolin a grenade was armed and good to go. Bolin took a shot off to the side, nothing moving yet in front of the gutted window. He flung the M16 low around the edge of the doorway, holding back on the trigger. It was nothing but spray and pray. And he got lucky. Bolin kept pounding out the lead, peering around the corner. Sometimes simple audacity was rewarded by a smiling fate. The steel egg slipped from the hard man's lifeless hand. His expression registered dumbfounded anger as he toppled backward, knees folding. Bolin turned away and hugged the floor. The executioner rose and broke from cover into the smoke. On the fly, past the gruesome remains, which covered a disturbing amount of ground, Bolin found a black-suited gunner holding his face with one hand, the blood running in thick rivulets to the floor. The guy scrambled to grab up the sub-gun. The hall was empty now, but for the dead. His gut and the silence told Bolin it was clear sailing, at least until he got back up top. The same instincts warned the soldier Thornton and crew had slapped together a last-minute plan, using some alternate way to move the device out of the facility. Bolin moved back for the flight of steps. It was too quiet up there, and he feared the worst when he topped out. Just before the shooting started up again, this time around the chopper, the man called Weed dropped behind the laboring pack. They'd been too busy grunting, sweating, and cursing the lead box up the ramp to notice he was slinking away, melting off into the shadows. Ah, so long, have a nice life. Whatever the damn thing they cherished so much really was, he didn't care. They could have it. <laughs> Screw it, and them. He was free and rolling. It was either dumb luck, pure stupidity, or simple arrogance on their part, but he found the keys hanging in the ignition to one of the yes. SUVs. <laughs> Ernie Collins' only concern was getting the hell out of the Valley of Death, out of Nevada. From there on, he would figure it out as he went. He always had. The problem of the moment was the hills, the rough terrain seeming to force him southbound. Then the edge of some godforsaken cut in the land made him hit the wheel to the right, guiding him against his wishes westbound. Then he saw the remnants of the duped, his former compatriots. The other half of Nixon's star children were quickly put behind, though, as the shadows started walking toward the bigger dome, no doubt wondering what the hell all the shooting was about. Screw them, too. Westward now, in the direction taken by the Black Chopper. As soon as the desert hard pan allowed, he would adjust his run away from those people. Things were looking up, the future bright for once, the hard part over. A free ride now, a gun by his side gifts were falling into his lap all over the place, like fucking Christmas. Now, if he could just find some out-of-the-way all-night hole, preferably one attended by a lonely desert rat with a few bucks in his till. Beyond that, there was San Diego. He'd never been there, but he heard it was something of a sweet town if a guy had a few bucks to spare. Pretty much like any place else, only he'd never had those few extra dollars to sample all the good times. He was going to change that. He was sure to run across someone with cash, an ATM card, something to line his empty pockets. He watched as the chopper gathered speed, flying on into the night. It sure looked as if everybody was happy, he thought. 
Every man had what he had come here for. Ha ha ha! Awesome! Ernie Collins rolled on. The good times were as close as tomorrow. Why is it doing that? What the hell's going on, Truman? What is this goddamn thing? Truman jumped back from the container. It was a whisper at first. A dark, laughing voice in the caverns of his head he should recognize but couldn't pin down. The container was strapped to the wall, but the device was banging around in its hole. The lead shield. A soft glow emanated from inside. Kraman felt the nausea swelling his guts. A sickness that went far deeper became more consuming than the affliction he suffered. Why the fuck is it doing that? The cult leader, standing near the open fuselage door, was crying like a panicked child. It was all he could do, but Kraman put some iron into his rubber legs, walking past the container toward the cockpit. They were skimming the desert, no more than 20 feet above the ground, three miles, he figured, from the facility. Another mile or so, and the tractor trailer would be there, waiting to pick up the device. Robert! He nearly puked as the chuckling voice rolled louder in his head. <laughs> telling him he was royally screwed. Thornton. Kraman turned and saw the container start to break free of its restraints. The container lurched, hammered into the man called Nixon, and sent him flying off into the night. Gone and forgotten, the scream whipped off into the dark. All eyes were locked in, laser beams of pure fear aimed at the container. Kraman, what the fuck is happening? 71 lifted his subgun, ready to toss it all away, edged out there beyond terror to murderous impulse. It was a wrecking ball slamming him in the gut as Kraman heard the sob rise from his throat, coming to a terrifying rest in his ears. Thornton! The son of a... What? He did what? Panic rooted Kraman in the cockpit doorway. The surviving cultists, 71 and the hitters, looked like some absurd caricatures in a gruesome cartoon, gaping at him. Is Thornton dead? The container rose on its own, suspended in a white halo a few feet off the floorboard for a stretched second, then pounded down, jostling like some enraged tiger. We shot him. He said to fucking leave the guy, so we did. Then, he might be still... Oh God. Oh God. What? He powered it up to level 10! How do you know? And what the fuck does that mean? I was head of special security, you fool! I had the means to destroy the thing before I was terminated. Now, Thornton... Oh, God. Are you telling me Thornton somehow primed this thing to blow up? And if he's still breathing, he can push the button. Yes, a button! Five kilotons! Nothing but the dead and the damned were waiting for him when Bolin made his way back to the front gate. His M16 fanned the compass, poised for a corpse to rise from the dead. Thornton got shot and bleeding out near the hatch. The light was fading fast in Thornton's eyes, the man sensing Bolin's approach. He rolled over, almost appearing as if he expected him. Bolin froze when he saw the small black box, clutched in Thornton's bloody mitt. <laughs> Hey, you. No surprise. The guy made it sound, Bolin thought, as if in another time, another place, they would have been drinking buddies, trading war stories. The executioner was checking the area, sure a boogeyman or two was ready to come rushing out of nowhere. Then he saw the open elevator car to his right. It was so perfectly built into the wall, it was damn near a magic act. No point now in kicking himself for having missed it on the way in. The device was gone. And then it happened. A blinding light flared beyond the hatch. It was apparent enough Thornton had triggered some doomsday package. Bolin braced himself for the superheated wind, the ride into oblivion that never came, squeezing his eyes shut as the light of some supernova blew beyond the screwed tight cover of his lids. A few eternal heartbeats later, and the light lost some of its intensity.
God. He heard himself oh, crying, God. calling out to a God he had oh, never much God. thought about, much less Have believed in, at day. some distant point beyond the ringing in his ears. Oh, he would never know how he'd been launched, free and clear of the chopper, when the light blew in his face. It didn't matter now. Croman was blind, and the pain was a living fire racing through his body. He staggered about, heard a pitiful wail somewhere in the dark. Oh, God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, 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 Who's there? Oh, help me. Please, help me. Was there anybody out there? Croman felt his hands reaching out, groping in the blackness. Who was that? He recognized the voice. Nixon. Here. I'm over here. He stumbled ahead, focused on the crying man. Bolin hit the first trio of living dead with a sweeping burst from the M-16. Moving on, he nailed another staggering shadow in the chest, then got his bearings. Whatever the nature of the explosion or the device, Bolin wasn't expecting answers. Thornton had touched off the explosion, a planned stab in Crommon's back if it looked as if the man was going to leave him high and dry, which was exactly what Crommon had done. The blast had left behind blinded zombies, those cultists or black ops agents who had gone to the secondary dome for whatever reason. They were crying out for answers and for deliverance all over the valley. A couple voices were even raised toward the heavens, calling out to God for help. The executioner looked at the halo of bluish-white light, a static charge of lightning breaking out from the shining umbrella to the west, now looking more like the spool of a great tornado. Before venturing beyond the dome, a check of his Geiger counter indicated there was no radiation. At first, judging how the blue, jagged fingers of electricity had jumped from the engines beneath the bus and the SUVs, he was sure some super electromagnetic pulse had fouled up the works on anything with wires or computer chips. Now the needle flickered a little, 50 rads and holding. Not a problem. No spacesuit required. The executioner walked on, a burst of auto fire here and there put the suffering out of their misery, sent them on their way. He still couldn't help but wonder what had happened and why, as he retraced his steps to the motor pool. Then he figured there was no point in trying to puzzle it out, as he caught the distant wail of still more zombies blinded by the light. Westward, where the blue tornado now spiraled into the sky. By the time he reached the SUVs, the static blue screen was gone from the engine housings. He piled in behind the wheel and twisted the ignition key. It took a full minute of waiting and working the key, pumping a little gas into the works. The soldier finally heard the engine sputter to life. The executioner began rolling out of the Valley of the Damned. Time for the mop-up. What's happened to me? <laughs> he staggered on, zeroed in on the albino creature's bleeding wail. The man with all the answers sounded like some terrified little child to Nixon. What have you done? <laughs> where, where are you? Nixon was unsure whether it was the fire eating up his insides, or the horrible truth he was blind that was bringing on the terror and the anguish. It would have been better, he thought, if he'd been killed outright when slammed to the desert after the evil thing had knocked him out the door. The albino thing had lied to him. That much was now clear. There was no great truth, no mystery of the ages the creature would have revealed. Nothing more than a small nuclear device had been smuggled out of their facility. He was sure of it. But if that were true, though, he reconsidered, why had the thing inside the lead box bounced around? Nixon heard the sound of an engine coming up from behind. Life. Someone who could see and lead him out of this horror. Who is that? Help us! We can't see! Not a problem. I only came to help. Nixon felt the sudden chill. Belasco? Who... Who are you? Deliverance. The ones who'd taken it in the face at Ground Zero had the eyes burned out of their skulls. There was also some shiny white aura over their skulls, burned clean of hair, a slick coating glossed over exposed flesh that had been cooked to raw meat, 
only there was no odor of burned skin. A check of the Geiger counter, and it was still hovering in the 50 Rad neighborhood. Bolin would never be able to explain how, if it was a nuclear blast, even a small one, there was no fallout, no superheated wind, no nothing. Whatever the big mystery element, he had to figure it was some buffer against radiation or something else. They had come close to delivery, the soldier saw, as he walked the hundred yards or so to the 18-wheeler. Two bodies sat upright in the cab, black holes where the eyes used to be. Any ID other than dental would be impossible, since their features had also been burned away to the bone. The immediate area surrounding Bolin was lit by the spiraling blue tornado. A search of the desert, and he spotted the main rotor blade impaled in the earth. No sound. Nothing moving for as far as he could see in the blue light. It was a wrap. Or was it, he wondered. If the blast hadn't turned them all into blind zombies, why was he troubled that one or two of the damned were still prowling about? Why was he suddenly thinking about the two women and the boys? She should have left when she and the boys first returned home. A number of setbacks, though, had stalled any flight out of the county. Betty couldn't raise any relatives or friends, and Tina Whalen didn't have any friends, all of them long since melting off into the distant horizon, going on with their own lives after she'd married. It was a 300-yard-plus walk to Betty's mobile home on County Road C. Tina Whalen looked over her shoulder, checking on the boys as they dumped the suitcases and duffel bags into the bed of the Chevy. The flashlight was finally working, and she let the beam wander over her sons. Weird how the flashlight... What's going on? The horror, shock, and lingering fear of what they had survived had kept them up nearly 24 hours. She had cooked lasagna for the boys, meatloaf next, made sandwiches, anything to help them fall back into a normal routine. A while back, a bag of popcorn, the three of them just sitting on the couch, huddled in the safety and comfort of their own home watching late-night television. Right up to when the lights had suddenly flickered, blinked out, some blue electricity crackling off the television, killing the picture. The same blue-white sparks came jumping out of the phone in the far corner of her living room, the microwave nearly leaping off the kitchen counter. It was enough to get her moving, a bolt of human lightning, and packing her bags. She had no firm destination in mind other than to get out of the county, just drive, Something terrible had happened, and she didn't need to wait around any longer to find herself and the boys in another horror show. Betty? Betty, are you all right? Our power went out. B Betty? Something felt wrong. Betty's vehicle was still parked outside. The trailer door was open, and she went inside the living room, the beam roving around. Betty? Betty, you okay? <gasps> The phone was like some obscene object to her, looking as if it were glued to Betty's ear, her friend's eyes bulging and framed in the beam of her flashlight. Oh, oh no! No! Oh no, please, God, no more! Tina Whalen was out the door, running back for the truck, when a shadow boiled out of the night. Freeze, bitch! She nearly flung the flashlight at the shadow's face, but she found she was too paralyzed by fear at the sight of something she couldn't even believe was human. Get that off my eyes! Tina thought she recognized the voice. Give me that! It looked as if he'd been burned, only the skin was a flaming red ooze, as if he'd been baked under the sun or toasted in a microwave. You have money? It was the one from the restaurant, the scraggly guy from the bar. He wanted money. Good. There was hope, if that was all he wanted. Yes. Yes, here. Here. J just don't hurt my sons. Slow it easy, Mom. Let's see the bread. Better be more than chop change. She dug out the wads of hundreds the dark stranger had given her. His eyes nearly popped out, and she wondered if the man was laughing or sobbing as he snatched the money. I need a ride, okay? Listen, not gonna hurt you or the kids. I'm not that kind of guy. Mommy! Mommy! What's happening? Tell him it's all right! It's okay, boys. He just wants a ride. He's not going to hurt us. Or so she prayed. She felt his hand shoving her head. You drive! I... I need to stop and get gas. You're shitting me! After what I've been through? Did you just see the explosion back there? No. If I hadn't closed my eyes. In the truck, you little brats! 
please, please, please. I'll, I'll do whatever you want. Just, just, just don't hurt my boy. Just drive and find the nearest gas pump, then I'm gone. <laughs> Bolin had been unable to reach either woman. It was only a fleeting hope they had taken his advice and left the area. Something was sticking in his gut, warning him they had stayed. He had never been able to explain why, but for some reason Bolin felt drawn back to Shambhala. It was on the way to where they told him they lived, and Bolin wanted to check in on the sheriff anyway, a loose end that needed wrapping up. After plucking the tin off the man's chest and letting him know he was out of a job, Bolin would let the guy walk, let him try to pick up the pieces and scurry around in some vain attempt to explain the unexplained to the locals. Bolin knew there were no answers. As soon as he knew the women and children were safe, the soldier was ready to leave the whole bizarre mess behind. If they came from Nellis, the Pentagon, or wherever to investigate and concoct a cover story, well, it wasn't his problem. But if something had happened to the women and children, Unable to explain the dire urgency he felt, Olin floored the gas, flying down the interstate and deeper into the dark heart of the desert night. Holy fuck, what happened to me? He was nearly in tears, staring at the smooth, almost shiny, waxen face mirrored in the side view mirror of her truck. Tina Whalen rested a hand on Tommy's knee. Mister, you need to go to a hospital. Obviously, it was the wrong thing to say. The muzzle of the assault rifle was thrust in her face. You do what I tell you! I don't need nothing but to get the hell out of here this goddamn fucked up state! Okay, 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 easy, easy. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You're fucking sorry? Look at me! What did they do to me? Uh, who? If she kept him talking, showed a little compassion. God, she silently prayed, please save us. Do not let him hurt my sons. Not after everything that has happened. Fucking spooks! That's who done this! He nearly broke down in tears. Then his eyes lit up as the sign was framed in the headlights. That's it? That's where I gas up? It's a joke? Shambhala? It's the closest place. If they're asleep, I can wake them up. Just remember, anyone messes with me, I'll kill these brats. I, I, I understand. It was a miracle of sorts, but Bolin didn't question it. He just kept moving toward the lights. Put down that gun, boy! I swear, you fucking assholes! Don't Weed was snapping out the threats right near the day. gas pump. The smaller of the Everywhere woman's two sons clutched to his chest, the guy waving around the M16, holding the desert rats at bay. He hadn't ignored the internal warning that told him to park the SUV beyond the rise. They would know he was coming. Maybe it had been his sighting of her truck a half mile or so out as he closed in on the dirt track. Maybe it was the way in which he sensed some desperation behind the wheel as she made what appeared a hurried run over the road to Shambhala. No matter. It had clearly panned out. He had left the M16 behind when he read the situation, opting for the precision, one-shot delivery of the Beretta. I'm telling you, you lose the guns or I'll waste the kid! Bolin melted into the shadows behind the diner, honed in on the voice moving ahead. Please! Please do what he wants! He just wants to leave! Tina Whalen. Fine. But if you hurt these people, you'll curse the mother that gave birth to your sorry behind! Oh, Jesus Christ! I already do, you son of a bitch! And Bolin could well believe that. He couldn't be positive, but he caught sight of enough raw flesh to know weed had been torched by the blue tornado. Why he wasn't blinded... Bolin crouched at the corner, lifted the Beretta, and sighted down. Get off the fucking truck, you bitch! Bolin gauged the range. Thirty yards, maybe less. Chip shot. Weed was a picture of impending doom as he stood in the light, the muzzle of his M16 wandering, but right at that moment, away from the boy. <laughs> Weed never knew what hit him as the slug cored through his temple. Mommy! Mommy! <gasps> oh, baby! Oh, my baby, are you all right? I'm okay, Mommy. Oh, Don't cry. Me. Holy... Where the hell did that come from? <sighs> Take a little time off, the man says. A little R&R &R will do you good, he says. Olin walked toward Tina and her sons. 
No rest for the weary, the man also once said. And the executioner had no doubts about that at all.